The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Good morning, Mr Singleton. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, this morning's first witness is Dr Karen Bird, the mother of Jessie Bird. Jessie Bird was a former soldier who died on the 27th of June 2017 at the age of 32. Jesse's story, including his experiences with the Department of Veterans Affairs, is very well known to you, Commissioners, and to many in the public. But it will not be the focus of this morning's evidence. Rather, the focus of Dr Bird's testimony will be on her experiences since Jesse passed away and the insights that she has gained in the course of a significant engagement with the issues of veterans' wellbeing and veteran suicide. She's in the witness box, accompanied by her brother. Um, in a moment, I'll ask for her to be sworn, but there may be some uh, appearances to be announced. Yes, thank you. Commissioners, uh, my name is Matt Black. Matt Black, barrister. Sorry, can we just press the button until the red light comes on? Thank you. Thank you. I'll <clears throat> start again. Commissioners, my name's Black, Matt Black. I'm a barrister instructed by KCI lawyers, appearing by leave for Dr Karen Bird. Thank you, Mr Black. Could I ask the operator to display the document KBI quadruple zero triple O one O six three three? Just at the first page of that document. And while that's coming up, might the witness be sworn or affirmed? will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Thank you. Dr Bird, could you tell the Royal Commission your full name? Mary Bird. Karen Mary Bird. Thank you. I'll ask the operator to display this morning's tender list. It's a list of uh, five pages, at least in the latest draft that I have seen. Um, it includes statements that were completed on the 17th of March and the 25th of March. Um, at this stage, the new material is tended on a confidential basis um, to allow various confidentiality claims to be resolved. Um, I do not wish to delay the hearing on that account, but it will need be needed. In due course, we will present for tender in chambers redacted versions as required. Thank you, Mr Singleton. So they'll be accepted on that basis then and um, allocated the next lot of numbers. Hopefully all the issues will be resolved soon. I might just ask that the um, previous document just come back on the screen for a little while. Thank you, operator. Dr. Bird, your engagement with veterans. Yeah. Um, I'll just indicate the operator that this document can be displayed in what we call public display. Um, later on, there'll be a need to use the private display facility, but this one, insofar as we'll be referring to it, can be broadcast. Um, Dr. Bird, sorry for that interruption, but um, your engagement with veterans issues began. Uh, before Jesse died, and in fact, before he was born. Um, could you tell us about your involvement, perhaps starting first uh, in your healthcare professional? In the 1970s, I uh, was a student nurse at St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, um, a 17, 18-year-old girl, uh, fresh out of the bush, and... I worked in as, as a trainee nurse at St Vincent's, which is one of the largest public hospitals in Melbourne. Uh, had a very large accident emergency department, so as a 17, 18 year old girl, it was pretty amazing, amazing but sad place to work. Uh, but 
the reflections of a now near 67-year-old woman looking back on her career as a young woman. I now realise that I engage with World War I and World War II veterans who were living rough on the streets of Melbourne in the 1970s. Uh, they were brought in by Fitzroy Police or Carlton Police or Collingwood Police, uh, often being bashed up or in poor health. And we young student nurses used to often have to take them down the back and give them a good bath for the first time in a long time. And probably, you know, put them in old Lysol baths because of the bed bugs and different other things in their infested clothing. And we bag up their clothing and it was taken off to be incinerated. And these pre predominantly men, they were all men really, um, they, um, they needed a good feed and to be rehydrated and um, many of them had many other ailments and many of them were admitted to hospital and those that weren't were, um, you know, they had 10 or 12, 20, 10 or 12 hours in accident emergency and then the police would, or an ambulance would come and take them away to, um, to it used to be Gordon House, was it, which was at the top of Old Burke, Burke Street. And, um, and no doubt, not that I ever would have known, but they probably reappeared a week later or two weeks later in the same state. Um, and then, of course, later in the 1980s, I um, worked at, um, on and off at the repatriation hospital in Heidelberg, um, usually on relief staff, um, because I worked a couple of jobs at, during the, those years. So, and I had a lot of involvement with World War I and World War II vets. Um, and Vietnam vets, actually. Another of your several engagements with the issue came in the context of the Senate committee inquiry that produced the report called The Constant Battle. Now, as you know, for reasons of, in, that include parliamentary privilege, we can't delve into the actual content of your submissions today. But at a later time, after making those submissions, you were contacted by parliamentary staff about using the submission in a different context. Um, could you tell us about that? Uh, that was 2019, I think. Um, I've actually jumped ahead, Peter, on I'm, the I'm way. Just, yes, we're just, yeah. no, I'm sorry okay. to discombobulate um, you, but I'm just, we're just, just, 20, I'm just Yeah, 2019, I think. Uh, a Senate committee, uh, well, I don't even know it was a Senate committee. Staff in the Senate were putting, um, together a centenary, or, well, a centenary of the functions of the Senate and a 50th, 50th anniversary of the committee's, uh, committee function of the Australian Senate. And they wanted to use uh, our submission as an example out of the constant battle, uh, a Senate inquiry into, into defence and veteran suicide. And um, I agreed um, for, for with, with some sadness that the Senate would now want, want to engage after my son had, was no longer with me. But in the spirit of um, full disclosure and, um, and the hope that more people would hear about the issues, um, I agreed. And the third of many aspects of your engagement with the issues um, has arisen since March 2023. You've been the Deputy Chair of the National Advisory Committee at Open Arms. Could you just tell us briefly what that's about and what you're doing there? Uh, this committee is an, an advisory committee to um, um, the Minister for Defence Personnel um, and, and by reflection, uh, the Minister for Veteran Affairs, uh, looking into the function of Open Arms as, it's, as it sits within the structure of the, the Department of Veteran Affairs and its um, support services and agency for Australian veteran uh, or service personnel, veterans and their families to assist with um, all manner of um, any, all sorts of vet, veteran assistance really. Um, and, and to make that, uh, make that agency of government open arms more um, fit for purpose because over time it has fluctuated in its ability to offer adequate support. 
Thank you. Um, we've had on the screen for a little while the cover page or title page of a document that you've prepared for the Royal Commission and you've given it the title Delay, Deny, Die. Could you explain that phrase to us? Uh, these three words are well recognised across the, the, veteran, the veteran sector. Um, they, were, they were coined... Um, by, uh, by, um, by people that work in the, um, in the support of Australian veterans and their, their families. Uh, one particular person um, who's very dear to me um, has a lot, um, and he's sitting here today, had a lot to do with, the, um, with those words coming and being adopted by a lot of the more um, advocate, uh, more, uh, you know, some of the more um, agile a um, adv advocacy groups in the veteran space have adopted this, um, and and an esteemed politician in the Senate also uses this phrase, and I adopted this phrase from about 2016, 17 when I realised that this was my son's experience. And to the extent you wish to do so, what do these words signify for you? Delay has, was the structural performance. The words we used yesterday, governance atrophy, I think that probably the best two terms that I've heard for the entire uh, Royal Commission, the governance atrophy across the Australian Defence Force the Department of Veteran Affairs, the, the, the Department of Defence and the Department of Defence Personnel. Uh, Jesse's experience of denying of claims actually cost us our son because he died yes. as a direct result of malfeasance and maladministration and his suicide was preventable because he had a really good family behind him. Yes. Is there anything about the word deny that you would want to explain? I'm not suggesting you have uh, to, but if you want to. Deny, as in, hopefully you'll, we'll be discussing this further, uh, the entire early process of Jesse putting in capacity payments in and they were, they were denied... Um, they just were not um, lodged in uh, a timely manner. In fact, they weren't lodged at all and we were unaware of that because as a family we thought he was waiting for incapacity payments to come in back in 2000, 2016. Um, those incapacity payments came into Jesse's bank account several weeks after he died, the first payment. Um, little use to him and a very, very rude shock for when John and I went to the Commonwealth Bank on the 11th of July 2017 with our son's death certificate to close his bank accounts because we knew there were um, permanent payments coming out and there was no money in the account or we thought there was no money in the account um, for those payments um, to come out. And one of those payments being his Defence Force um, private health insurance that we had insisted that he uh, continue paying because, as I say in my statement, uh, I took our private health cover uh, when I joined um, St Vincent's Hospital as a student in, 2000, in 19, uh, 1975 and I've had private health cover ever since because... I grew up in a family and I brought up my children with the same set of values that those who can should. I could afford and my family could afford to pay for private health cover. And I, we as a family had poor understanding of uh, any veteran health supports. Uh, because let's be honest, uh, it's not as if, um, particularly back in 
2015, 16, 17, there was too much information around as to what veterans were actually entitled to because Jesse's, Jesse's journey from 2015 uh, to, to his death in 2017 was, was, um, was repeatedly stalled by denying tactics. I know you don't want me always to go into detail about Jesse's own uh, life and dealings with the DVA, but I do want to clarify one matter, if I may. You referred to his, uh, his one of his claims not being lodged in a timely way. Is it, the, is it your understanding that he lodged his claim, but it wasn't registered in DVA systems for, I think it was more than a year, and therefore no action took place? Is that... He put needs assessments in, to my knowledge, in August of 16 and again in October of 16. Neither of those needs assessments were uh, lodged. We never knew anything about this until much later. Uh, and I guess we will discuss this later is the, in the Spears report, so, um, which became apparent in the coronial inquest. So I'll give you an opportunity to talk about the Spears report at later. the sequence. Mm. just to the extent that you want to talk about it. But that's where the denying started. Yes. Um, I'll ask the operator, coming back to the document on the screen, to jump down to page three, which is 0636. What you've done, Dr Bird, is extracted some quotations from a royal commission into similar issues that gave a report in 1924. Mm. Um, by all means, um, tell the operator when to move to the next page, but what did you want to draw to our attention? Um, I've got a little, little speech ready, so please bear with me. I'd like to draw to the attention of the commissioners, the people of Australia, the long history of suicide and self-harm in the ADF and veteran communities. After listening to some of the evidence in the last now fourth week of this commission and before, you would think the veterans just appeared on the Australian landscape very recently. Um, and I also want to draw this attention to the malaised Australian media who have been very poor in their uptake on the conversations that have been going on in this Royal Commission, particularly in most recent months. And I call them malaised because they're more interested in submarines and frigates and um, inflated um, conflict, the possibility of inf inflated conflicts with our near neighbours, not to mention who they think they're going to put in front of those um, adversaries. 416,809 men enlisted in World War I. Well over 60,000 were killed. Well over 156,000 were wounded, gassed or prisoners of war. Some of them never came home. The rest of that 416,809 were dropped back into Australian society, back into their families, back to their friends with the hope that they would get back to work, get back working in Australian society with the minimum of fuss, but to the government's credit, during 1914 they realised that they were going to have to deal with some casualties, probably just thinking about the physical casualties. In 1918 they set up the first Australian Repatriation Commission, that's 1918, which is now the Department of Veteran Affairs. I want to draw to your attentions and listen really, really carefully here. The currency should not be missed on anyone, especially after the evidence of the last three weeks. Number 12. After full and careful inquiry into all matters arising out of the ref reference, your commission unanimously agreed that the majority of cases as the present machinery of, for determining disability and assessing pensions is sufficient. 
There are, however, certain number of disabilities present in a small minority of ex-soldiers which are, for various reasons, inadequately determined. And it goes on to talk about unavoidable delays occurring and the fact that some people were being treated harshly. This is 1924, this is five years after the repatriation of all these soldiers back into Australia. I make note that during the later 1920s and 1930s, more and more claims came into the Repatriation Commission and more and more people were dying by suicide. Um, number 13, the chief difficulty, however, has been de dealing with those cases in which disabilities have manifested themselves at a much later period in discharge. And that became ever so more noticeable um, as someone like me, who's a historian, who's now been in coronial inquests of people that died in 1925, 28, 32, 33, from suicide. It, is clearly, it was clearly the intention of Parliament when, the, when they framed the Act to cover all disablement resulting from war service. And we've struggled to do that ever since. Next page, please. Number 14. Here we're talking about the difficulty of relating war service Ill illnesses appearing after discharge. Delay is often unavoidable. Listen to this because this is so current. While efforts are being made to trace some connection, and that's how they spelt connection in, in 19, uh, 1924, and discover some continuity that will enable the, those interpreting the Act to establish a relationship between the illness under review and war service. That was Jesse. They were still trying to work out whether his, his, his set of symptoms were related to his, to his war service right up until he died. In certain cases, discontent has been aroused by the applicants and their friends not appreciating the cause of the delay. There'll be a lot of veterans out there listening today that will will be nodding their heads. Your, commi your commissioners are of the opinion that the repatriation is greatly hampered by the in inadequacy of the records as to the exact state of health of soldiers upon discharge from service. How, how many times have we heard that? And this is 1924. As I said, you would think veterans were just falling out of the sky in 2024. There's some... In, uh, the, then I go on and list some of the recommendations and what was re uh, recommended from, from the Commission. Um, we can probably go over... The, miss those. Um, we go over to the next page. Um, Number 21 needs deep reflection. It is suggested the commissioners offer some comments upon the question of responsibility of the repatriation department in regard to mental, mental disease appearing in ex-soldiers. Ex the matter has been fully debated and your commissioners are unanimously of the opinion that no general principles can be laid down. And that's what happened. No general principles were laid down and we've been struggling ever since to actually fathom and accept that war does come home. Each case must be, be, be determined on its merits, weighed being given to the variety of circumstances with the claimant service and that has slowed up the administrative process for veterans for 100 years. And we've dropped people back into what I call the... And I, I think I picked it up in a, in a journal article, the shared emotional cauldron in which traum traumatised veterans are dropped back into their families and which that trauma then goes on and affects the next generation, blighting, blighting that family long after the war. Number 22, the establishment of special mental hospitals by the Commonwealth for ex-soldier mental cases and for them alone is, in the opinion of your commissioners, unnecessary and impractical. Of course, much later, not that much later, 
some special hospitals were set up, but in 1924 they weren't available. And of course, later uh, in World War II, under the Labor government um, in 1941, they set up, be began setting up repat the repatriation hospitals, which um, were originally ran by the army in, by 1945 when a large influx of veterans started returning from World War II. And those hospitals provided amazing support um, for Australian veterans right up until the 1990s when they were privatised and sold off by the Commonwealth to the states. And, um, and we've been flailing in the medical system for veterans ever since. That's a conversation beyond, beyond my discussion today. Um, and that's about all I've got to say, Peter, for the moment on this. Thank you, Doctor. Um, we'll go to some of the issues in your statements. First, a formality. You've made two statements to the Royal Commission. Are they both true and correct to the best of your knowledge? And yes. Thank you. I, um, <coughs> after um, Jesse passed away, you engaged with the Commonwealth in the, in the context of a scheme called Compensation for Detriment Caused by defective administration or CDDA, I'm trying to be neutral, it, it's a scheme under which sometimes the Commonwealth will pay compensation where so-called defective administration by a government department has caused detriment. Often a process of negotiation is involved. I don't suggest at all that detriment is an adequate word for the context we're discussing, but in in 2017 and into 2018, did you engage with the Commonwealth under that scheme, leading to some compensation? Mm. Yes, but I guess I give some backstory to this. Um, yes. Jesse's father, my husband at the time, had stage four cancer. He'd been diagnosed with cancer on, in March of 2017. Jesse died in June 2017. Um, the rejection letter that he got um, for assistance in May of 17 that suggested that he needed to come back in six months to be reassessed um, was probably the final straw for Jesse because he, he didn't actually have six weeks, let alone six months. Uh, and John and I had given up, or well, John had to give up work and I gave up work and my work at the university uh, to concentrate on John's health and um, and Jesse knew that um, we weren't working and uh, mind you, we could afford to keep transferring money as we always had but um, that rejection letter was, um, I think he lost hope. Um, his purpose of pushing and we'd been encouraging him and encouraging him, but... Um, yeah. I might get the operator to privately display part of your statement. Um, this is the first of your statements. It's KBI quadruple O, triple O one, O two O six. And if we could then go to page O two O nine. Um, you, Dr Bird, if we look at paragraph 22 in particular, um, you've got a number of concerns about the CDDA process and I've just brought up these four as a, as a little reminder. Could you just outline uh, the points you wanted to make about the CDDA process? Um, well, first and foremost, hindsight's a wonderful thing because now I, understa I understand that the government of the day and the department in seeming to be thoughtful and kind and actually really wanted to wrap us up, what I refer to as muzzleless and, and we're probably a bit reflective of the fact that um, John was so sick and that, you know, 30, 30, um, so, you know, 30 sovereigns of silver um, and we might go away. Um, so I'm, not, I'm not, dis, not unthankful that that, that process was offered. 
Um, but it's very discretionary, as I make, make point in my statement, and there's many families that never get this opportunity. And I don't think that's particularly fair. And the Australian public does, predominantly doesn't know this goes on. And there's, there'll be plenty of veterans and um, friends of mine in this room today who are unaware because I'm not meant, to, because part of this is you're not meant to talk about it. Um, you're not meant to, it's not meant to be a public discussion with anyone. So um, it's not something I've ever really raised. So, um, and it, it saddens me uh, that uh, so many of my friends in the broader veteran community and many of the mothers that, that I hold particularly dear that have lost sons, predominantly sons, they haven't been offered this. And um, it's not fair. Um, and, yeah, I make comment that we're under a, a lot of pressure and, um, and we, we, there was a whole lot of things that we were unaware of. Um, so when we agreed to what was offered, um, subsequently we realised why we were, we were being muzzled because there was so much maladministrative process. John and I thought there must have been a lot that went on, but we didn't have a full understanding to well after, and really it only became we only really became aware of it. Um, most of it came out in the coronial inquest. And I guess in hearing block 11, when Dr Sadal gave his evidence uh, in Melbourne, that was, the final, that was the final piece of the puzzle and it all came together. You mentioned subparagraph B, a report with information you did not have at the time you wrapped up the CDDA process but you later got. Um, is that the document sometimes called the Spears Report? That's correct. Do you have any comments about that report? Um, that report uh, explored and described um, uh, an administrative process that was operating inside the Department of Veteran Affairs and understood and directed by at least middle management and above as a way of containing and stalling claim numbers and flow times through the department. So it became, it became apparent in that report that Jesse's needs assessment went in but it was never logged so the clock never started ticking in the department for them to have to action it. So when, when uh, the department had to report to parliament about the number of claims they had sitting um, at different stages uh, for processing, Jesse's claims were never logged. So to all intents and purposes, he'd sent paperwork into the department and they sat on someone's in tray. Jesse was waiting, thinking that he's going to get incapacity payments very shortly because he had stopped working in March of 16 because he was so unwell and John and I had been paying, supporting him since March of 16, paying his rent and his registration and... Um, living expenses. Um, this is the issue that we mentioned earlier, half an hour ago or, or so, where Jesse, and, and uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, but the essence of it is that Jesse had undergone a needs assessment in which it became clear that he sought incapacity payment, payment comp compensation. The Spears report, which was an, an the result of a, an examination of whether the department had complied with the law and DDA policy or not, found that he what what was recorded at that time in that needs assessment legally constituted a claim for payments. Right. 
but it was not registered for more than a year, and so nothing was done about his claim. That's right. And it's the same one that we mentioned earlier. Yeah. And uh, we, we never knew anything about that with any concrete certainty until the tail end of the coronial inquest. When it was disclosed as an annexure to a statement. That's right. Um, at the time you were dealing with the CDA, CDDA scheme, um, were you also having some engagement with the, the Minister of Veterans Affairs at the time, Mr Tian? Is, That's correct. Is there anything you'd like to tell us about that engagement? Look, Dan is a kind and thoughtful man. I, I think I trigger um, tears in the man every time he sees me because the mirror I hold up to any sent, sentient, thoughtful human being, including our politicians, is not a pretty one. Um, I don't think... I have to think that Mr Tian was unaware of what was go going on in his department. He hadn't been told. Or if he had been told and he knew about it, he really plummets in my estimation as a human being and the government that he sat inside of. But I'm, I'm a fair and reasonable person and I prefer to think better of people. But I... Because I think he's a really good man and um, proof, be, proof being that just recently I invited a whole lot of politicians to the Australian War Memorial to the opening of the Sufferings of War and Service Memorial that I've been involved in with my family uh, and Jesse's ex-partner and my daughter since 2017. Um, you know, the Prime Minister was invited, the Defence Minister was invited, uh, the Opposition Defence Minister, the Opposition Leader, the Opposition Assistant Defence Minister. And actually, it turned out that the Government Veteran Affairs Minister didn't make it and the lovely um, and the really thoughtful, kind Matt Thistlewaite that it turned up. And to their credit, Mr Tian, Dan Tian and Dan Chester, the two uh, Veteran Affairs Ministers that I had the most to do with during the previous government's um, term in government, they both accepted my um, invitation. See, we've come to that commemorative event. Um, would you give us just a, an overview of of that event and your role in it? Uh, the Australian War Memorial um, is a magnificent ins institution in this country and it has historically only really acknowledged uh, the, the, that reference point that we talk every Anzac Day, the glorious fallen. My rhetoric to that is... I don't know anyone who falls gloriously in war. In fact, if anyone knows any history of war, and particularly the First World War, thousands and thousands of Australians um, and other nations on both sides, um, they, never, they never had graves because their bodies were um, mutilated by war. So glorious fallen is a, an anomaly of language. Um, but I had I started with other people, not just me, but our family it centrally, approached the War Memorial in 2017 and onwards walk, wanting to push for a, a broader conversation at the War Memorial in relation to the war that comes home and in the hearts and minds of our service personnel and veterans and then into their homes and to acknowledge the commitment that those people give this country and the long-term cost it has on them and their families. And that conversation now has began at the War Memorial and the challenge in the future will be to bring that conversation actually inside the War Memorial. Uh, currently it's in the grounds. It's a magnificent um, piece, sculptural piece by Australia's most preeminent um, marble sculptor, Alex Seaton. Um, I was very, very humbled and proud to be part of that, um, that, that foundational committee 
and um, I continue to work with the War Memorial and um, and the very um, commendable leader there, um, Matt Anderson. Thank you. Um, we've, we've briefly mentioned so far that there was an inquest into Jesse's death and I want to turn to that topic. You advocated for an inquest to be held into the circumstances. There was a two-day hearing eventually and... Can I develop that a little bit? Yes. Uh, I just thought I'd introduce it. Just to, The final thing I was going to say is that there, a, a report of findings was issued on the 7th of April 2020. So what did you... I'll get the operator just to display um, the table of contents uh, just on the private display. Um, just for the record, it's KBI quadruple O triple O one O six six one. And we can just see the first uh, page, which is most of the table of contents. It just gives you a, uh, a reminder if you wish to have it. But please, over to you. Um, Jesse died on the 27th of June 2017. The two police officers that attended Jesse's, um, that were called to attend Jesse's, um, the retrieval of Jesse's body. One of them was an Australian veteran. The other was the wife of an Australian veteran. Um, several days after the, after, um, after that day, uh, my brother, a couple of my brothers and John, I was unable to um, go and I, I was too shattered to go and identify his body. Um, Ms. Bird, stressed. please take your time. There's no rush. No one's in a rush. Yeah. They stressed the importance to John and to my brothers that we needed to insist and work towards insisting on a, 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 an open Victorian coronial inquest into Jesse's death because they, as Victorian police officers, were sick of turning up at the suicide of their ex-friends um, and associates. Um, so I guess I, one night, very late, I got onto the Victorian coronial um, site and lodged a request for a coroner's inquest and filled it in the and there's a there's a there's an online request document and basically I chased it and chased it and chased it and pushed it uh, from 2017 um, through various various stages of grief um, and we'll. It wasn't just me, John and I. We were we were, we were quite dogged in our um, in our desire to want to do something more than just be grief stricken parents who who accepted our son's suicide without any public inquest or inquiry into it. Just looking at the list of subheadings, just as a guide, um, we can see that some of them relate to the substantive issues to do with veteran wellbeing and and so on. But three of them relate to the coronial process itself. The first two, preliminary process, which you've already touched on. Then there's the reference to the brief of evidence. Um, and the third one, which is more about the coronial processes, has the label, the missing information, the elephant in the room. Um, you've, you've given some comments relating to the early part of the process, but is there more that you would wish to say about those procedural matters that I've just read out? Brief of evidence, missing evidence? Well, um, at the very beginning of the coronial inquest, um, it was almost suggested that the family could turn up really without any legal representation because um, and no disrespect to the senior senior constable assisting the coroner that she could have directed us through um, through um, 
through the process. But it became very apparent very early that, um, that the Australian government's solicitors were going to be representing the Department of Veteran Affairs and um, the ADF and that John and I were not legally trained. Um, I'm a great archival researcher and I, um, I can go through information pretty, wo pretty well and um, decipher a really good working document but I had no, um, I had no legal framework to um, approach a coronial inquest. That um, relates to one of the recommendations that you put into your second statement. So we may as well go to that now. Um, it's the same document as is on screen that for private display. Could we go to page 24, which is KBI quadruple O triple O one O six eight four? On this page, Dr. Bird, there's a heading recommendations to the Royal Commission. The first one has the subheading coroner's court process. Um, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to elaborate on the suggestion that you make here. Um, while you're turning up, I might just, and it is on the screen of the particular, the, the main paragraph is there, that every family um, in these circumstances um, should be able to opt into an inquest to be undertaken by the state or territory. Do you, do you want to, to speak um, to that? I think there's, gen there's, you're dealing with a few things here. There's general ignorance that people actually have the right to ask for a coronial inquest. Um, um, and in the veteran space, um, because historically, um, let's be really frank and honest here, um, there's been huge stigma and fear of acknowledgement that suicide has any any place in in um, in the military cosmos. Actually, that um, we're comfortable with people dying on the battlefront. Sad, but it's been very painfully obvious in the um, in the. Uh, in the evidence that's been given here, the, the difficulty the Defence Force has had in acknowledging that they've actually got a problem. And the realisation that it wasn't until nine, uh, 2016, 2017 that the Defence Force and DBA were actually um, um, recording anywhere that, that could be retrievable easily um, suicide statistics. So um, I sort of sort of can rest my case there, really, and um, and I know that a lot of families would really struggle with going through the coronial inquest. Like if you, and I'll use the language: if you're burdened by a religion and a religious framework that sees great stigma and shame in suicide, that will that will impede your ability as a family unit to go through the coronial inquest process because, you know, it's it's pretty tough going and particularly when um, dealing with the Defence Force and the Department of Veteran Affairs and their ability to throw really significant public money um, to fund either the Australian government solicitors or some of their other... Um, arms of solicitor um, that companies that flourish in this space, including Sparks Elmore, um, that have done, that do quite considerably well out of contesting um, on behalf of the government to defend what I see to be the indefensible. So the third of what I call procedural coronial issues uh, addressed in your statement came under the heading, the, the missing information, the elephant in the room. The section of your statement um, under that heading refers to reports by Professor Collie and the Phoenix organisation. Um, did, was there uh, any particular points you wanted to make about that information in the context of the coronial inquest? <coughs> the Collie report had been paid for by the Department of Veteran Affairs had been written in 
2018, 2019, um, we came, our, my legal team became aware of it because it was in a, in a newspaper article in The Australian. Um, somehow or other it, it got leaked or someone picked up on it. Um, but it had direct... Um, uh, Alex Colley was at Monash University. Um, spoke directly to um, the contribution made by um, the Department of Veteran Affairs to poor outcomes, um, including suicide and self-harm for Australian veterans who go have to who have to endure the process of um, proving that they're um, sufficiently um, incapacitated or sufficiently diseased or sufficiently handicapped to require some level of help and support. This feeds back into the Dunt report of 2007-8 that said the same thing. A lot of the work done in the early days of Professor um, Sandy McFarlane spoke to the same thing. The constant battle picked up on those same threads in 2016 and 17. Yes, he was still alive then. And Alex Colley was talking about it again in 18 and 19 after Jesse was gone. The Colley report, we had all manner of difficulty getting access to it for the coronial inquest, so much so that we actually never got it. It became... Um, we got it after the um, final findings. Of, um, and to the best of your knowledge, did the coroner get it before delivering her findings? I don't think so. Mm. No, it came... I'm not 100% I'm not, not clear on that, actually. Um, I'll just get the operator to, to display the first page. It's the second statement. Uh, again, that's with that table of contents, just as a... Mm. gives us a little framework. You've... I, I, in addition to the three points we've just discussed about the process of the inquest, you've also made comments in your statements about some of the substantive issues. Excuse me for a minute, Peter. So we've covered then that I see it as an important recommendation for this Royal Commission? I'm very... Well, um, let's just make sure. Um, uh, I'll bring up... We might go back to the recommendations which are towards the end of this statement. Just in case we don't get back to it. Yeah, no, uh, it, it certainly if there's more to be said. Um, I thank the operator. So we've got here, uh, we had this displayed before, the bottom of the first page and running on to the very top of the next page. Just That's just a reminder of what's in your statement. But what um, further do you want to say about the recommendations you have about the coronial process? And just to let you know, I do intend to come to your recommendations about dealing with veterans as humans, not claim numbers and and, and others, but on the coronial process. Um, I think the, the coronial process needs to sit inside for, for veteran and defence suicide, self-harm, um, unexplained um, accidents, all that nebulous area that, that sits ill-defined um, currently in the defence and veteran space. I think it needs to sit in s as a part of the whatever is the body that sits after this um, that flows on from the commission. It needs to sit inside and be um, responsible to the um, statutory commission that is set up in the aftermath of this Royal Commission. I think it's really, really important for accountability uh, and transparency uh, so that families of current... Oh, well, families that are considering allowing their children to join the Australian Defence Force, current serving members and people in the veteran... veterans, people currently in the veteran community so that they know going forward that um, hopefully... They won't be in. They won't be in the suicide number, but uh, the families have some assurance that um, that there are go there is going to be some due processes in place. There's going to be some procedural fairness and justice uh, in this space, which has been absent. And 
to what extent, if you wish to comment, should any new body that's created to focus on veteran wellbeing and veteran suicide prevention be investigating individual deaths and what would the relationship be with the coronial process? Do you have views on that? Um, um, I, I think the uh, process needs to be separate of the state. I think it needs to be specifically set up under the statutory um, commission. Um, it can be, I, I've got no real understanding and there'll be there's brighter, um, brighter uh, legal minds than mine, but I think it needs to be investigated inside that statutory commission. And you've actually made a, some calls which we'll come to about that new body. Um, so if we could, thank you, Operator. If we could go back to the uh, cover page, page one of this document. Um, you've got, uh, Dr Bird, some headings. Um, DVA interim compensation, veterans covenant, veteran centric reform, specialist evidence. Um, you discussed the call for the Royal Commission and then the National Commission that existed for a while. Um, you feel free to skip any that you don't wish to address, but uh, um, do you can tell you us tell what... tell me what number it's on in my actual um, brief, just because I've got some notes that I probably will want to speak to. All right, I think you might be referring, for example, DV, if you wanted to look at DVA interim compensation. What is number is that, Peter? Page 12 of your statement yeah. is, I think, the document you've got there on the table. Page 12. Um, interim, what, what number, Peter? Oh, uh, the paragraph number is 73. So it's on the bottom part of the page. We can get that displayed. It's uh, 0672. I'll just bring it up on the screen as well. Have you found it on your paper? Yeah. yeah. So you may not wish to address it orally today, but I just want to give you the opportunity to expand on your thoughts if you wish to on that topic. I guess it's th this is probably an important point, actually, because it, it speaks to in the one hand being told by a prominent person within the department that a significant policy change had occurred when when you look more closely buried in in their own administrative um, let's be frank obfuscation um, the interim the interim payment was actually there the fact or the possibility that Jesse could have had that offered to him but the fact of the matter was somebody within the department decided that he really didn't need it. That person never met Jesse, never brought him in for an interview. Jesse lived in Melbourne. The team that was supervising or meant to be um, helping him was either in Brisbane or, or um, Perth, depending on the permanent, permanent in-cap with Brisbane. Some of the team for in-cap, in you know, Permanent impairment, I think, were Brisbane. Permanent in cap were Perth. Um, the team leader in charge of Jesse was Perth. Jesse lived in a flat in St Kilda. Um, he never saw anyone face to face ever. Um, and that speaks to the administrative process that veterans were enduring at that time. That was that was accepted practice. These, these people that had accepted conditions who were unwell were being managed remotely. So you actually have a, a, a recommendation for the Royal Commission's consideration that intersects with that point. I'll get the operator to go to page 0685 on the private display. And if we, when we get there, look at paragraphs 154 and 155, and there's a heading above it. Um, thank you, operator. That's perfect. Um, so you have a, a, the recommendation under the heading dealing with veterans as humans and not claim numbers. I'm coming to that because I think it intersects with the point that you just made. Is there anything more you'd like to tell us about that recommendation? I just think 
veterans actually need to be treated like human beings. Um, um, the bureaucracy of state treats, I guess, it's not only it's not only the veteran space because I guess if you think deeply, a lot of people in aged care and disability services and many of the other services in this country would would say the same thing. But we're here concerned about the Australian veteran community, the people that serve this nation who put themselves in harm's way for us. Mm. So, um, the fact that I've, I've actually made a mental a written note here, um, and this is a, there are some veterans out there that are listening today, and um, I want you to know what I'm about to say is um, for your for your um, for your ears, I guess. No wonder so many in the veteran community refer to the Department of Veteran Affairs potential ability, their potential ability to be death murderers. There are people who think that out in the veteran community that the way they administer or historically have administered veterans remotely, there is huge potential for doing great harm. And that, that's what happened to Jesse. Great harm was done to him. So um, thank you for that. Um, thank you, Operator. Um, we can go to a new topic. Again, it's a topic that came up in the context of the, vet, uh, the inquest that has a wider importance, and that is the Veterans Covenant. Um, is, is that a topic on which you would wish to speak today? I'll actually, if you want to bring up number 78 uh, on my page 13, I think I might actually read it out. Very well. Um, that's the document we just had, and it... Um, I guess. Do you want to develop? Do you you want to tell people what the vet, veteran covenant is? Well, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, well, that's please, coming up. Please tell them. I'll just and give then the I'll, operator I'll the, expand. the number. So it's KBI. It's already there. She's very fast. So I'll, I'll turn it into a question to meet the formal requirements. Yeah, but sure. the Parliament has now passed the what's given the shorthand. Uh, name sometime of the Covenant Act. You've called it the Australian Veterans Recognition Covenant Act, and I may not have got that quite right in about 2019. Um, it contains some uh, declarations. It contains uh, Section 10 from memory, which says there are no legal liabilities arising from the Act. Um, are there any comments you want to make about the Act or connected issues? That language, there's no legal liabilities under this Act. So in other words, it's just words on a page. Are those words worth hearing for their own sake? Well, maybe, but then I guess, you know, twice a year we turn up at Anzac Day and Remembrance Day and lay reefs too. It doesn't, it doesn't transfer to very much if you're, if you're suffering out there and you can't get help. And like my son couldn't get help, but he went to Anzac Day on the 25th of April 2017. It's the last photo I've got of him alive. He sent me a selfie. So, um, yeah. Yes. So I'll read what I say here in my statement. Yes. I believe the, Co the Covenant Act was a cynical exercise in public relations by the former Prime Minister Scott Morrison and the former... DBA Secretary Liz Cosin, to essentially distract the public from the findings of the constant battle, Senate report, and the damning report into the Productivity Commission, who found in June 2019 that DBA was not fit for purpose in its current structure and the way it was act acting. So, um, Messaging in government is an interesting thing. The ability to um, to drop media releases and the, the message that you want to put out there, um, in the particularly in the defence and veteran space, is interestingly used, kindly and interestingly crafted, to construct a message that um, that purports more than it um, actions. 
the next topic that you address in your statement comes up on the next page. You, Operator, if, if we perhaps could display privately the page 0674. Most of this page is under the heading veteran-centric reform. What are the main points that you would want to make to the commissioners today about this issue? Well, veteran-centric reform, isn't that an interesting concept? We've had veterans in this country, uh, country federated in 1901. We first sent Australian service personnel to the Boer War. Um, we've had veterans since the Boer War. So veteran-centric reform should have been front and centre since, well, particularly since the setting up of the Repatriation Commission in 1918. Um, so, so, okay, so in, 19, 20, 20, 2017 we started being veteran-centric. So where are all the politicians and the bureaucrats who have many of whom have got OAMs and AOs and Commonwealth Service Medals and Public Service Medals and Distinguished Medals for their service to this country, but they weren't particularly veteran-centric before 2017. What on earth were they doing? Because people were dying. My son died in the middle of this mess. I'm going to turn to two points which are in the nature of recommendations and concerns that you've raised in your statement. To some extent we've touched on them but I want to make sure you have a full opportunity to f um, just to flag where we're going. The first is in your first statement and I'll ask the operator to go to KBI quadruple O triple O one O two O six where you um, make a call for an independent and properly empowered body to be set up after the Royal Commission has finished. And later I'll come to your recommendation about a veterans and veterans family legal representative. Just on that first one, if operator, if we can go to page 0212 on the private display and expand paragraph 37, which just runs over the page a little bit. Um, <coughs> I know we've touched on this, uh, Dr. Bird, and you may not wish to uh, add to your remarks already, but I wanted to give you the opportunity in this context to uh, give us any reasons that you want to give us for why such a body would be important and if you have any views on how it should be set up, what powers it might have. Justice costs a lot of money in this country. To walk inside a solicitor's office, sorry, Matt, <laughs> um, and to, to think that you're going to hire a barrister, um, it costs a lot of money. Out of the reach of so many people. But the interesting thing is the Australian Defence Force, the Department of Defence and the Department of Veteran Affairs has full access to public funds to fund their defence against veterans and by association their families. Um, it's an unequal playing field. And then that um, moves to a recommendation. It's in your second statement. We won't go to it because I want to stick with this, but seeing you've mentioned it, you call for a veterans and veterans family legal representative. Um, can you give us your thoughts on how that should be set up, whereabouts, whether it's a, an external private body, it's a part of a, go a government agency with independence or some other arrangement, and what would it be doing? Well, I envisage, I guess, that it should sit inside the statutory commission that will follow and that people like myself, back in 2016, instead of contacting Constant Battle, I would have contacted the Statutory Commission. It would have been well, hopefully well advertised, well promoted, but the trouble is you can't, can't reflect backwards because 
maybe in 2016 I wouldn't have known about it. But maybe now, if the malaised media wakes up and we really push for what happens after this Royal Commission, um, this statutory body will come to fruition. It will be truly independent. It will resp it'll be answerable to the entire parliament. The information that it collects will not be lost in Prime Minister's um, Prime Minister and Cabinet and have 20 or 30 year um, stamps on it so it can't be accessed and spoken about. Um, and families can access and be properly funded if they need legal representation. But hopefully <laughs> the Statutory Commission will do a really good job and we'll need less and less, there'll be, there'll be less and less reason to be as adversarial as it has been historically. All right. Um, just while we're on recommendations and concerns, um, we've mentioned several, but there's a couple more still to come. Uh, operator, if we can go to the second statement. I think it's probably the one still on, state, uh, on screen, but it's KBI quadruple O triple O one O six six one and then go to page 0685. You have... I'll just wait for that to come up so you can see it. If we can expand 156 and 158, you've got the, the heading there, direct political access and action with DVA, and make a reference to some evidence we heard the other day from Senator Lambie. Um, what are your views on this? How important is it? Um, what, what would it achieve? Well, earlier in my statement, I mentioned that John, more so than me, um, but as a couple, we reached out to two local politicians in our area um, when we were floundering to get help or how, how, do we, um, how do we assist our son who lived in Melbourne and we resided on the Gold Coast and um, um, we were both working and um, Jesse, Jesse was saying that it was all on hand. He had, a, he had an advocate and it's okay, it's okay, but we weren't, we weren't very convinced. But um, so we contacted the local politicians and let's, let's be very honest, one was totally unhelpful and the second um, gave us some phone numbers and uh, I think even an email address. But I think Jackie's suggestion, uh, Senator Lambie's suggestion is an excellent one, that every politician in this country, every senator and every House of Representatives member has a, ve has a veteran advisory um, officer in their, in their office and they're paid by the Commonwealth they're actually there in that function so that families or veterans or serving members have got issues, they go and, and can speak with their local member and that local member then actions that and takes it to Parliament, contacts, contacts the relevant minister and puts some priority on, on the actions associated with it. Okay. I'll ask the operator to go to... The first statement that you made, um, it's KBI quadruple O triple O one O two O six for private display. And then we might go, if we could, to page O two one two. Except that I'm not yes. You'll see there's a heading continuing concerns and issues and some subheadings with the underlining. We've, used, we've, we've touched on most of this already, but um, parliamentary privilege is not something we've looked at very much today. Is there anything that you would wish to elaborate on in respect of parliamentary privilege? I sat listening to the evidence of the Assistant Defence um, Secretary yesterday and I just kept, kept running through my mind was well, what don't they want us to know? Um, um, the number of the number of pieces of paper that were in Jesse's file that were stamped classified, I, I um, 
it staggered me. I thought, what's so, what's so, what's to be classified here? But and then, then it became apparent to us in this, um, in the coronial inquest process, that so much of the information that we wanted to speak to was not technically available because of parliamentary privilege, and um, that lack of accountability and transparency, and the ease with with which it seems to me, from my observations as an academic these last 10, 12 years, um, and someone that's very aware of international relations and um, is enga engaged in, in, and a thoughtful citizen, the use of parliamentary privilege and the Prime Minister uh, PMC, Prime Minister and Cabinet, to disappear information in there and then when it's requested for, inf for access, it's not available. And that seems to be a real issue in this space. A lot of the veteran, the more um, vocal veteran advocates out there will speak to and attest to the struggle with freedom of information inquiries to access information out of their files or people who work in the legal and advocacy space who want to access information and the difficulty they repeatedly have in accessing that information. And even, let's be very honest here, um, the amount of information that you as a Royal Commission have struggled to access in a timely manner and having to argue what's in and what's out um, in a free and fair and open Australia. Um, you know, there is a big question mark. You've been kind enough to share with us three photographs from your own collection. Um, I'll read out the first of the numbers for display and for your comments. Um, it's KBI quadruple O triple O one O five six four. Now I'm not sure, Dr. Bird, whether technically, technologically, we can display all three at once. But the um, there are two more with the final digits being five and then six. Um, I get this is where I get to speak, isn't it? This is this, to give you the roadmap. You've asked to um, Thank you. speak to these photographs, but you've also asked us the final thing to go to the final page yeah, of the PowerPoint very, screen. Uh, very uh, so, if, if are you content to uh, speak to the photographs first, and then we go to the final page of the PowerPoint? And, and in a minute, just flip over to the third photo. So yes, so I'll get the operator. So the people understand that veterans have families. Yes. So tell us. We've got two at the moment. We'll get to the third one in a moment. Mm. Please introduce the people who are seeing um, these photos. That's Jesse. This is my 59th birthday. So this is um, eight years ago. Nearly. Yeah. 2016. That's John, who was very sick, but we didn't know it. He was losing weight and we just thought he was working really hard and um, and he was training a lot. He was very fit. He swam three times a week and, you know, as it turned out, you know, less than a year later he had fourth stage. He was diagnosed with fourth stage, fourth stage four cancer. That picture is with, with me is in 2015, um, was Jesse's... Um, 31st birthday and I came down um, to stay with him and his then partner. Um, yeah, and you might as well flip to the next photo, please. Thank you, Operator. Um, <coughs> I'll just assist the Operator. Actually, I do need to talk to that one separately. You want to? Yeah, not yet. No, I'll, we'll, we can get back to that one. That is my son, Brendan, um, and my son, my daughter, Kate, and Jesse. That photo was the last photo I've got of my family and my children together on the 24th of March, 
2017. Um, John was um, on the operating table that day, um, having an 11-hour 11, an 11 operation to remove most of his liver and a good part of other organs in his body. Um, that was a, an enduring day and it's my lasting photo of my three children together. Right. This is my, my closing remarks. I've anne annexed these photos of Jesse below and I've left them to the end just to keep trying to keep the personal out of this. But now it's personal. I'd like to thank my solicitor Greg Isliani for his unrelenting dedication to the reform in the mil of the military justice system and the veteran sector, sector for over 30 years. Greg came into, into my life during the coronial inquest into Jesse's suicide and we have shared this journey ever since. To Matt Black, I have appreciated your legal assistance since we first met in the, in the early months following Jesse's suicide. Thank you for your unrelenting help as well. Beyond my legal team, I would like to thank the many men and women I have met across the serving, ex-serving and ESO sectors many of whom have been on the barricades, calling for judicial and administrative reform for far longer than I. I applaud you all. There are too many of you for me to mention here today, but just know, all of you who are listening right now, just know that I see you all. I acknowledge my ignorance of the magnitude of the problem which beset the military and veteran sector when I first ventured into this space in 2016, 2017. The maladministration and obfuscation that had infected the form and function of DVA and the Repatriation Commission for over a century paled almost when compared to the judicial failures across the ADF and the Department of Defence. Now these failures have been identified exposed at this Royal Commission. The oath of allegiance to this nation and the defence service contract that sits uncomfortably beside it has been undermined by a particular brand of exceptionalism that has allowed an incredible group of Australian men and women to be left unprotected by the very systems that they have sworn to defend. Destroying some, fueling disillusionment for others and leaving others to walk away with a, with a shadow that continues to hang over them into perpetuity. I recognise that this is not the case for everyone. That's not everyone's story. Many members have long and successful careers and for that it's extremely commendable of them and it's really important that we have a defence force. But let's be really frank and free here. We're not here today to talk about the commendable ones with the long careers. We're here to, t we've been here for more than 900 days. Actually, I think it's, it's, over, it's over a thousand days. Considering one in three and four serving men and women and ex-service members who have completed or contemplated suicide or have practiced or experienced some form of self-harm because of their service. Thank you for that. No, I've got... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just defence covenants and pins have no cordial from where I sit. In Jesse's case, his nightmares and inability to sleep, undermined by his physical and mental well-being, his DVA claims and needs assessments, forms lists the death of... ..as a constant dark reflection. And could I ask you... To put that other photo on, please. Could the one go, there was a fourth photo. Could that be put up for private display, please, operator? This. This photo 
was shared with me after Jesse died um, amongst Jesse's very broad and wide defence net veteran network. That's Jesse, right hand side. He was scorched, Jesse was scorched by a medico-legal system that paid no heed to over 100 years of historical and social research into combat trauma and moral injury. His early needs assessments were equally telling, bad dreams, constant and troubling thoughts about service events, feeling insecure and needing to always be on guard, but the most telling on his needs assessment was his feelings of shame. And I, I've, I've, got, I've got no idea why, but that's listed on three needs assessments. In fact, Jesse's war warrant, death warrant was signed very early back in um, October 20, 2016, when his white card confirmation came through from DVA signed by a Deputy Commissioner, clearly stating his eligibility for treatment was accepted and granted while concurrently denying that those accepted conditions were service related. I've got that document. And many other people got similar letters that showed such frank disregard for their service. The criminality of process is evidence in this do one document. The incongruity here of issuing an Afghanistan combat veteran whose defence service record contains multiple examples of exposures to warlike service cannot be lost on the Royal Commission. This is a powerful example of how the disconnect between the ADF and DBA, which was first clearly identified in 1924 in the Royal Commission into Repatriation Services after World War I. It's still current in the 21st century. As another Anzac Day approaches and the bugles are played and the wreaths are laid at the foot of all the obelisks and statues and cenotaphs around this country, some facts remain. On March the 14th, as recent as March the 14th, 2024, the most, rele most, release most recent AIHW report into military and veteran suicide clearly states Suicide is preventable. I know that Jesse's suicide was preventable. I repeat here now some of the words that I used most recently at the dedication to the sufferings of war and service memorial at the Australian War Memorial on the 22nd of February that I mentioned earlier. It's actually Annexure um, KB17, but I don't know if you're able to bring that up or not. I think it's a link through to the actual war memorial site, but it might be too hard. Um, the first memorial of its kind anywhere in the world, acknowledging the long-term cost of war and service. War and service can and does have consequences, and it does come home. The human toll is all around us. It's right in front of our eyes. Although the struggle is known, it remains poorly understood. And this is really important, and this has to real consequences for the Australian government and our Defence Minister and everyone on the Defence Service Committees and their strategic committees. For as long as, as the flux and woe of human frailty returns us to war to settle our petty differences and competing interests, we, as a nation, will be required to account for all those who freely sign a defence service contract and we place in harm's way in our name. The re that responsibility falls heavily on us all as citizens of this country. 
as a nation, we have waxed and waned in that responsibility. The evidence before the Royal Commission and the recommendations that follow must be a catalyst for change. The abuse and injustice, the ignorance and disbelief, the corporate malfeasance and mismanagement and the lack of accountability and transparency will and can no longer be tolerated in this space. Um, and Peter, could we please go to um, the last slide of my PowerPoint? Well, Operator, if we <coughs> could bring up for public display the document KBI uh, quadruple O triple O one O six three three. And I can see you've already gone to the final page, which is 0650. Dr. Bird, your final remarks. Um, we, we continue to make the world a dangerous place, as Albert Einstein says here, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. Some of the evidence over the last three years has substantiated that. David Morrison talked about walking past what you see and not doing anything. But there's been a whole lot of people walking past or ignoring or turning a blind eye and men and women in uniform have been caught up in it, whether it's in the military justice system across the Defence Force or, or the DVA processes that veterans are forced to endure in the aftermath of their service. The next one, I read this out as a closing comment at the, um, at the Australian War Memorial. To the living we owe respect, but to the dead we owe the truth. And I've spoken my truth today. And the last comment has been my family's experience. We follow our leaders because we have no choice. There is no more terrible pain a man can endure than to see clearly and be able to do nothing. And that was John and I. And John went to his death with that thought in mind that he couldn't do enough to help his son. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr Bird. Thank you for your evidence. Thank you for your wider contribution. Commissioners, that's the examination in chief. I yield to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Singleton. Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Dr. Bird. I just wondered if you could um, perhaps expand on your comment about the exceptionalism in defence. I think there's a war movie, I don't know how long back, it's called A Few Good Men, <laughs> and um, a certain actor gets up and says, uh, you know, arguing why why his brand of military justice is is the right brand of military justice because he argues that he, he and his ilk are the only people brave enough to stand on the barricades and defend the country. So, you know, and so that the rest of you can go on with your uh, your meagre lives. And I think I think that sort of feeds into how a lot of defense people see our, our our, uh, those of us outside the defence sphere, our, audac our audacity to question uh, the way they operate and that they have a different view of what military justice should be. And, and some, of the, some of the comments that I've heard from military people over the last, since Jesse's death, you know, like... Highly distinguished men have commented to me in 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 high places that um, it's sort of the it's sort of the collateral damage of war. It's that expectation that yeah we lose some, and that only ever hits home when we actually know them. And I've had quite a few people say that to me. People that knew Jesse served with Jesse in senior positions. 
I've had, I've had senior members in ESOs say, of course, Mrs Bird, it's really sad, but he was always going to do it. So there's a certain level of exceptionalism that enables that sort of thinking to flourish in organisations. And the lack of um, public voice, um, you know, to endure the last seven years has taken a huge, huge toll on me. And there are people in my broader friendship group that say, well, you know, just, just walk away. What on earth are you still doing here, you know? But not championing me above anyone else. But I'm surrounded by amazing people. My mate over there, Julianne Finney, who's been following this commission around, almost bankrupting herself, I suspect, to do it without assistance. Um, sometimes it takes a few good people to stand up and speak truth. And there's been a few of us in this commission. You've heard lots of evidence. I've listened to a lot of it. I know you poor people have had to endure a lot of private testimony from people. And I bet when you took this on almost, what, three years ago, I bet you never knew what you were taking on. I bet you thought, oh, well, yeah, Royal Commission to Redemption, Jesus, 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 Jesus. yeah. But the, 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 the human cost on your th the three of you and the staff must be huge what you've what you've had to listen to what you've had to what you've had to read so behind what all of that has been a particular sort of exceptionalism that has enabled it because it doesn't it hasn't operated none of this has happened in isolation and i commend you particularly peggy for the some of the some of the questioning <laughs> that you've that you've pushed you know and to you Commissioner Keldus, Commissioner Douglas, you know, you have tried to be frank and free and fearless. And let's be very honest, there's been a bit of resistance. Thank you for those um, kind words. Could I perhaps just ask one more, one other question? You started um, today talking about the Royal Commission in 1924, which of course, 100 years ago this year. Um, and it seems we've struggled to actually learn the lessons over a century mm. that were there to be learned. Um, and you're, you're a, an academic historian. Um, I guess t two questions. Why, in your, in your view, why do we as a country, and we're not alone, other countries no. face the same, why do we struggle to face... To, to learn the lessons, to face the truth of what is defence and veteran suicide. Um, and I think perhaps then linked to that, what message do you want to go out to the Australian people? You've talked today about the government and politicians and, and uh, departments, but to the Australian people, do you have a message? And I guess I, I'm kind of linking those two. Well, one, unfortunately, we still need a military, as I said in my final message. So young men and women of this country have to, when they sign their defence contract, service contract, they actually have to believe all the way back when Billy Hughes said in Parliament in 1917, um, you know, well, basically he was saying... Um, what, we, what you do for us, we will do for you. We'll have your back. Well, no one had Jessie's back. So, as a mother, it's very difficult to currently recommend the Australian Defence Force as a career choice for anyone. But I can't, but in saying that, I know I shouldn't say it because we actually do need a defence force. Because I'm, I'm also, you know, fairly astute um, observer of international relations. Like we, there are concerns out there, but um, I think we need a lot more Penny Wongs in the in the room and a few less more adversarial types that uh, are um, that are looking 
looking looking for war. Um, but we have to have, there has to be some belief that the Department of Veteran Affairs can be made fit for purpose. That when someone puts their hand up for help, See, the, the amazing thing was for us was back in 2000, and we didn't bring it up, Pete, Pete, we didn't bring it up enough, Peter, but when Jesse made those phone calls, you know, two and three days before he died um, to team leader in Perth um, who'd never met Jesse, um, and he expressed his concern that no one's taking any notice of him. And then, obviously, she upset him so much that he filed a complaint and sent a message, an email to to DVA uh, Cloudland um, saying that, well, if she's the best you've got, basically, you need to f get rid of her and you need to find someone that actually um, is concerned with what I've got to say because it, he... His intimation was he's going to be a statistic. And that was a few couple of days before he died. There was no reach out. There was no red flags identified. So that meant what sort of quality of staff, staff were operating in 2000 and middle of 2017 that didn't red flag that this actually doesn't sound really good. But it was a Friday afternoon in Perth, you know, public servant, no no disrespect, but it was pretty close to um, cut off time on a Friday afternoon and um, was, wasn't followed up. The weekend came. Jesse, was di Jesse died sometime Monday, Monday or Tuesday morning. Um, and his friends realised they hadn't heard from him for 24, 36 hours and they went knocking on his door. So um, when I say there actually does need to be some face-to-face -face engagement with veterans, you know, they need to be treated more than just a file. Um, I'm deadly serious about that. There needs to be, there needs to be, when they talk about client engagement, that it operates as a department inside DVA, but there's no client engagement. It's at the end of a telephone. No one, no one actually goes and sees them or invites them in to meet them because of the way the department's currently run with siloed operations all over the place. It's still, still just like that. Yeah. That engagement's a critical element. Yeah. In the Enga you and your area of expertise, there actually does need to be some eyeballing. We actually, actually need to identify and engage with people. My statement is full of so many missed opportunities. You know, the the, the engagement at Geelong Clinic, um, you know, HealthScope property, making a huge amount of money, the private health sector, making a huge amount of money in, in the veteran health space um, this century, treating veterans, you know. DVA must be one of the biggest buyers of beds in these, these places around the country because we've got no repatriation system anymore. There's, I go into some length about the um, evidence of the Jesse's treating psychologist and how how damaged he was by the end of the coronial process when he realised basically he actually did contribute to Jesse's death by not not actioning anything. Let's be really frank here. He's not here to defend himself, but poor man. He gave up taking DVA clients. He was a shattered man at that inquest. Because he actually had to eyeball the, the, the parents of, the, of a young man that he actually wrote in his notes was a really nice young man. Thank you very much, Dr Bird. I, I'll, I'll leave it there and I, I'll allow time for my colleagues to ask some questions. Yeah. But thank you very much for um, your appearance today and for your statement. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Douglas. Oh, thank you from me too, Dr Bird. Um, I have one comment and one question comment derives from your references to the 1924 Royal Commission. I'm sure you're aware of it, but there's also very useful, reliable 
contemporaneous evidence about um, the effect of war on people's psyches in the official war history or medical history of Australia's involvement in that war. And there are two chapters in particular called Moral and Mental Disorders of yeah. the War Damaged Soldier. Mm. And it shows that the issues that we're still talking about now were alive mm. then and the medicos treating them were aware of the complexities and difficulties and the subtleties of yeah. dealing with people who are suffering from trauma based on episodes in war or other episodes in their perhaps peacetime lives. Mm. So it is an old problem and we do need to get better at treating it. So that's my comment. My, my question derives from what you were saying about the expense of legal access to challenging, for example, DBA decisions. One of the um, submissions made to us is by the national legal aid bodies who fund the Defence and, Ve and Veterans Legal Service who help assist people with this commission is that the funding they've received for that in effect be extended to allow them to provide um, defence and veterans legal aid services throughout the country. New South Wales does something like that in their legal aid system at present. Do you have any comment on that? Um. Well, it makes per makes perfect makes perfect sense because currently, um, you commission's very aware the veterans go to a veteran review board twice, and can be reject their claims can be rejected. They're not allowed to have legal representation. Um, Another model is in Canada, which we've come across, called Bureau of Pension Advocates, which is actually attached to their Veterans Affairs Department but independent from it and they provide um, specialist lawyers in-house who deal with appeals from uh, initial decisions about entitlements to in effect an equivalent of the Veterans Review Board and they're specialist government lawyers in-house but provide their services to veterans and are perceived as independent any view about that as a model? Well, I certainly think that veterans need access to legally qualify uh, to um, to lawyers and legal teams. Advocates have tried to do an admirable job in this space, but I think, to be very honest, a lot of times it's been found wanting. Um, Advocates are used in Canada at the initial applications. So yeah, so the lawyers come in if there's an appeal. Yeah. I half wonder when when you're up against a legal team from the get-go and in-house legal teams inside the Department of Veteran Affairs, inside Defence, I actually think from the get-go veterans and serving members need access to the same quality of advice and it is highly disputable that um, ad local advocates at RSLs, and I, I respect them dearly and I know there'll be a lot of them listening to me today, perhaps. Um, uh, many of them, many of those people that have been advising, and I know in, in Jesse's case, they were both severely damaged men themselves. So their ability to offer the best quality service um, was was questionable, but not dis not dis not dis um, dishonouring their efforts to help my son. But if I what I know now, if I know what I knew what I know now, if I knew it back in two thousand and fifteen, I would have gone straight to Greg. Greg came into my life much later. Okay. There needs to be a lot of Gregs out there, people that are driven with a real social justice imperative in this space. Thanks very much.
Thank you, Dr. Bird. I just have a couple of points and then we'll go around. Um, one of the things, obviously, the Commission's been concerned about has been, as you know, dozens of inquiries that preceded us, hundreds of recommendations and so on. Um, the constant battle of Senate inquiry, you made a submission and you know others obviously made submissions. I just want to be clear, and it's for the record, that even though you made some very specific um, complaints, if you like, or points to the inquiry, DVA must have been aware of what you uh, submitted to the, to the Senate inquiry. There was no follow-up by anyone. No. That became apparent to me when I went into the Senate um, before a function in Canberra. I can't remember the actual date, but it was in the middle of um, 2019. Uh, the, the, I'd been engaged, I'd had phone calls and emails from that, that the Senate office that was uh, organising the, um, the centenary of the function of the Senate and the 50th anniversary of the committees. And I thought while well, I was in Canberra to engage with DVA on matters and to attend a DVA function and I thought, oh, well, it's an opportunity to go into the Senate and I met, met the people that were working and putting that together and I just asked them because I just thought I'd ask, ask the staff, well, you know, um, you were accepting, you were in some of, were any of you involved with the constant battle and yeah, yeah, we're involved with the constant battle and um, were you aware that, um, you know, the submissions were coming in and they admitted, yeah, and they said that there was staff from the department were actually in reading reading the submissions, but to my knowledge, because they're definitely, I use my example, my phone number and my email was at the bottom of the submission for people to contact John and I, and no effort was made. Thank you. Just a couple of other quick points. In relation to the coronial process, and we've asked many people this question, do you recall being offered or supplied with any counselling by the coroner's office or process? Um, I had uh, a family liaison officer. Uh, Is that from the police force or from the coroner's court? From the coroner's court. And sh she was excellent. She kept me informed. She rang me every month. And that went on for a couple of years, basically, from 2017 to when they first engaged with me to 2019. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and just one final point in relation to the covenant. And I, I just want to be clear and for the record again. The point you wanted to make is that essentially it was unenforceable. There is no legislation to compel anyone to do anything out of the nice words that are in the covenant as it stands today. That's how I see it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms Wright, do you have any questions? No, thank you, Commissioners, and this will be my last appearance, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr Black? Commissioners, I, I might, but could I just ask uh, the Commission for the indulgence of a short recess um, to speak with Dr Bird before we finalise? Is that OK? Because I need to... That should, that should be fine. That's fine. We'll just adjourn very briefly. Yeah. Royal Commission will now adjourn.
The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Thank you, Mr Black. Thank you, Commissioners. Just a couple of short follow-up questions. Um, doc <coughs> Dr Bird, you were asked by Commissioner Caldas about um, DVA's response or, or lack thereof after you had made a submission to the Constant Battle Senate inquiry. And you mentioned in your written statement, and for the operator, I'm sorry, I don't have the um, official page numbers, but at paragraphs 136 and 137, some notices on, uh, sorry, questions on notice that were put to the department. Did you want to just expand on that issue and, and the department's response to those questions? I objection. Um, the question directly calls for information about proceedings in Parliament to be given to the Commission. And I object on that basis. Um, Commissions, I'm, perhaps it's just my wording. I'm not looking for a comment on the, um, the Parliament or the proceedings, but in terms of um, Sorry, the, the objection hasn't been ruled on. No, it hasn't. I'm trying to. Oh, here we are. Reread the question. And my, yes, it did seem to ask. My transcript had frozen, so I'm getting back there, though. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. I think it did ask for the content of questions on notice. Were these questions on notice arising out of parliamentary proceedings? Like was it a Senate estimates hearing or something like that? That's what I understood was the question precisely. Commissioner, I can only go on the words that were spoken as part of the question, right. if it pleases. I'm not able to provide specific context, but perhaps I can short circuit this, I'm, because I'm not you take seeking to... you the statement you're talking about, sorry? Uh, so it starts at paragraph 136 in the second statement. Uh, here we are, KBI.0000.0001 .0061. And I'm not sure of the particular pinpoint page, but starting at paragraph 136. Well, 137 speaks about a question on notice by Senator Lambie. Uh, and 138 goes on with a reply. Do you want to ask her to comment on what was said in Parliament? As I said, perhaps I've worded my question poorly. So if I withdraw that question, perhaps if I just really go to this, that Dr Bird, in paragraph 139, you refer to not having a clear answer about the question of um, what investigations DVA might have done. Is that a reply to separately from what was said in Parliament? Or do we know that? She can't comment on what was said in Parliament. If it assists, Commissioner, I believe um, my learned friend, Council Assisting, had applied a redaction to both paragraphs 137 and 139 um, and wasn't proposing to tender those even um, subject to claims from the Commonwealth, if it pleases. As presently advised, there are two levels at which parliamentary privilege operates in respect of paragraphs 136, sorry, 137 to 139. 137 and 138 cannot be received in substance in evidence for, the, for any purpose. But in particular... Um, the fact that something was said in parliament can be received if it's relevant. 
Um, if it's relevant, yeah. Insofar as an attempt might be made to urge an inference upon you or a conclusion arising from those two paragraphs, it would not be permissible. My friend, We're now focusing on 139, though. Yes, well, that, uh, I, that was context. Parliamentary privilege goes even further. Um, it also prohibits evidence or comments in proceedings that tend to impugn what has occurred in Parliament, yes. including, in my submission, um, impugning Parliament by pointing to something that should have been said but was not. Now, whilst it might be possible to cure the problem with respect to 137 and 138 by disavowing any intention to draw inferences, one cannot disavow an impugning and pretend that it still doesn't have its objective effect. What's the redaction that's been applied to 139? Was I, I at don't the, at the, the moment, original unredacted one. Yes, at the moment, the whole of 139 is redacted pending proper deliberation, bearing in mind this statement was only received yesterday afternoon in its final yes. form. So um, at the moment, the whole statement is redacted, not merely for publication, but from evidence before you. Okay. Well, Mr Black? And that's unlikely to change in respect so, so to So far, I'm against you, unless you, unless you want me to rule on something not associated with the proceedings in Parliament? Um, no, look, I'll, I'll leave that. Thank you. Sorry, if you could just press the red button. Sorry, um, for the record, I said I'll, I'll leave that and move on. Um, Mrs Bird, uh, sorry, Dr Bird, the other questions I just wanted to ask then was you've mentioned in some detail a lot of the important historical uh, context to the issues that the Royal Commission is exploring and you've referred to the idea that DVA has been found at various times to be not fit for purpose. Did you have some comments to make about your level of confidence or con any concerns about whether moving forward with any new legislation the department could be assumed or um, believed to be fit for purpose? There is clear and present, they call a clear and present danger. Um, historically, we know that after World War I, World War II, the Korean War and the Vietnam War, the incidence of claims for assistance increased as the years went on. Mental health often deteriorated as the years went on. So the question now is, we have thousands of poorly transitioned veterans in the Australian community living with their families, if they're still with them. Because historically, the statistics suggest that family breakdown is a symptom of a veteran who has been poorly assisted in his recovery from his service. So the question must be, the new legislation that is before the parliament and now out in for public discussion is how fit for purpose is that legislation and are there adequate provisions in that legislation to make sure that people like Jesse, who put their hand up tomorrow, next week, next year, or in five years' time, will get better assistance than what my Jesse got. Um, I'm unconvinced currently. The current, the new secretary, I think, is making a solid effort. There are people in the senior administrative team across the department that have been there for a long time and have been part of the problem from where I can see, limitedly. Uh, 
the lack of accountability across that department I drew on earlier. Um, I can't see that anyone, too many people, have ever been called to account for what what occurred, what what occurred to Jesse. Still to this day, I've got no idea because people, actually individuals, were supervising Jesse's assistants. I don't know what happened to any of them. Maybe I don't need to know, but it fits into this whole conversation as to whether the department is fit for purpose going forward. So there needs to be serious input from really good legal minds into the current legislation and to look for the loopholes where, where, where beneficial interests, where there's issues, where, where, um, where delays in, um, in, in claims processing for argument's sake. Um, the secretary made claim last week that, you know, the claims processing is, is in hand but does that mean that they've moved from, from file A to file B? So they're... Because at the moment there's no pressing need or any time limitations put on settling up of claims. Jesse was 300 into nearly 400 days of waiting for claims. You know, is... And I... I I don't think anyone's told me that the new legislation has, um, has limitations put on the settlement of claims. I'd, I'd be really happy to, happy to be enlightened that a, a claim needed to be processed in 120 days for argument's sake. 90 days would be ideal. And I'd like to think that if people were in urgent need of help that they'd, um, they'd get their incapacity payments a lot quicker than Jesse did. So that's the sort of detail I'd like to know because there's, there's great fanfare out there in the, in the space talking about the new legislation, but um, I'm looking forward to be convinced that it is fit for purpose going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, Mr Black. Mr Singleton, any matters arising? Nothing arising. Might Dr Bird be excused? Uh, certainly, but I just need to make a couple of comments. Dr Bird, we just want to thank you for your evidence today and the extensive preparation you've had to do over the last probably couple of years um, before today. We want to thank you for your courage and your persistence. It, it's what you've done today which has highlighted very effectively the failure of the entire system, political and otherwise, to help to deal with those who have been, who have worn the uniform, who have done everything we've asked of them and then failed to support them when they came back or when they most needed help. You've done that very effectively. We can't thank you enough, you and all the other uh, lived experience witnesses, many of whom are here today that we're very grateful to. This commission could not do what it needs to do without you. Um, if there's no other issues, the witness can be excused from her summons to appear and uh, we'll need to take an adjournment of 15 minutes before the next witness then. Thank you. All rise. The Royal Commission will now adjourn for 15 minutes.
Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Good afternoon, Ms Longbottom. Good afternoon, Commissioner Caldas. We call our next witness, Mr Greg Moriarty, the Secretary of the Department of Defence. May he be administered the oath or affirmation. Do you solemnly declare and affirm that the evidence you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, operator, can you please display the tender bundle? Perhaps while they're doing that, I'll just place on the record that I do know Mr Moriarty. We've known each other for some years through our various professional capacities over the last decade or so. Thank you, Commissioner Thank you. Caldas. Commissioners, I seek to tender the documents in the tender bundle in the manner in which they are described in the list. Okay, how many pages is it? I'll check the precise number of pages. Uh, commissioners, the first page is the documents to be um, tendered. The remaining pages, which are some five pages of documents that have previously been tendered. Okay, thank you. They'll be accepted on that basis then and just allocated the next lot of numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr Moriarty, you've held the role of Secretary of the Department of Defence since September of 2017? That's correct, Council. So that's a tenure of around six and a half years now to date? Yes, Council. And am I correct that by virtue of your reappointment in September of 2017, 22, you'll continue in that role until 2027? That's the, the extension was for five years, Council. And so that takes us to 2027? That's correct. Um, Secretary, <coughs> would it be correct to say, would it not, that you and General Campbell are the most senior leaders within what's called the defence diarchy? Yes, that's that's correct, Council. It's a, it's a unique governance model in the, in the Commonwealth, unique to the departments where the CDF and I have some shared accountabilities and then individual accountabilities. And in terms of those shared accountabilities, you hold joint responsibility for the administration of the Australian Defence Force? Well, the joint, joint accountabilities for the administration of the department and the department includes the Australian Defence Force. Um, and you've been tasked by the government with jointly leading defence as a single strategy-led and centrally directed organisation? That is correct. And while, as you've alluded to, you have distinct functions with respect to that administration responsibility, in your statement you characterise your relationship with the Chief of the Defence Force as being a partnership? That is correct. And that partnership with the Chief of the Defence Force extends to matters of strategy and policy and enabling organisational change? That is correct. And I have some particular... I'm the principal policy advisor to the government in relation to defence matters, so policy, intelligence and resourcing. And I'll come to that in a moment, but I just particularly want to focus on that aspect of your partnership with the Chief of Defence Force. In respect of those matters of strategy, policy and enabling organisational change, it would be correct to say, would it not, Secretary, that that extends to matters that are of interest to this Royal Commission, specifically including culture? Yes, that is correct. And also mental health and wellbeing? That is correct. Can you give the Commission as an overview of the interdependencies in your relationship with General Campbell? Well, certainly. Um, uh, General Campbell and I work very closely on um, all aspects of the overall management of the Defence uh, Department. Uh, the CDF has unique and very particular responsibilities for the command of the ADF and the, the conditions of service that ADF uh, members uh, uh, enjoy and but also the disciplines that they are subject to. I am, we have a shared uh, accountability to make sure that the department commits resources effectively to respond to government priorities. We have a shared responsibility to ensure that the, the department is governed well in accordance with the laws and regulations required of us by 
both the government and the parliament, including the PGPA Act. Uh, and I have a particular uh, stewardship responsibility in relation to the Australian Public Service members of the defence uh, organisation. Now, Secretary, the Commission heard la evidence last week from the Chief of Personnel, Lieutenant General Natasha Fox. Um, she was giving evidence, and I'll take you to it in a moment, about the interdependencies in her relationship with her diarchic pair, the Deputy Secretary of Defence Personnel. Um, I might just ask the operator to display uh, the transcript for day 96 and turn to 96 dash 96 and can you please expand lines 14 to lines 25? I'll give you an opportunity to read that, Secretary. So, Secretary, um, the Chief of Personnel gave evidence that she cannot achieve what she needs to do without the direct support of the Deputy Secretary of Defence people. And the flip side of that is that the Deputy Secretary of Defence people cannot achieve what she needs to do without the direct support of the Chief of Personnel. I is that true of the interdependencies of your role with the Chief of the Defence Force? Uh, in, in broad terms, yes, Council. In particular, my responsibilities for resourcing mean that in order for the CDF to be able to command the ADF and for the ADF to be able to plan and conduct operations, that, that needs uh, my input to make sure that the resources are available. Uh, and in terms of the for the for the services, it, it means that, and, and again, in accordance with uh, very strong input from the CDF, uh, I would make resources available uh, to the, the parts of the ADF in order to raise, train and sustain, and then I would make resources available for the planning and the conduct of operations. Secretary, can I ask you that question quite specifically with respect to those areas of culture, mental health and well-being. In that respect, is it correct to say that the Chief of Defence cannot achieve what he needs to do without you? I, I certainly provide support to the CDF in terms of ADF culture and the broad, the broad cultural frameworks that exist in the department. So that extends beyond resourcing to matters of policy? Yes, I, we, we both are involved in, for example, the defence cultural blueprint, while it has some unique ADF aspects to it, is it is a departmental-wide policy framework. But that 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 policy framework directly sits under your chain of command to use military parlance under the Deputy Secretary of Defence people. That's correct. Deputy Secretary of Defence people is the accountable officer for the Defence Culture Blueprint. And, and, and is that interdependency also true of the work that is done in the space of mental health and wellbeing? Uh, yes, there's, there's certain aspects of that that are more particularly the responsibility of Joint Health Command, which comes under the ADF chain of command. But in terms of the Defence uh, Mental Health and Wellbeing branch, that sits within the Defence People Group which uh, comes more under my um, responsibilities, although the CDF and I are both heavily involved in supporting the work of the Defence Mental Health and Wellbeing Branch. And in terms of the responsibilities that particularly sit within Joint Health Commands, they are things like, they are the technical authority for matters pertaining to the health and welfare of ADF members, that's correct? That's correct, and, and, and care. And second of all, they, they deliver care, um, including psychological care to members, but particularly focusing on enterprise-wide initiatives 
that are necessary to address matters affecting the mental health and well-being of ADF members and APS members alike. That is um, an interdependency between you and the Chief of the Defence Force. You'd accept that? I accept that it's a shared accountability and an inter interdependency. And the Chief of Defence Force cannot achieve what he needs to do in terms of enterprise level change with respect to mental health and wellbeing without your support? That's right. I, and I see my role as very much uh, to provide the support that the CDF and the other senior leadership of the ADF need to, to be able to drive those reforms. Now, you say in your statement that you've had responsibility, you have responsibilities for the mental health and wellbeing of the defence enterprise. You particularly date that to July 2023. What's the significance of that date? Well, <clears throat> I think the, 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 there's been a lot of work done and, and, and in fact, in, informed by the very important work of this Royal Commission, but then the Defence Culture Blueprint, which was, a very, I think, a very important piece of work. That's when the, the CDF and I, through the Defence Committee, looked at um, the, the, the next phase of our culture work and that mental health and wellbeing strategy, the standing up of, of, the, of the branch and the defence culture uh, blueprint work being prepared and endorsed by the defence committee. So it'd be right to say you see mental health and wellbeing and culture as being inextricably linked? I do. Um, and that is because, for example, um, poor culture can lead to adverse mental health outcomes for members of the Defence Force. I believe that to be the case. Uh, focusing particularly, though, with respect to your specific responsibilities for mental health and wellbeing at an enterprise level, they pre-existed July 2023. You'd agree with that? Oh, certainly. And there was, um, there was work being done. Um, very useful work being done over a long period of time and I, I, I've followed evidence given to this Royal Commission about the, the journey around pathways to change, the, the various policy adjustments that have been made, the, the improvements, but, um, but I think that in, in 2023 a number of pieces of work have come together which I think will improve our ability to take this work forward. Now, I just want to put culture to one side for a moment and ask you to focus particularly on mental health and well-being. You would accept that your responsibilities in that field extend to ensuring that you're exercising your powers to ensure that there exist systems and strategies that address all aspects of the defence workforce mental health and well-being? Yes, the, the broad enterprise mental health and well-being strategy is, I, I believe, a shared responsibility that the CDF and I have. And then I have a particular responsibility to make sure that the resources are made available to allow for the effective implementation of that strategy. So would it be fair to say you have shared responsibilities with respect to that topic, but you have specific powers you can bring to bear to discharge that responsibility? Yes, that is correct. Right, so I, I'm very, very much committed to jointly working with the CDF and to produce a quality policy framework that will assist with the mental health and well-being of our workforce and, and uh, former members. And then my unique responsibilities because of my particular responsibilities for finance are to make sure that in consultation with other members of the senior leadership, leadership group, appropriate resources are made available to ensure that that strategy is able to be implemented. But I think, and this is this appears from your statement, um, finances are not the sole lever that you bring to bear with respect to these issues. That's um, correct. Your powers extend to matters of um, organisational reform. Correct. And policy. Correct. Now, um, in terms of your specific responsibilities with respect to mental health and wellbeing, you would agree that they extend to the prevention of suicide and suicidality amongst um, members and veterans? Yes, that, and, uh, and I believe that, that the issue of suicide and suicidality is, uh, and, and over recent years has been increasingly captured in the policy documents 
that we have produced, but I, I accept your proposition. When you say increasingly captured, what is the point in time at which you would mark those matters being squarely dealt with in defence policy? Uh, I, well, the issue of suicide has been a, a concern to defence over, over many years and many former defence leaders and, and, and in terms of the evidence provided to this Royal Commission, it, it does go back many, many years, but I think we have conceptualised it in terms of a, a broader wellness uh, function in more, in more recent years. It's, it, so it's not just about treating um, issues, but how do you provide the environment in which an individual um, whole of life wellness and their their lived experience uh, is is properly uh, treated and provided for and I think wellness um, my understanding is that wellness goes that the issue of wellness goes back several years at least um, at least five or six in terms of the increased emphasis that defence has put on wellness. But in terms of that broader conceptualising of mental health and wellbeing, um, would it be fair to say the principal initiative you're talking about there is the mental health and wellbeing branch that was established pursuant to Joint Direction 15 of 2023? Yeah, work, work was obviously being done before then, but the establishment of the mental health and wellbeing branch, I believe, is a very significant development. And when you say work was being done before then, um, can you give commissioners two or three examples of that broader wellbeing work that was being reflected in defence policies prior to that point in time? Uh, look, I, I, I certainly am aware that Joint Health Command was was uh, uh, had had a focus on this issue going back many years, and in the in in terms of um, the individual service cultural uh, plans and implementation. Uh, it talked about creating respectful, healthy um, workplaces where people feel felt respected and safe. That, that goes back uh, many, many years. But I think having a more expertly informed uh, strategy around mental health and wellbeing and particular focusing on the avoidance of, of suicide and, and uh, approaching suicidality, that is a more recent fun, uh, ap approach. And when you're talking about that more expert strategy, you were there talking about the mental health and wellbeing branch. That, and, and I think the defence cultural blueprint, which, which is informed by that changed uh, and, and increased focus, the defence culture blueprint, I, I believe, because it has uh, taken into account recent work and recent uh, lessons uh, will be that the work that the mental health and wellbeing branch will do across the groups and services to provide expert input to help develop products and training to do better quality evaluation, I, I believe that that is a, a particularly important development. So that cultural blueprint, that again occurred, is it about 2023? Uh, there, there was work uh, underway well before that, but it culminated in, in the mental health and wellbeing strategy and the standing up of the mental health and wellbeing branch. So they're about sort of six years into your tenure as secretary. That's, that's correct. How would you characterise the importance of the work being done by Defence to reduce the incidence of suicide and suicidality amongst members and veterans? I'm sorry, Council, could you ask that again? How important do you think is the work Defence is doing to reduce the prevalence of suicide and suicidality amongst its members? Uh, Council, it's it, like it's very important in terms of we d defence. Uh, one of our key priorities is the the development of our of our people and looking after their welfare and their health. And obviously, me mental health is a very important 
part of that in, t in terms of the government's response to the defence strategic review last year. It was one of the six immediate priority areas was defence, the building of, of the capacity of defence of defence people, making sure that we have a healthy, motivated workforce with a focus on mental health is, is a really important part of that. And that, that observation you've just made and linking it to the Defence Strategic Review, I think that reflects public statements that have been made by the government that defence as people are its most important asset. You're aware of those statements? I am very much aware of them. Um, and I think consistent with what you've just said, that links to the observation made in your statement that a healthy and productive workforce is integral to defence capability. You'd agree with that? I, that that is correct. We cannot deliver the missions and effects that the government requires of us if we do not have a healthy and capable workforce. Now, you, you've spoken particularly about the initiatives coming out of the Defence Strategic Review, which was last year. Um, but I want you to look across the entire tenure of your um, role as secretary. How highly have you prioritised that work with respect to suicide and suicidality during your tenure as Secretary of the Department of Defence? Well, Council, during the time that I have been Secretary, we've had a number of um, developments that have uh, really impacted on my, my focus on this issue. One was the, um, the product Activity Commission report, the interim commissioner's work, which I, I, I was also very um, uh, focused on. We've had the Afghanistan inquiry, both the Brereton report and, uh, and related things which go to the issue of culture. Um, so, and during that time, my own journey in terms of my own awareness of the complexity of these issues is also very significantly altered and, and deepened. And can I just stop you there? You've mentioned a couple of um, reports and reviews that have brought to your attention matters pertaining both to suicide and suicidality, but also with respect to culture. Um, and you've also spoken about the evolution in your understanding. Do, do you think it would be fair to say that, the, that defence has had a blind spot with respect to the issue of suicide and suicidality before those reports were provided? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't accept that. But those reports and the and our experience of recent years has intensified our focus on these issues. Okay, so accepting as you say, this is a matter of which you were aware, you know, before those reports were handed down. Um, how highly have you prioritised that work to address suicide and suicidality during your tenure? Yeah, my focus has uh, been, of course in terms of the broad policy frameworks, but in particular, I have focused on it in relation to my particular responsibilities as steward of the Australian public service workforce. And I have put particular effort into understanding the mental health and wellbeing and the general um, uh, uh, morale and of, of our public service workforce and I've also focused on responding to whatever professional initiatives have been suggested by the ADF in terms of how they might more appropriately or more effectively respond to these challenges and I've been very quick to provide the resources that have been requested by the ADF to make uh, a more more appropriate and more widespread uh, responses to these challenges. Has it been a high priority for you? The general issue of uh, uh, the mental health and well-being of our total workforce is a high priority. It, and people more generally, the re retention, recruitment and the capacity and the uh, ability of our workforce to to uh, deliver the outcomes the government's response r requires from us is a high priority for me and I cannot do that if I do not focus on mental health and well-being. And how effective do you think tenure in terms of discharging those responsibilities for the mental health and well-being of the ADF members and veterans? I, I would like to say that we have made some very significant 
improvement. I am, I remain very disappointed that we have not been able to um, change some of the underlying statistics when I look at the, the challenges that the organisation has in terms of the way in which workplace health and safety incidents um, are still higher than I would want them to be. The, the reporting of um, unacceptable behaviour is still high, and, and I'm referring here to the services as, as well as the groups that I have particular responsibility for. So I, 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 I am disappointed that the initiatives that we have taken and the additional resources that have been provided uh, are still not being reflected in the sorts of improvements that I would like to see and I, I know the CDF would like to see as well. Uh, Secretary, you made an address last year to the Institute of Public Administration Australia. Do you recollect that was given in about July of last mm. year? During um, that address, you're reported to have said that accountability and courage are needed to acknowledge past examples where the Australian public service have played a role in treating citizens or certain groups of people inappropriately. Do you recall that I statement? I do recall that. Now, those observations were made in a different context. They related to the treatment of First Nations peoples in this country. But do you consider that there is a need for such an acknowledgement by the public service with respect to um, the issue of defence member and veteran suicide and suicidality? I, be I believe that defence has uh, made acknowledgements that in the past there have been um, failures and I believe that de def defence and, and, and previous governments have also said that uh, the treatment of defence members and veterans and uh, their ability to access services and support have, have been inadequate. So, yes, I do acknowledge that in relation to currently serving and formerly serving members, uh, in me on, on occasion they have been let down by the system. And, and I'm asking particularly about, I mean, you've spoken about defence, but I'm asking particularly your perspective as the most senior public servant within defence um, and, in fact, the longest-serving longest senior leader within the organisation that is One Defence. Do you, as Secretary, consider that there is a need for such an acknowledgement with respect to defence member and veteran suicide? I think the the, the, the organisation needs to be con committed to continual improvement and it does need to acknowledge past deficiencies and failures and in order to in order to improve and to provide better quality and more targeted initiatives that deal with these issues of mental health and well-being in particular uh, suicide is a major challenge that if we don't acknowledge and learn from uh, past practice and what 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 could and should have been done better we won't be able to put in place the policies and frameworks to manage these challenges better into the future and in terms of that issue of past practices and failings could you tell commissioners what your reflections of, about that have been what do you see as being defense's principal failings with respect to this issue of member and veteran suicide okay i i um i think in terms of um my own understanding i i i believe i uh, at least in the early period of my tenure, put too much of a focus on operational deployments and service as, as perhaps uh, the area where we needed to devote most resources. And I didn't think about it in the holistic... Uh, so I've, my thinking has evolved as I've become more conscious of the complex range of factors which can contribute to suicidality or, or suicide. And in terms of that, how have you gone about educating yourself about what those factors are? I have, I've, um, like, 
read uh, relevant and, and expert material that has been produced within defence. I've availed myself of um, the opportunity to talk to uh, experts. I've followed the work of the interim commissioner and, and, and if I could say over the last couple of years, I've um, followed the work of this Royal Commission, including the lived experience witnesses and I've learnt from, from those things. It's given me a much broader uh, understanding of the range of factors involved. Now, Secretary, the Commission heard evidence this morning from one of those lived experience um, witnesses. It's Dr Karen Bird, whose son, Jesse, died by suicide. Yeah, I'm aware of the tragic case. Uh, now, um, I, I want to take you to some of the statements that Dr Bird made this morning to give you an opportunity to respond. We may not be able to display them, so I'll just read it out to you. Dr Bird said... To endure the last seven years has taken a huge toll on me. She goes on to say that um, I suspect to do it without assistance. Sometimes it takes a few good people to stand up and speak truth. And there's been a few of us here in this commission. Um, do you agree uh, with the proposition, Secretary, that it really has been the voices particularly of loved ones, of members who have died by suicide that have forced defence to look at this issue and come to terms with it? Uh, Council, I, I, would ca I would frame it in terms of the, the voices of loved ones have been very important, but there have also been voices in, in broader civil society, but also voices within our own organisation, including... Uh, in the services that have dem that have suggested that there there needs to be improvement and there needs to be uh, a, a focus a, a broader focus on on well-being and mental health and well-being. So I, I certainly acknowledge certainly acknowledge the really important and impactful uh, contribution that lived uh, lived experience um, witnesses have provided, and they. But they, they are, they are a very important part, but not the complete picture of what is driving change here. But but you draw a really important distinction there between individual force, individual voices, be they outside of or inside defence, and defence as an organisation. Uh, Dr. Bird goes on to say, and I want to give you an opportunity to comment on this. She says, in the context of the commissioners. You have, been try you have tried to be frank and free and fearless, and let's be very honest, there's been a bit of resistance. Do you think, Secretary, that there has been resistance from defence as an enterprise, really to come to terms and own this issue of um, member and veteran suicide and suicidality? Uh, no, Council, I don't accept that proposition, but, but I think defence has been challenged by how how do we do that in in a in a expert driven evidence based way but i i i do not believe that there is resistance in the defense department to taking a very significantly improved approach to these issues and i think we all look forward to the work of this Royal Commission, but there is work already underway uh, to improve our response to these issues. Well, that's probably an opportune moment to turn to the expert evidence that has been put before Defence in relation to these issues. Um, I think, as you've said, you're appointed Secretary of Defence in September of 2017, that's correct. In the months leading up to your appointment as Secretary, there were the release of two uh, reports that are material to this question. The first is the National Mental Health Commission report on defence and veteran suicide. Did you receive a briefing about that report upon assuming your role as secretary? Uh, Council, I, I, I can't specifically remember. I, I think it was covered in my incoming uh, brief from the, the organisation, but I don't remember it being specifically mentioned but but I, I i think it probably would have but i can't 
I can't say uh, very confidently that, that that particular report was provided to me or briefed to me. The second report that came in a month before you were appointed secretary is the Senate Standing Committee report called The Constant Battle of Suicide by Veterans. Did you recall receiving a briefing about that report? I do. Okay. Having regard to those briefings you received when you assumed your role, what actions did you take with respect to the issue of suicide and suicidality? Um, on, on taking up uh, the appointment, one of my first actions was to meet, well, to discuss these issues with the then uh, CDF, who, um, you know, let, let me know of the work that the ADF was was doing in relation to this. But in terms of my own engagement, I, I spoke to the Associate Secretary um, about what work it was that the broader department was doing in terms of our, our strategies in relation to this. I spoke to the then uh, Deputy Secretary Defence People about the initiatives that were being pursued in the Defence People Group. And I spoke to our Chief Finance Officer to ask about the resources that were being devoted both to the broader issue of uh, defence um, pay and conditions, the, uh, the amount of our budget that was being spent on workforce related matters including health uh, and I uh, asked about the amount of, of resources that was being provided towards work in relation to culture but also mental health. And having regard to those discussions you had in 2017, are there any particular new initiatives that emerged out of those discussions? Uh, I, I was um, informed about the sort of the ongoing work that, that was being done around uh, pathway to change. I was informed about the work that was doing in, in being done in relation uh, to mental health and well-being. I know uh, more on the ADF side of things there was an enormous amount of work going in to uh, Afghanistan related um, work both the, the, the ju uh, Justice Brereton's inquiry was underway at that time and that was dealing with a number of issues to do with culture fatigue, pressure on, on workforce. So I was very conscious that, that that work was very important and was being pursued. Uh, and then there was a general, I suppose, concern about the pressure that the organisation was under um, and our workforce was under and how we might appropriately respond to pressures on the workforce which go to issues of mental health and well-being. And so accepting as you say culture and workforce pressures are all contributing factors that may contribute to adverse mental health outcomes. My question is what specific initiatives that were directed to suicide and suicidality emerged out of those discussions you had in 2017? Yeah, I, I, I'd say my, my role was at a more strategic level to just sort of say is the is our approach to culture appropriate and are, are we looking to continually improve it? And then is the, is the work that we're doing in relation to health, including mental health and wellbeing, is, is it being appropriately resourced? My particular responsibilities are to respond to expert suggestions, to analyse them, uh, in the context of the overall department's objectives and then to ensure that appropriate resources are being provided. So I did, I went to the issue of uh, what is, what are the frameworks that we have in place, what more might, might we need to do and then um, my particular responsibilities around resourcing. So you weren't driving any specific initiatives with respect to suicide and suicidality? But I, I, no, I was not, but I was conscious that, there, that work was being done on these important issues. 
because it, it strikes me that there's a bit of a discordance between that evidence you've just given, Secretary, and some of the e other evidence you give in your statement, particularly at paragraph 48, with respect to the quite proactive measures you took um, in light of the COVID pandemic. So it would be fair to say in that context, you were integral to driving specific initiatives to address that known issue affecting members. Uh, yes, I mean, COVID was a unique challenge uh, across all organisations uh, in the Commonwealth, but the, I'd, I'd, I would characterise it that my work as secretary was focused on understanding and then, and then seeking reassurance about the frameworks that were in place uh, and then seeking information and assurance that the resourcing was being uh, appropriately directed. People uh, in the organisation alerted me to the nature or alerted me to this challenge and I sought from them, uh, are, these, are these challenges being treated through particular responses, either in Joint Health Command or in, or in People Group? And are we, are we looking at updating uh, and improving our policies to respond to them? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept any suggestion that it was a passive um, uh, response. I think my job as, as the Secretary of the Department is to be curious about whether the initiatives that are being pursued are, meet, are, are meeting the need or heading towards that need. And then I can, through my own accountabilities and, and authorities, provide resources. And that concept of curiosity you've just spoken really reflects the evidence you give in the context of COVID that you were focused on ensuring the workforce was supported and you were regularly discussing what further supports were required for our defence people and families. That, that on the face of your evidence, is, is an example of you really leaning into and being curious about that particular issue. Uh that's correct, but I would also say in relation to um, mental health and well-being and the, um, the, the state of the workforce, prior to COVID, I had a particular focus on the Australian Public Service uh, cohort in the department, which I, I, I feel very strongly my stewardship responsibilities there. So I'm very actively involved in, in seeking information on the, the particular cultures or subcultures across the groups that have predominantly public service uh, members um, and taking action to uh, address particular concerns or issues that there might be in, in work units in the groups that directly responsible to me. I, I was aware of the work that was being done by the CDF and other senior ADF members in relation to the ADF workforce. I did not uh, take the view that that was not uh, work that they were heavily committed to. So in terms of my overall responsibilities, I saw those as supporting the CDF and the senior ADF leadership in terms of tackling these really complex issues of suicide and suicidality. So can, can I just unpick a, unpack a bit of what you've just said then? A, a couple of times when I've asked you about this concept of initiatives to do with mental health and wellbeing, your response has been particularly about culture initiatives. Um, would it be fair to say that insofar as it concerns the issue of suicide and suicidality, you've really more leaned into culture than initiatives that are specifically in the mental health and wellbeing space? Uh, I, I, I would accept that I do have a particular interest uh, and commitment to the, the broad issue of defence culture. I, I do uh, accept 
expert ADF advice about the unique aspects of military service, the training environments, the, the unique uh, aspects around military discipline. Uh, and I am very conscious that the CDF, the other service chiefs, are, are looking at those issues in terms of suicide and suicidality. Um, and I believe that the, my enterprise responsibilities for putting in place the right cultural frameworks and then the right mental health and well-being frameworks that obviously focus on suicide and suicidality, I believe that that's, that's where my appropriate responsibilities lie. Well, uh, I mean, you, you gave evidence at the outset and the transcript will reflect what you said, but correct me if I'm wrong about this, you accepted that you have enterprise-wide responsibilities with respect to mental health and wellbeing, that's, that's correct? correct? And so that doesn't stop at the mental health and wellbeing of the APS workforce, it includes the ADF workforce. You'd accept that? I, I have particular responsibilities for the APS workforce, but I, I am a... I, I, have a, I share responsibilities with the CDF for the entire defence organisation. And you have particular levers that the CDF doesn't have in that space, including with respect to resourcing, that would be fair to say? That is correct. So, but, but am I right to understand that, you know, as at 2017, um, you weren't leaning in to those, that particular issue of mental health and wellbeing for the ADF? Workforce, you are more leaving that to defence to manage in and of itself. Uh, no, I wouldn't accept that characterisation, Council. I'd say I was when in in the early part of my tenure, I was seeking information about the work that was being done across the organisation in relation to suicide and suicidality. I wanted to be reassured that uh, that work was being done across all of the groups and services. I was aware that the former CDF was uh, putting attention onto this issue. I was aware that a lot of work was going on in relation to Afghanistan and I sought advice on what additional things I could or should be doing and what resources might be needed to improve our performance. Now, in terms of that understanding you were seeking to gain, Secretary, you were asked to identify the for the Commission the steps you have taken or caused to be taken to monitor and understand suicide and suicidality amongst ADF members. Um, and you state in response that you have not taken any steps to conduct or commission qualitative data analysis with respect to that matter. Why not? Uh, because, uh, Council, the, the others uh, who have those responsibilities, I, I'm aware, have been doing uh, work, including um, surveys and, and research. So I, I, I didn't believe that I had any particular expertise to bring to this issue, and I'm aware that other work was being done. And so as at 2017, what was that specific work that was being done that comprises qualitative analysis with respect to the issue of suicide and suicidality? Uh, council, at, at that stage, most of the work was being done within Joint Health Command. But can you give me some examples of the nature of that work that was being done? No, Council, nor, nor I, I, at my level, I would expect to be informed that there was work being done or there was not. But the, the as, as an enterprise leader, I would seek to see are there, are there, are there, identifiable gaps and are the relevant experts telling me that work is is not being done because they do not have the resources or they don't have enough people or um, that the the organization has too many other competing priorities and then I can work with the CDF to reduce uh, work pressures but perhaps to allow that work to be to be done, but I certainly don't believe, as the secretary, uh, I should be uh, commissioning work in relation to suicide and suicidality when those particular responsibilities exist at subordinate levels. 
but, but in terms of your responsibilities to be curious, to lean in, you would accept um, that it is incumbent on you to satisfy yourself that there is qualitative data analysis being done with respect to suicide and suicidality? I would, I would expect that there is uh, work being done ac across a whole range of issues to do with defence people, uh, including their health and, and mental wellbeing. My question is quite a specific one about suicide and suicidality, and it's whether or not you consider it incumbent upon yourself as a senior leader, noting that you've said this issue is a priority, to lean in, be curious, and ensure that there is that qualitative data analysis taking place. You'd agree that's one of your responsibilities? I would agree that one of my responsibilities is to make sure that, or to, um, uh, insist that the relevant areas of the department at the, at the subordinate levels are tackling this issue, including, as necessary, conducting research or commissioning research. And, and as at 2017, when you assumed the role of secretary, did you do that? And can you outline the specific actions that you took? Uh, I, I, I had broad conversations with the associate secretary the CDF, uh, the uh, Deputy Secretary People Group about the work that they were doing in relation to these issues. And I encouraged them to continue to put uh, a, a real focus on these issues. And I asked them to come to me if they needed any additional resources to, to pursue this work. Now, so, so that's where things were sitting as at 2017. I wanna jump forward to 2021. Yep. Uh, that's a couple of years into your tenure, um, that's correct? Yep. Um, and at that time, Dr Boss delivered her preliminary interim report with respect to defence veteran suicide prevention. And I think you've mentioned that report in your evidence. Um, and in fact, in a response you provided to the Commission, you identify that as being one of the relevant briefings you received with respect to the issue of suicide, suicidality and self-harm. That's correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, now, as you'll aware, as you'll be aware, Dr. Boss made a number of recommendations directed to reducing suicide amongst veterans and members. You recall that? I do. Um, now, that report was delivered after this Royal Commission was announced, but in it, Dr. Boss exhorted the Australian government not to wait until the Royal Commission handed down its final report, emphasising that action can't wait. Do you recall that statement? Uh, I, the, uh, or words to that effect. I, I remember that sentiment certainly being part of Dr Boss's report. Uh, and the effect of that view really is that there hadn't been sufficient action taken by defence between, at least in your tenure, 2017 and 2021 to really grapple with that issue. You'd accept that? I'd accept that that was how she, that, that the words that she used were uh, reflective of her view. Do you accept that's a fair comment about the actions defence had taken before that point in time? Uh, I, Council, I've, I've already I've, I've mentioned already this morning some of the things that defence has done. Dr Boss may have had a view about the adequacy or otherwise of those uh, initiatives, but I don't think it's fair to ca say that defence uh, had not taken action in response to these issues. Now, um, <laughs> We've asked Defence and they've told us um, the actions that were taken in response to this particular report. Um, specifically, I can put them to you if it, if it needs be, I can take you to the document. Yeah. But we've been told that Defence has considered Dr Boss's recommendations and agrees with their overall intent. That's consistent with your view? Um, I, I, I believe that yeah. to be so. Uh, that it's continuing work to reduce suicide risk and is keenly aware of the need to act on further opportunities to prevent suicide. That's consistent with your understanding? Yes. Uh, now, in terms of specific initiatives that are mentioned in that response, the Joint Transition Authority is one that's mentioned um, and a feasibility analysis with respect to a mandatory pre-discharge transition course for all ADF members. Putting those to one side, 
can you give the commissioners an overview of the specific steps that Defence took in response to the recommendations arising out of Dr Boss's report? Uh, Council, I'd like to see them, like in terms of, uh, if you're asking me to respond to ones that we haven't pursued, uh, I'd like to see all the recommendations. You'd like to see all the recommendations of... Yeah, what, what I mean, if, if you're asking me to say, apart from the Joint Transition Authority, which is a really important oh, initiative... Oh, I'm not quibbling with and, that. And the additional other work that we're doing, but are, are you asking me to say where either the department or the government did not accept? No, no, I'm asking consistent with the idea that's in this defence response that defence is continuing to reduce suicide risk. Yeah. I'm asking you to tell the commissioners the specific initiatives that defence introduced having regard to Dr Boss's report. Well, I think I think the, the, the government did produce a a response to Dr Boss's... Uh, I'm not talking about responses. I'm, I'm talking about, you You know, as you've identified, you've got responsibility for reform and to ensure the defence is properly supporting ADF members. Uh, I, I'm asking what you did in your role as Secretary of the Department of Defence um, to introduce any additional initiatives or steps to address the issue of suicide and suicidality once Dr Boss's report was handed down. Uh, council, I would have uh, responded to implement the recommendations from Dr Boss's report that the government accepted. Okay. So, and, and I might just show you the response that we've been given, just to get you to comment upon whether or not this is a fair statement of what was done in response to the report. Um, operator, please display um, DEF.9.0135.0050 <coughs> and turn to Please turn operator to dot zero five two zero of that document. Uh, I might ask if they could please expand paragraphs one to five so the secretary can read it. I've read that, Council. And Secretary, would you agree that's a fair statement of um, what has been done by Defence in response to Dr Boss's report? No, I object to that. That's clearly an introductory set of paragraphs. It's then followed by something that refers to a series of other documents um, and there are further material within the same document that deals with Defence's response. That I'm content to take the secretary to each of those pages if it would assist. No, I'd like the question withdrawn first. I'll put a pause on the question until I take the secretary to the other pages. Sure, that seems appropriate to me. Sorry, Commissioner, I just didn't quite hear what you said. Sorry, I said sure, that seems appropriate to me. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, operator, can you please turn to the next page? Do you need that expanded? Uh, could you please expand, operator, the, um, yes.
Council, did you have a specific question? I, I'm giving you an opportunity to review um, okay. what, yes, if you could move down then please to the balance of the page. So you'll see there, and I'll just ask you to take a mental note of it, please, Secretary. Um, the two initiatives that are referred to there is a ombudsman inquiry into the effectiveness of defence policies and a stop sexual harassment directions um, process that was implemented. I'd ask the operator then turn to the next page, please. And if the operator could please then go down to the end of that page. Read that council. Uh, and if you could extend on to the next page and expand that. That counts. Can I suggest to you, Secretary, the key initiatives that are identified there is the ongoing public reporting of treatment of women, including through the context of the ADF Women in Defence 10-year report and also um, collaboration with Five Eyes Nations. That's a fair assessment of those initiatives? Oh, those are very important initiatives. I, I'm, not, I'm not disputing the importance. Mm. I'm asking that's a fair assessment of the activities that was undertaken referred to there. 
Uh, yes, but Council, didn't you ask me whether I thought they were th those were the most important? No, no, no. My question is I'm taking you through each of the initiatives yep. in response to the BOSS report and to ask you to identify if there are any others you think that emerged out of it that are missing. Uh, I might in that respect take you to the last page then, um, .0524. There's a small problem with this line of questioning in that the questions asked in the notice don't actually ask for identification of what was done in response. Well, I'll come to that. This gives, I mean, we've gone down this path because my learned friend said it wasn't fair to not allow him to see everything that's in this document. At the end of it, I'm going to ask the Secretary if there are any other specific initiatives that emerged out of the BOSS report that he can tell the Commissioners about. I don't think that's in any way unfair. Well, perhaps Commissioner Douglas will be the judge of that, but the reality... It can be, but you've got to persuade me first that it is unfair, but and if it is putting a series of propositions, as Longbottom has to have the chance to put them. He does, but it's not fair in my respectful submission to put the question as it's put, because if you look at the notice, it doesn't actually ask what was or was not done. Well, but, but she can ask the witness that, surely. Ms Longbottom can ask that question, but not by reference to this document in this way. I, I, I don't agree that's a fair characterisation of what the document says. And can I draw your attention, please, Commissioner, to the statement um, under the answers to 2B1 to 2BC3, the steps taken or plan to be taken to implement the recommendation. It, it is a dissertation of steps taken in response to the report. Yeah. Now, if there's anything... I'll allow the questions. Thank you. Um, can you read then, please, Secretary, um, <coughs> this particular page? Commissioners, I'm cognizant that there are a number of recommendations and responses that are dealt with in this document. What might be more efficient is if I get the secretary, give the secretary an opportunity over an adjournment to read that, um, and then the purpose of it will be asking him at the end if there are any additional initiatives arising out of the doctor report, Dr. Boss report he'd like to tell commissioners about. Are you happy with that? Yes, Commissioner. Thank you. Yes, that'll be um, appropriate. Thank you, Ms Longbottom. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, now, Secretary, you've mentioned um, in your evidence that there have been some evolutions um, in your thinking about defence and veteran suicidality. I, I think you particularly mentioned um, your perspectives on the role that deployment may play with respect to that issue. Is that a fair characterisation of your evidence? Uh, yes, Council. I, and my initial thinking was that this, the, the, the issues of suicide and su suicidality may be more linked to operational deployments. I've, as, as I've been along this journey and, and listened to uh, witnesses coming before this Royal Commission and other um, material given to me. I've I've become much more aware of the complexities around injury during early military career as 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 sometimes a very significant uh, factor um, impacting on mental health and well-being. The the um, negative uh, impact of on on some individuals of those really local workplace 
cultures where, the, where there is inappropriate behaviour or bullying and harassment. So again, uh, I've, I've thought much more broadly and widely about the range of factors that are in play here, whereas I think I had a very um, simplistic and narrow view about the, the factors that, that may have flown from operational deployments. And so my, my understanding has broadened very considerably over, over the years. And can I ask you to explain to commissioners how that understanding informs the discharge of your joint responsibilities with the CDF? So let's take, for example, injuries during early training. Yep. Um, what have you done with that information in terms of discharging your responsibilities for the mental health and wellbeing of members? Yep. So there, um, the, I think, um, I know the CDF is very alert to the workplace health and safety aspects of, of training and I also am very conscious of, of at the enterprise level of our need to provide a, a healthy and safe working and training environment. So making, making sure that our workplace health and safety action plans are quality documents and that we have improved our uh, reporting mechanisms and that we are engaging uh, appropriately with the uh, workplace, um, the uh, com care and other appropriate regulators. So I believe I have an enterprise level responsibility for that. In our, um, in our weekly round tables, um, Every month, the Deputy Secretary of Defence People, Justine Grigg, prevent, uh, presents to us a snapshot or a dashboard of uh, workplace health and safety, drawing on statistical analysis uh, and trend data. And I know both my C myself and the CDF use those presentations to direct questions to um, particular members of the organisation. We may ask for a follow-up for something to be done if, if we've noticed a particular incident or a series of incidents um, often a, at a, a, a training base or on a, on a training exercise or a deployment. The CDF will ask uh, a relevant commander, um, I'd like to know a little bit more about why that, is, that has happened. I'm not comfortable or I'm not satisfied with what's going on here. Um, I think when we're very conscious that many of our people work and train and operate in quite taxing environments uh, and therefore those, those, those dashboards, workplace health and safety dashboards uh, and the fact that they are dis discussed in front of the entire very senior leadership group every Monday morning and once a month uh, we get a, a, a focused discussion on workplace health and safety. So we sort of we started with the issue of injury, physical injury, early in ab initio training. Yeah, that's correct. Can you give commissioners just a specific example of a way in which you have used that information to inform organisational enterprise improvement? Yeah. So, uh, f for example, if there's a an incident on a on a firing range or a, a, a rifle range where there has been uh, an injury and and sometimes there have been tragic deaths in in training. I know the there is immediate work done to like investigate the nature of the accident, but then more broadly there is what what might we do to improve the safety of ranges, and there are a number of people there that are involved, including the heads of the training establishments, but the service chiefs. And then there's, were the right workplace health and safety procedures in place. So it, sometimes it is driven by an incident, but often uh, the CDF and the other relevant service chiefs will say, well, I think this, this should trigger a broader examination of range safety, or this is something we've not seen before. Um, let us let us do some more work to see what needs to be done to improve the quality of procedures 
or to make sure that our reporting mechanisms are, are improved. So we use those discussions to um, drive work and to in make those inquiries and then um, the relevant officers go away and, and often they'll come back either, either to those round tables or, or up through other channels and say, look, we've, we've had a look and yes, there does need to be some changes to, for example, range procedures or no, these were particularly unique circumstances and we have looked at it and we have validated that the procedure that we have remains appropriate. But there is often in relation to those accident reports or workplace health and safety um, incidents being elevated to that most senior level, um, there is work directed and investigations are conducted. So you're talking there about particular WHS incidents that come to your attention through the committee system and other reports. Well, through through Deputy Secretary, pre people presenting um, to our senior leadership uh, weekly weekly roundtable, where once a month we ask her and uh, um, to uh, provide us with a dashboard and then to speak to that and all the service chiefs. Uh, are there, the, jo the Chief of Joint Operations and the Chief of Joint Capabilities are there and they can speak to um, the particulars um, that fall more particularly within their areas of responsibility. Now that might be an apt point, uh, Secretary, to explore in a little more detail your specific accountabilities within Defence. Um, the Chief of Defence Force appeared before this commission in 2022 and he gave evidence that you have both a lead in policy development and advice to government and in financial and budget, budget management of the enterprise. Is that a fair assessment of your accountabilities? Uh, that is, but you, you uh, council would be aware much more specifically of my particular responsibilities under my ministerial director. And that's an apt description of those responsibilities. And I think you give some description in your statement of what emerges out of that. And, and I just want to suggest three to you um, that are material to the issues with which this Royal Commission is concerned. Um, you have specific accountabilities with respect to strategy. Is that a fair assessment? Correct. Uh, capability development. That's a fair assessment? Yes. And reform. You'd agree with that? Yes, and uh, I would add intelligence. Now, I just want to unpack each of those accountabilities in a bit more detail. Um, firstly, insofar as it concerns policy development, um, would it be fair to say that there is an intersection between your accountabilities for policy development and reform? I can give you a particular example. So, for example, um, your lead role with respect to policy includes policy that drives cultural reform. Uh, enter enterprise governance policy, um, but again, I would I would see that as a a shared responsibility. In 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 the the narrower sense. Um, uh, and and I, I don't uh, dispute I have uh, that policy um, remit, but policy is often in relation to strategic policy, the, the way in which defence should generate capabilities and effects to contribute to the pursuit of Australian statecraft. Policy around the con conduct of military operations, policy around the procurement and development and bringing into service of defence capabilities and advice to government on how defence can best pursue the missions that it directs the organisation to do. So in terms of my policy work, there is a very substantial amount of effort devoted to those particular policy challenges and then uh, I do have those enterprise policy responsibilities in terms of effective governance, um, making sure that we have, uh, that our policies and procedures comply with the law and appropriate regulation. 
But more than compliance with the law, um, would you agree that your specific responsibilities extend to um, enterprise level policy that is directed to driving good culture, for example, within defence? Uh, I, I believe that yeah, but the CDF and I have... Uh, I'll come to the CDF in a, in sure. a couple of days. I, I'm specifically focusing upon your responsibilities with respect to culture. Um, do you agree that you have specific responsibilities with respect to the development and oversight of policy driving culture reform? Cultural I, have, reform? I, I believe I have a shared responsibility for the culture of the organisation. Okay. Um, and in terms of that responsibility you have, um, the accountable officer for that cultural reform piece is the Deputy Secretary of Defence People, is that correct? Uh, and, and the Associate Secretary as the Enterprise um, Integrator. So in terms of, um, again, I'll use the military parlance, chains of command. Yep. That work sits within your side of the diarchy. Is that a fair assessment in terms of policy development? Uh, obviously, the associate secretary is is a direct report to me, and so and, and the deputy secretary defence people. But in terms of the the CDF and the ADF leadership is very interested and engaged in the development of our cultural policies. That's not my question, Secretary. Yep. My question is not about direct reports. Yep. My question is, does the development and implementation of policy sit within your arm of the diarchy under Deputy Secretary um, Greg? Um, she is in my reporting chain. And so, yes, the work is led by her but our defence cultural blueprint is signed off jointly by the CDF and myself. That, that may be the case, but I'm talking about the development of it. It sits within the remit of your side of the di diarchy. It, it does, and it is heavily informed by ADF input. And, and that's why you say in your statement you've supported the Deputy Secretary Defence people in the development and resourcing for the implementation of the next cultural reform strategy, the Cultural Blueprint Program. That's yep. correct. Okay. Now, um, a second aspect of your responsibilities includes capability development. That's correct? Correct. Uh, and you've spoken a little bit um, uh, earlier about some of the um, systems or um, capital infrastructure elements of that. Um, but would it be fair to say that an aspect of your accountabilities in this sphere is managing strategic risks to develop to defence's ability to de deliver capability to the government? I do um, manage strategic risk in 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 terms of the planning for procurement and development of military capabilities, in particular uh, hardware and systems. But it's not confined to hardware and systems, is it? No, but if uh, my, my direct reports in this regard are the Deputy Secretary Capability Acquisition and Sustainment Group and the Deputy Secretary of Naval Shipbuilding and Sustainment Group. So that in terms of capabilities, Normally, when the government talks about defence capabilities, it's talking about the, capa the, 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 the people, systems and equipment that are used to generate military effects. And my question is really particularly focused on the people aspect of that capability. Um, and so one specific example you give in your statement is managing strategic risks to mental health and wellbeing outcomes of ADF members. So that is an aspect of your capability responsibilities. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, yes, because that, that, that contributes very significantly to the people aspect of the development of a capability. So you need to manage strategic risks that inform um, or that affect defence's most important asset, its people. That's, yeah. that's correct. And the, uh, and the ADF g must uh, generate uh, capable, well-trained, motivated people with the right skills and the right 
health and morale to be able to effectively employ those capabilities. And you are integral in his capacity to do that, that'd be fair to say? That's, that. I believe that my contribution as secretary to the development of our people system is an integral part of the overall development of military capability. But say, say we take, for example, matters that pertain to the mental health and wellbeing of members of the ADF, um, the CDF couldn't do what he needs to do in that space without you. <laughs> no, no, we, 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 we would not be able to achieve our mutual objectives without close collaboration. So you have clear responsibilities in that space. Uh, council, I, 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 again, I would go back to that, uh, take it up to that level where I have a responsibility for um, people policy in terms of workforce strategy, mental health and wellbeing is an Im a very important subset of that and in terms of overall workforce strategy, that is obviously informed by culture, mental health, other aspects of health, the, but the, the raise, train and sustain aspect of that is also very vital. So it is, uh, yes, I have, I have some particular responsibilities as a subset of a people system. And in terms of those broader enterprise level strategic responsibilities, um, one initiative that's emerged out of that is the mental health and wellbeing branch, which sits within your part of the diarchy. Uh, it does, but I can assure you the CDF is vitally interested in its work. And that's not my no, no, question. No, I'm, yeah, I'm, no, I'm, I'm really I'm, focusing on yeah. your aspect of responsibility yeah. um, with respect to that. And that's again why, um, correct me if I'm wrong about that, this, the Deputy Secretary of Defence People is the senior responsible officer for that branch. That reflects that responsibility. Yes, <laughs> Council, and, and I think it was because we wanted to make sure that there was a, a separation between what Joint Health Command was going to focus on and then the mental health and wellbeing, which I hoped, I, I genuinely am optimistic that it can take a more holistic and upstream approach to some of these issues. So it's not just about how do you deal with a particular uh, incident or an injury, but it's how, how do we generate the right environment and the right culture that allows for, for a proper well-being approach to somebody's service or career in the defence organisation. And that's really what I wanted to explore with you because in your statement you, you draw a distinction between the work of the mental health and wellbeing branch on the one hand and on the other hand the work for which the Chief of the Defence Force continues to have specific responsibility and that's the delivery of primary health care and the role of the Surgeon General as a technical mm. authority. Um, uh, but in terms of that issue of uh, suicide prevention can you explain to commissioners what you see your respective spheres of responsibility as being in that space? Yeah. Well, I, I think that suicide prevention is an, ab the, the most important priority of the mental health and wellbeing branch and that they will, it's, it's really important to me, I think, that they have the capacity and the expertise and the heft to be able to provide expert input across the organisation to help the groups and services and subordinate uh, parts of the organisation produce their own policies, action plans, their own training that is informed by uh, a well-being approach and the avoidance of suicide. Uh, and Again, I think I'm open over time to where it best sits, but I just think for the moment at least, I want to uh, I want to see how it goes within being seen as part of people strategy and with that well-being focus so that we can have it provide positive impact, positive inputs across the organisation in terms of encouraging a wellness strategy in work units that is focused on avoiding suicide. 
Now, um, I, I'll come back to you in a, in a little bit of time, some of the specific work you've done in that space, but I just want to keep on your accountabilities. Um, the third is financial and budget management, that's correct? That's correct. And yeah. that's something that is solely your responsibility, that's correct? Oh, yes. Um, so you have sole responsibility with respect to budget and resource allocation across the defence enterprise? Uh, the sole legal responsibility and in terms of my obligations under the PGPA uh, uh, legislation, those, those are single accountabilities. But of course, the discussion about the allocation of resources goes on with the CDF on, on an almost daily basis. Accepting that to be the case, is it fair to say that an aspect of those, of your responsibilities, include ensuring sound financial and resource um, management? Uh, th that is correct. And it is, um, again, I work very closely with the CDF, uh, but also the Vice Chief and the Associate Secretary on this. When, when we have to ha take hard decisions, about resource reprioritisation. So like if something, if the government gives us a, a priority, it says it wants us to put more emphasis on something and we need to reprioritise or redirect resources away from um, work streams or activities. I will of course engage with other senior leaders, but at the end of the day, the movement of those financial resources and the, um, attributing or accounting to the parliament and the ministers for them, that is my responsibility. And we're talking here obviously about taxpayers' money. And Very so substantial sums. And so would it be fair to say that it's part of your responsibility to ensure that um, that money has been spent wisely? And uh, efficiently and effectively and in compliance with law. Precisely. Um, and you've touched on a little bit about government's priorities. A am I right to say that the prioritisation of the allocation of the defence budget and resources is at least in part determined by the portfolio budget outcomes? Uh, yes, that is, that is, that is correct. And, and, and obviously when um, a department's budget is, is, of course, the government's budget but once it is, has been once the the funds have been appropriated by the by the parliament uh, it's up to the department to ensure that the the money is spent according to the purposes for which it was appropriated uh, and that it uh, was spent uh, efficiently and effectively and in in terms of the procurement of services that they were done on a value for money uh, basis it, and if I could, in terms of how we allocate the money, um, so the growth in the in the defence budget relating to people, it will be, I think, in the financial year just finished, it will be around twelve point eight billion dollars, and that that needs to comply with government direction. But then we need to ensure that uh, the way that it is spent is is efficient and effective. And I want to unpack that with you in the particular context of mental health and wellbeing supports for personnel. Yep. Now, um, you say in your statement that in exercise of your powers of budget allocation, you have directed monies towards that issue. That's correct? That is correct. Um, just focusing, say, particularly on um, the last two years, can you give commissioners an idea of... Um, this extent of the resources that you have directed to that particular issue? Yeah. Um, so <coughs> I've uh, approved an increase in the overall staffing establishment in people group by 170 uh, positions. And as I think uh, Associate Secretary Annapolis explained yesterday, when you allocate a position, it comes with uh, money, but I've the 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 people group budget for the previous financial year was increased to one point nine billion dollars, and particular billion. billion, and then um, within a total workforce spend of of twelve point eight, and then particularly I've approved 
a budget for the mental health and wellbeing branch of just, I think it's about 7.2 million for that uh, financial year. And what I've said to uh, Deputy Secretary People is that I want to see how that um, see how that branch grows, what what research it might need to do, what validation work it might need to do. And I've spoken to the CDF and um, I, and I know the CDF are also very open to increased resources for mental health and wellbeing branch as it as it develops and I'm I'm very as I said I'm optimistic that it will grow and take on more responsibilities but we also provide through um, I, I provide the total funds to the joint capabilities group um, that will allow for the full funding funding of the um, joint health uh, command including the on base health facilities uh, and again there that is a high priority for for the organization and any other initiatives that that need to be funded that go to mental health and well-being or um, avoidance of suicide and, and um, uh, uh, informed approaches to suicidality they are high priorities for for resourcing in terms of that issue of on base health resources, we heard evidence from the Chief of Army last week that access to good healthcare is a particular challenge in that space. Um, can you give the commissioners an overview of, say, in the last two years, um, the resources you've directed to that particular issue? Uh, I can say, uh, Council, I think commissioners will under This is a challenge across our community. We do not have enough mental health professionals for the the Australian community more broadly. Uh, certainly within uh, the defence uh, organisation, they are they are hard to um, recruit and 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 acquire. Uh, and Joint Health Command, um, uh, I think, makes makes real effort, genuine effort, to sort of make sure that ADF members are supported and where they can't be supported by in-house ADF uh, resources that um, uh, members of the ADF have and their families uh, have access to good quality uh, medical professionals from within the community. So I know that the head of Joint Health Command uh, sees this as a very important part of their work and should they require addition. I've, I've not been asked for or alerted to particular resource deficiencies, but if I were to be, this would be a very high priority to provide additional resources towards. Uh, can I come back then to the mental health and wellbeing branch? I think you've said in the last financial year, $7.2 million around about, that. About that. Um, you spoke about your responsibilities to ensure efficient and effective allocation of money. Um, how do you ensure that you're getting return on your investment? What are the specific steps you take? Yeah. So there would be um, the branch will need to report through uh, Deputy Secretary people to the Associate Secretary and, and myself. We'll, we'll do that through... Um, I, I, spoke, I speak to Deputy Secretary uh, Justine Gregg almost every day of the year. Um, I speak to the Associate Secretary again almost every day of the year. These issues will come up in, in conversation where I will, I will say, how is, that, uh, how is that recruitment effort going or how, how have they stood up? How many action plans have they been able to assist with? So that, that, that sort of way in which I seek to reassure myself that the branch is doing the work that we've uh, tasked it to do. And then there will, it will also uh, have an action plan that will, will go um, I think to the people committee a couple of times a year and that they that will provide uh, oversight and direction and then um, the people committee as, as you're aware from the the work that the, the commission has done a lot on our structures and committees that these issues are escalated and particularly where there is an issue 
that needs further resourcing or it needs resolution at a more senior level. So I would be, if, if, if the mental health and wellbeing branch was running into some challenges or didn't have the resources it needed, I would expect to be alerted to that quite quickly to enable me to take remedial action. And th that idea of things bubbling up to you, um, to sort of veer slightly to the right, um, that resonates with statements you make in your um, in the material you've put before the commission that you've always supported and never refused a request from a senior officer for resources for mental health and wellbeing support. Um, but can I examine this just in the context of the ADF healthcare? Um, example you were talking about earlier. I think you said um, you haven't had a request made of you for additional resources in that space. Um, are you proactive at all in terms of leaning in to the mental health and wellbeing or healthcare space more broadly to ensure that they've got the resources that they need? Uh, yes, Council. I have had a number of conversations with the CDF but also Deputy Secretary People, but also now uh, uh, General Fox, um, former heads of Joint Health Command, about what it, what it is that they um, uh, seek to, seeking to achieve with their um, uh, health strategies, where where the system is under pressure in terms of the number of of qualified professionals that it can recruit and retain to do this work and how we can improve our ability to access, ex, ex, uh, access the civilian professional support networks that exist to make sure that our members um, have access to a, a qualified um, medical professional so that the, they, they don't need to wait for long periods of time to access services uh, on, on base. I know that there are some of these challenges cannot be addressed through simply ad injecting additional money because the people just do not exist to be able to, to do that and I think that's a nationwide challenge. Uh, an another sort of vehicle through which I want to explore that issue <laughs> with you is um, Defence Council services. So we've heard evidence that there has been a growth in the demand for Defence Council services, particularly over the last couple of years. Um, how do you work to ensure that growth in demand is addressed by giving Defence Council services adequate resources? Uh, again, that I would uh, expect Defence Council services to be very forward leaning in terms of alerting. Um, uh, their, you know, superiors in, in inside people group, but also their um, the, across the broader organisation to the challenges that they were facing, and I would um, I would expect. I mean, the access to counselling services is is one that I think we are very conscious of across the organisation. But if a particular work unit, defence council services, said we need more in-house support or I need a better way of um, getting contracted support, I think that that would, that would be escalated. Um, addition, if it was within the remit of the Defence People Committee or, or the Associate Secretary to provide those additional resources, my expectation is that that would just be done. If it, if it was of such consequence or of scale that it that it was within my accountabilities or authorities, I would expect to be alerted quite quickly and I would provide the additional resource. Can I come back to the mental health and wellbeing branch? Um, yep. You've spoken about the sort of reporting mechanism by which you look to see the work that's been done in that space and that there's been an efficient and effective um, allocation of resources. Um, what is the metric by which you measure the effectiveness of that initiative? I'm very glad you asked that. Um, the, so I'm, I'm, uh, I am, as I said, I'm very 
uh, optimistic about the, um, the 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 initiative and what it can be can can do. I believe that it it will have, uh, and it's it's on a growth path. It it's it's taken longer than I would have liked to recruit the number of experts to the branch that we we wanted to, but I don't want to just recruit people to the branch to meet uh, a, a, um, uh, a sort of an arbitrary um, branching branch strength. I want the genuine expertise and so I've asked uh, Deputy Secretary of Defence people to make sure that it is properly staffed with the right experts, the right data analysts, the right uh, support it can do. Then I want them um, to be able to do the right, the baseline study. So they'll need resources to be able to conduct those studies. They'll need um, money for their communications outreach, which is vital if they are going to have the impact on the organisation that I, I and the CDF certainly help, hope that they will. Uh, we need them to have the travel budget that they need so that they can actually go out to units and locations and provide expert uh, input to commanders and formation uh, and other work leaders as they are developing their mental health and wellbeing strategies. So it will need to be a substantially resourced branch. And, and in terms of metrics, you've spoken there about a couple of activities, both in terms of people and projects, but is part of your metric results? Uh, they have to, and, and, and I'm confident that they are looking at what they, how they will measure their impact and more broadly how the organisation is going to improve its measurement in relation to suicide and suicidality, because I, I think this this royal commission has again been very presented with uh, uh, m many much evidence about the challenges we have around data, both the technical complexity of fusing data systems, but then what is the right way of measuring? So I'm hope I'm the mental health and wellbeing branch will have to do baseline analysis and then it will have to on an annual cycle do that sort of work to, to try and pick up trends to identify hot spots uh, and then to go back and revalidate is the training material we're providing working do and even if we've got great policies does it have traction at that working level because you'd accept then I take it that without those outcome based measures you, you can't truly know that money is being spent effectively I'd, I'd, I'd say you, we'll get a sense but without without quality data it's very it's very hard to sort of make those um, small adjustments which might just improve the quality of an intervention so I, I don't rely in, in my work, I don't rely, I, I rely heavily on the workplace health and safety dashboard. I rely on surveys, both internal to defence and then more broadly Australian public service uh, surveys. But I don't overly invest in either the quality of that data set or I don't make assumptions about who participated in or didn't. So I just use the data and the, and the surveys as a trigger for inquiry. And so I'm hoping that the mental health and wellbeing branch will have quality data, but that they will be not, not simply relying on the data that, that is collected, but all their other, their network of contacts, the, the senior non-commissioned officers that we have throughout our organisation, the, the, the people in the regions to provide input. It may not be scientific, but it should help them put their focus. It, it's certainly at my level in terms of managing groups. I, I use data simply as an initial like traffic light in indicator to, to allow for more focused additional work involving visits, conversations, 
360 appraisals, those things. So I think we need to get more and better data, but if we are only relying on those data sets, then we'll be missing a real important aspect of what has to be done here. Uh, now, Commissioners, I'm conscious of the time. I was about to move on a new, to a new topic, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to ask any questions if you wish to at this stage. Uh, we've literally got about five minutes. It might be best if we do that after lunch. Certainly, that's fine. Okay, so if that's the case, we'll adjourn for lunch. For, I think we've only got half an hour and then we'll return after that. About half past. So we'll adjourn. All rise. The Royal Commission will now adjourn for half an hour. Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Thank you, Ms Longbottom. Commissioner Cowdes, is this an opportune time for commissioners to ask some initial questions? Um, yeah, that'd be good. Thank you. Commissioner Brown. Uh, thank you very much, um, Secretary. I, just, I did have a couple of questions. Um, Council was asking you early on about the diarchy and how it works. Um, I just wondered what happens if you and the CDF disagree? Um, the, the, the group that has to be Emphasis on on one defence. You know, you familiar with um, the royal commission. The commissioners have, have heard about one defence. So we make real efforts. Uh, so the CDF and my offices are just several metres apart. We speak every day, uh, even when we're travelling around. And op 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 often it will be about uh, policy or operational issues, and I mean policy in the broader defence and strategic policy. But um, he and I have been, um, and I'm very grateful 
to him for the way in which he's approached this, but he and I have been able to arrive at a consensus position on on uh, virtually everything uh, during our, our respective terms. I do not seek, and I really do respect the chain of command. His, there is only one commander of the Australian Defence Force, and that is the CDF who has all the way constitutional authority through the government of the day, through the CDF, all the way to the, to the members of the ADF, and I do not seek to interfere in command prerogatives or in the way that the CDF commands the Defence Force. But there are so many areas there where there are, where it's, it's, it's grey of policy, whether we have shared accountabilities. I appreciate his advice on issues in my lanes and um, he always gives me the opportunity to comment on, on particularly on military matters um, where I feel that I'm qualified or have something useful to add, I do so, but I never seek to involve myself in the chain of command. I appreciate that. If I could take you to the specific um, responsibilities that you share around mental health, wellbeing, suicide prevention, some of it sits on your side of the house, some of it sits on his side of the house. So, for example, if you felt um, or you were advised that perhaps there wasn't sufficient occurring yep. through chain of command to actually address these issues. Um, how would you tackle that? Yeah, I, I, um, Commissioner, I would, um, and I think the CDF would be very open to this, but I, I would seek an opportunity to raise with him any issue that I had, if, like if it were related to the... Um, Joint Health Command or um, the Joint Transition Authority, um, other other aspects of uh, activity within uh, the services. I, I would seek him out and I would say, CDF, do you do you think that there might be a need for some more resources there, or are you are you comfortable with what you're seeing? And we have from time to time talked about things that we might um, bolster or accelerate and on my side of um, the house he's he's come to me and said look with our inter, um, ERP program can we look at bringing forward some of the case management issues that will help us get a better data set and I said absolutely let's let's see what we can do then I spoke to the associate secretary about how to to sort of bring forward some of that work I've asked I've asked him if he <coughs> felt that there were enough resources being put into the mental health uh, and, and welfare uh, branch. And we have um, really luckily had a very uh, professionally respectful and collegiate way of working together. Difficult and challenging issues are raised and they have been resolved, I think, to our mutual satisfaction. Um, you commenced in 2017 and you indicated to, in response to Council's question that you were briefed around the constant battle report. Can't quite recall about the National Mental Health Commission report. Um, it's a shame, it was a good report. Um, um, the um, Jesse Bird's death we heard this morning occurred um, in mid-2017, which was the year you commenced. I don't know if you were briefed in relation to any of the circumstances of, well, not the circumstances of his death, but around what followed in terms of the coronial inquiry. But then the, the Child Abuse Royal Commission brought down its final report just after you started, in December 2017. It had a section around Lewin yep. and what had occurred there. Uh, and then the DART report's um, final report was 2016. Now, I don't know if you were briefed about all those other reports. I'm, all, I'm, I'm aware of all of those other reports. And there had, of course, been another Senate report on, around mental health as opposed to suicides uh, in 2016. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, Secretary, when you came into the department, you had... had I mean, I'm, it's a very big and a very busy department. There's a lot of, I'm sure, a lot of reports, um, not just the ones that we're focusing on, but in terms of understanding that landscape and particularly, I guess, understanding what might be contributing to 
the need for all of these reports um, and the concern of the, the Senate, uh, et cetera. What, what did you make of that at that time? Yeah. Well, Commissioner, if I could expand on... I, I came in with a, an, an under-informed view that, that the very high pace of operational tempo over the preceding sort of 20 years and particularly in terms of our deployments to the Middle East may be a very significant factor here. So I must, I, I admit it's because I, I didn't have the basis of knowledge and, and the insights that I've acquired, but when I th was thinking about these issues, particularly in, my, in the early days, I was perhaps overly focused on operational service and how that might be contributing to, to suicide or suicide. I heard your explanation of that, but I guess I'm wondering why, because I don't think those reports um, necessarily had that focus um, about saying this is about deployments. Um, no, but, but no, Commissioner, and what I'm saying is that I came in with a particular mindset and it's over the over the course of my experience that those other pieces of work have led me to, to have a much more, you know, multifaceted sort of way of thinking about this. But when I, when I initially started in the job, uh, over the first, say, three or four months when I was getting initial briefings, I, I think now in, in retrospect that I did, I did approach them. Did do you think, and I, and I appreciate your, your candid response to that, do you think that your, you having had a background of having worked in defence, in and around defence for a long time, um, gave you that perhaps, if I could describe it as a slightly blinkered view? Um, I'm, I've had, over the course of my career, I've, d I've done a, a lot of work with people who've inv been involved in operational activities, not just in defence, but in, in, in foreign affairs and trade. I was responsible for a, a period of time with, with consular and crisis response. When I was the Commonwealth Counterterrorism Coordinator, I worked with all of the state and territory police forces, and that is where I, I first um, worked um, and had uh, had contact with Commissioner Calder. So I think I did I did have um, a history of engagement with operational activity and operational um, the, the impact of operations on people and and in terms of post traumatic s stress that flowed from operations. I was involved in peacekeeping operations in Bougainville, also heavily involved in supporting operations in Timor-Leste and the Solomons. So I think I did come come to the job with a, a particular a sphere mindset of or, or, or set of assumptions about what were the stresses on our workforce. And uh, again, Mr Fordham might object to this, but <laughs> I'll ask anyway. Uh, in your view, is it likely that others may have sh ha had experienced that same kind of narrowness of their perception because of just well narrowness of the of the understanding of suicide because of that perception or or kind of narrow focus? Uh, look, I'd, I'd have to I'd have to be open to that possibility. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll move on. Um, yeah. You said. You said you, when you came in, you didn't ask for any particular data um, analysis or research. Um, you looked across the, the organisation, what was happening. You had broad conversations. You encouraged people um, to attend to the issue. Um, but you also said subsequent to that that you used data as a trigger for inquiry. Um, so I appreciate you didn't specifically ask for any data analysis to be conducted, but were you presented with any data analysis around the issue of suicide? Because as I understand it, Defence didn't actually undertake an aggregate view of its suicide um, death data until the last couple of years. 
and I'm, I'm just wondered whether you were aware, whether you asked, whether any of that analysis had actually been done to inform the opinions that people were telling you they were doing enough. Commissioner, I, I was presented with, but as you, you, you very correctly say, we had uh, what I would describe as data sets that were not fused and, and many of them were manual. So I'd get, a, I'd get a, a, an insight from somebody bringing a particular piece of data or a small sample to our attention. That would often generate a, a conversation, but I, I certainly um, are of, um, am of the view that the department was not able to interpret data in a, holistically, in a holistic way um, and that reports were not uh, well, if they were put together, they were put together manually. But that, that's not the question I'm asking, though, um, Secretary. Is it, I'm really wanting to know, in the reports that were given to you to assure you that people were attending to this issue and doing everything they can, did they tell you they had analysed the data, the available data around suicide? If I could give one example, Commissioner, where, yes, that did occur, where a number of... Um, a number of people brought to my attention issues relating to suicide and suicidality in relation to younger people who had needed to leave the defence force for injury or health-related reasons. And, and, and that was one of the things that got me thinking earlier. So people within at the ADF and defence were conscious and brought to my attention that there was this particular challenging that experience mm -hmm. and that made me think okay w well this must be devastating for somebody who's thought about a career and then they are unable to pursue it how do we help them transition to a healthy productive life outside the ADF so I, I, I'm, I've, I've been thinking about joint the joint transition authority and transition informed by some of the uh, information that was given to me. Can I ask you, I mean, that just taking that example, young people, um, medical discharge, higher risk of suicide, that came from the AHW reports. What was their data analysis done within defence to identify you know, any, any other, well, to confirm that or to look at any other cohorts? Because I appreciate you said at your level you don't commission the reports, you rely on others um, who tell you they're doing everything they can. And my, my question, I guess, is were, were they doing everything they can? Were you sufficiently um, curious? Were you pushing the point hard enough to know that they were actually doing everything they can? Because I, I, I guess what we have heard at this commission, as I said to you before, is Defence actually hasn't until very recently, done much of that analysis. Commissioner, the issues were brought to my attention and with real intent. So the people who, who said, Secretary, you need to be aware that this issue of medical discharge is one that is very important and it is consequential. So I, didn't, I, I did not ask on what basis have you what, what research have you done but I certainly did accept the judgment that was given to me that this was a particularly important factor that was impacting on our people as well as the broader the broader population so the people who brought that issue to my attention certainly did so with with impact and one last question you said around the national, uh, around the mental health and wellbeing um, strategy, um, and around suicide prevention, um, the work of the mental health and wellbeing branch. You want it to be expert-driven and evidence-based. Um, and my question is, um, what? How do you see that occurring, and at what level? And what expert input are you getting? at your level to ensure you ensure that that's actually occurring at that level. Yep. So I have 
uh, discussed this with the Deputy Secretary, people, Justine Gregg, and I have said to her that it is my expectation, and I think the CDF's expectation as well, that that branch has genuine expertise. It is not... It is not... Uh, it, will, it will need, of course, military officers with general planning and, and management skills and public servants with general management and um, uh, administrative skills, but it has to have real capability in terms of data analytics, the medical judgments that can be made to inform good policy. And I've said to Justine, make sure that we recruit people with the right skills so that this branch can have a real impact. And occasionally when I've asked her, how are we going with this branch? It's really not accelerating at the pace that I would like. She said I've, that, that she and others have struggled to recruit people with the right skills. I accept that because I think nationwide we are struggling to find people with the right skills. But I, I do want that branch appropriately staffed by people with the right skills and expertise to be able to really make a significant difference to how we approach mental health and wellbeing and and, and the avoidance of suicide. Thank you. I'll leave my question. Thank you, Commissioner Douglas. I just have a couple of questions arising out of your mindset when you came in, when you spoke about operational tempo. Did you receive any reports about that as an introduction to the task? Uh, uh, Commissioner, I, I was certainly, we were we were still conducting operations at that stage, so uh, I, I was getting, I was participating in the operational briefings three times a week, sometimes more than when there was an uh, an incident. Um, what I was concerned about was, was there any examination on foot about the appropriateness of the high tempo operations? At, well, at, at that stage, uh, Justice Brereton was doing his work. Um, uh, important work through the IGADF, and we were we were discussing that there were issues there to do with uh, respite, operational tempo, people, you know, uh, communities, and the culture that develops or can develop when people are doing repeated high stress activity. So I was we were thinking and discussing those issues in particular in relation to the operations that we were involved in at the time, but also informed by our understanding that this really important work by Justice Brereton was also uh, going underway. Did any of the discussion um, trespass into the area of whether it was appropriate to use special forces over such a long period in roles that could be um, performed by say, a normal infantry battalion as a peacekeeping operation. Yeah, and, and Sorry, I object to that yeah. for security reasons. Well, I don't suppose you have an opponent, do you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, and I do apologise, and I might be being overly cautious, but... Um, there has been discussion generously, or generally about that issue. Um, yes, but this is now traversing into specific discussions that may um, go further than the general discussion you refer to. Do you have an apprehension it might go that far, Mr. Mr Secretary? Could you repeat the question, Commissioner? I was asking whether your briefings um, traversed the controversy I've heard of about whether special forces were... The appropriate ones to use in that context rather than, say, an infantry battalion as a peacekeeping force? Uh, Commissioner, I, I, I will be careful, but I say I, I was aware of a range of views, including well, well in the veterans. Careful, so I'll go on with my question. If I could just reassure you, Mr Fordland, we have discussed this a number of times yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, along the lines of the second iteration of the question from Commissioner Douglas. I, I have specifically not objected to that question and that response. Uh, Com Commissioner, I was aware of a range of views, including in the veterans community, about the issue of, you know, the 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 use of particular types of units, the skill sets that they have, uh, and and more 
more broadly issues of operational tempo uh, were ones that were being widely canvassed in the in the broader national security community and the veterans community. Thank you. I'll just raise one issue at this stage, um, Secretary. The approach of responding to recommendations as, as the department has to some of um, Dr. Boss's recommendations of neither accepted nor rejected. And sometimes it doesn't say anything else. It doesn't paint the picture of what's gonna happen next and where it's, where it just seems unsatisfactory really to just leave it hanging there. Did you have a view about that? And is that something we can expect as a response to our recommendations? Uh, Commissioner, if I could take that question in, in two parts. So like for, for, uh, for the department, the, 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 the highest responsibility of course is to implement uh, faithfully and fully recommendations that are agreed by government. That, 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 is, that, is, uh, that is most important. When we also look at recommendations, in some ways they might be in part or we are already in train in terms of addressing some or the spirit of some of the issues that are, that are dealt with in some of these uh, recommendations. There would be, of course, occasions when we think that is either does, does not need to be pursued in the way that the report set out or... Um, uh, there would be some recommendations in in a lot of reports where um, the department might have a view that that was that was not the best way to tackle the issue, or that we didn't think a, a particular recommendation was was feasible or achievable, or or within um, uh, the resource envelope that we thought the government was making available to us. So that's. That's my and in in terms of Dr. Boss's report, many important recommendations picked up, some others that were not pursued, um, and I'm sure you know you may, you may uh, wish to look at some of those further. And in the in the second part of the question about the Royal Commission's report, all I can assure you is that this is a very important. Uh, piece of work that the the commission the royal commission is a vital piece of work. We in defence are very much looking forward and anticipating the work that that will inform us becoming a better organisation. We will, and I'm I am certainly committed to implementing all of the recommendations that the government agrees to. Um, thank you for that, but I'm sure you can appreciate our concerns. We also felt that the boss report was quite significant and it received that response. That would, I guess we'll see how it goes. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cowardice. Um, Secretary, I, I want to take you to the issue surrounding Dr Boss's report. First of all, you gave evidence earlier today that I would have responded to implement the recommendations from Dr Boss's report that the government accepted. Are you aware that the government have not formally responded to those recommendations? Uh, Council, I am, I am aware that the government hasn't formally re responded, but I, I am also aware that the government directed us to pursue some initiatives that were included in Dr Boss's report and, that, and some of that work is, uh, has been done and some of it is ongoing. So why did you say I would have responded to implement the recommendation from Dr Boss's report that the government accepted if you knew the government hadn't responded? Well, because uh, uh, Council, I, I may have misheard your question. I, I thought you were asking me what, is, what has Defence done in relation to those uh, recommendations that the government had uh, told Defence that it should pursue. I'm not putting to you a question that I am asked. I'm putting to you your specific evidence. You said, I would have responded to implement the recommendation from Dr Boss's report that the government accepted. That was your evidence. Yep. So my question is, why did you give that evidence if you knew that the government had not formally responded to the report? Because the, go the government did give us guidance like so, for example, the, the further work that we've done in the Joint Transition Authority, uh, which 
I think was a really important recommendation from Dr. Boss, but the government also indicated to Defence that we should uh, continue to work on developing and, and making uh, more comprehensive the Joint Transition Authority. So, uh, so I, I, I think I did have some guidance from government on recommendations uh, to pursue and, and, and we have done some of that. I accept, yes, the government didn't formally uh, respond and, and, and some uh, it's neither accepted nor, nor rejected, but I think in terms of the, Dr. Boss's work was important for the department and some of the recommendations uh, have been taken forward. So, in terms of that guidance you received from government, is that documented? Uh, I would need to take that on, on if, notice if you and get could, back to you. And, and if it is documented, we'd ask that it be provided. Now, you've had an opportunity, I take it, to review um, that part of the response to NTG DEF 163 that pertains to Dr Boss's report. Yes. Um, are there any additional initiatives or steps that specifically arise from Dr Boss's report um, not mentioned in that response to which you want to draw commissioners' att attention? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Can I just yeah. clarify one issue? And that is that the notice dealt with 13 of 40 recommendations. So if the question's limited to the 13. The, Dr. The Secretary has given evidence that he was briefed with Dr. Boss's report. It is something that was specifically mentioned by him as being something that was brought to his attention. I, I presume he has detailed knowledge of its contents. My question is, is there something not mentioned in NTG DEF 163 that he wants to bring commissioners' attention to? <coughs> I, I, I fail to see why he can't answer that. My point is a fairly simple one. That NTG does not deal with the entirety of the BOSS report. So that if the question is limited to... If the question is going to be based on the NTG, then it has to be limited to well, the Well, the question NTG. actually says... Um is there something not mentioned in NTG DEF 163 that he wants to bring the Commission's attention to? And earlier, uh, Ms Longbottom said that specifically arise from Dr Boss's report, not mentioned in that response. Yeah, so I think the question is clear enough. Well, if I could just raise one issue on that. I'm not meaning to cavil, but I suppose I am. The, the issue is that if it's referenced to NTG that is in question and the question is based on that, that is not the entirety of the BOSS report nor its recommendations. I don't have a problem with being asked in the general yeah. or in the specific, but they can't be mixed. Well, I don't think it was mixed and I suspect that the Secretary has picked up by now that it's not mixed. And if you're clear on the question, uh, Mr Secretary, um, are you capable of answering it? Or do you want it repeated? No, I don't, I don't want it repeated, but I would appreciate if, if Council could like, draw my particular attention to and, and are there particular recommendations that you'd like me to talk to or, or just a, a general overview? What, what specific initiatives beyond those mentioned in NTG DEF 163 did Defence take in response to Dr Boss's report? So, Defence um, took this piece of work. There were uh, su suggestions that we needed to work cl more closely between Defence and, and DVA on mental health strategies. That, that has been done. So that, that there, is, there is now closer uh, work, closer alignment between Defence and DVA to produce a joint uh, mental health uh, stra strategy. Um, Dr. Boss had um, uh, in insights and views on the Joint Transition Authority, and I think that we have, in terms of developing the Joint Transition Authority, we have drawn on the Boss report. Um, the the issue of of training that Dr. Boss drew attention to has been responded to in terms of 
uh, Defence's approach to mandatory uh, training was informed by the BOSS report and work has been done uh, in relation to that to, to, make that, uh, to make that training higher quality, more comprehensive and mandatory. Um, there, there are other issues to do with uh, defence culture, which we've picked up in terms of our defence cultural blueprint work and the, the way in which that, that, has, uh, that has been informed. So I think the, the, uh, the BOSS report is an important piece of work and defence uh, is taking forward and, uh, the intent of, of quite a, a few of the recommendations. And are there any other specific initiatives or steps to which you want to draw commissioners' attention? Uh, I, I do want to uh, mention because it, it was also covered in the Ombudsman's report and I've had a conversation with the, uh, the Ombudsman uh, about this, but about uh, uh, around the challenges of independent complaints mechanisms. Sorry, is that something that specifically comes out of Dr Boss's report? Boss, D Dr Boss mentioned it. The Ombudsman has subsequently also uh, um, in, in, in his work identified it as an important issue and I do want to bring to Commissioner's attention that this, this suggestion is coming forward to our Enterprise Business uh, Committee. Uh, Mr Yiannopoulos has the lead on that. That will be coming to the EBC I, in May. Can I just stop you there, though, yep. Secretary? Uh, th that's something that's particularly mentioned in NTG DF163, is it not? Oh. It says there, in March 2023, the Ombudsman commenced an inquiry into the effectiveness of defence policies and procedures for managing complaints of contemporary abuse. Is that particular work you're talking about there? Or is it something different? No, no, no I, th I, th I think it is, it is that work and I've, I'm, I meet with the Ombudsman uh, at least once, once a year and I'm aware that um, the Ombudsman has um, drawn our attention to the importance in, in his view of, of, of ind independent um, uh, of a, a, a complaints mechanism outside the chain of command. I think that that uh, is very much... Uh, shared within the organisation and just how we take that forward is coming forward. I, I might move on then, if sure. I can, Secretary, um, to explore with you the issue of accountability within the diarchy construct. Um, now, Secretary, you would agree that good senior leadership is critical for defence to deliver on its strategic imperatives? Uh, yes, Councillor. And that good senior leadership includes having effective measures in place for assessing performance? Uh, Council, I, I would agree we should have effective measures and the measures um, should be as good as we can get them. Um, and that extends to both the senior leaders' performance as well as the people for whom they're responsible? Uh, that's correct. Uh, and would you agree, Secretary, that having documented accountabilities is essential to meaningfully assessing leadership performance? Uh, Council, I'd agree that documented accountabilities are important, but they, particularly at the most senior levels of an organisation, they are only one part of coming to a view about the effectiveness of the performance of a very senior officer. So measurable accountabilities is, is one thing, but feedback from ministers, other peers, subordinates, they are all, I think, really important inputs into coming to a view about the effectiveness of an officer. So we've heard the concept of 360 degree reporting. Is that what you're talking about then? Uh, among other things. So, uh, Council, when I'm doing, um, I have a, a um, there's an accountabilities table that sets out the accountabilities of officers who work for me. And I'll come to that in a moment. In addition to that, I use my performance agreements with those officers also as a way of uh, holding them to account of probing, of, of testing how they're going, what additional support they might need. In addition to that, I seek views on how groups are performing by speaking to other group heads and service chiefs. And I use that input 
again, to inform my view about the performance of a group head or a, a, a work unit. I also use um, workplace engagements with m much more junior workers to get a sense of are they being clearly communicated with? What is their view about the effectiveness of the leadership? What challenges they have? I speak to the senior leadership group every, every fortnight when I can about what is going on in their, in their groups. All of these things are really important to me in coming to a view about the performance of a group head or a, a group. Uh, and I want to focus particularly on that concept of accountability mechanisms in the context of the first principle review. Would you agree that one of the challenges that has been identified in relation to defence is a lack of clear accountability mechanisms? I, th I uh, Council, I certainly accept that there are... Um, and I, 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 I would like to have more measurable data, but I, that does not, I believe, uh, impede me from coming to a view about whether people are meeting their accountabilities and responsibilities. And I use all of those other mechanisms to help inform me uh, about that, in particular, the... the, the internal defence surveys, public service wide surveys, the views and input of other group heads and sub subordinates, and I seek input from ministers. Uh, and, and look, I, I want to put to one side for a moment sort of the specific steps you take to yep. overcome those challenges. I, I'm really focusing on the diarchy structure yep. um, and the embedded accountabilities within it. Um, one of the observations that was made in the first principles review with respect to the diarchy is that, I'll just read out the quote to you, it is an unusual, unusual leadership construct that does not necessarily align with first principles of clear authorities, accountability and simplicity. Focusing particularly on the structure, do you agree with that observation? Uh I, uh, no, I, I believe that the, I am very clear on the, min, on the government's expectations of me and what I need to do to help the organisation perform in a way which meets the government ex, uh, expectations. I am very clear that the government has, an, has a very strong sense of what it requires from the CDF and I jointly. What uh, the Secretary, you're being asked to address whether it's an unusual leadership construct, if you remember the quotation that... Yeah. It is, Council, it is an unusual leadership construct. I think it's unique in the world. Certainly when I talk to my other uh, defence secretaries or the heads of those departments, they, d they do not have a model that is uh, exactly the same anywhere. And, and the so balance of the question was that it does not necessarily align with first principles of clear authorities, accountability and simplicity. Can you address that issue of whether it complies with first principles? Uh, I believe that in terms of our government has very, uh, very clear ideas about the principles of accountability that apply to the diarchy. But I think consistent with the observations Commissioner Douglas has just made, yep. th that, that's not the question that I'm yep. asking. Uh, the question I'm asking is about the diarchy as a structure. Yep. Um, does it align, does, it does not necessarily align with the first principles of clear authorities, accountabilities and simpl simplicity. Could you please respond to that proposition? I can imagine that it, for management theorists, it would be a very challenging proposition. Now, Secretary, um, uh, the CDF was taken to that passage from the First Principles Review to which I've just taken you um, when he previously gave evidence before the Royal Commission. He said, and I quote, an effective diarchy requires high level of communication in the diarchic pair to maximise the value of both public sector and military culture, skills and expertise. Do you agree with that observation? I do. Would you add to it? I think... Uh, Council, I'd say in addition, there has to be 
mutual trust and respect for the qualities that the different parts of the organisation bring to the whole. And, and I want to focus particularly on the structure of the diarchy. Is that requirement for a high level of communication amongst diarchic pairs formally embedded in its structure? Uh, the, the network of uh, formal and informal interactions that we have as a consequence of the, both the committee systems but also where we Im interact in terms of the provision of advice to government means that we, we are compelled to consult and to um, provide joint quality advice to government on a, at least weekly, sometimes several times a day basis. So you see that committee structure as being part of the mechanism by which that high level of communication is compelled to occur? It is part of it, but again, I do not overly rely on it. It has an important place in, in, in the, the way in which defence works, but uh, Council, I spend a half a day a month in the defence committee. That is all. Yeah, and and my questions, as you hopefully are coming yep. to appreciate, are really about structural issues. Yep. Uh, now, I just want to come back to the issue of accountabilities within the diarchy. The Associate Secretary gave evidence that he created the strategic accountabilities table to address the challenge of a lack of leadership accountability mechanisms within defence. You're aware of that being his initiative? That it, it was a very welcome initiative. There was a lack of formalised written accountabilities. I believe that uh, officers were clear of, about their accountabilities, but it has been an important initiative to formalise that. And particularly in terms of those formal written accountabilities, how would you s assess the current level of their clarity? Um, Council, it's a work, it is a work in progress. I've, I do use it. I use the table as uh, one of the inputs into my formulation of people's performance agreements. I go back uh, from time to time just to refresh myself about where um, issues sit. But I, it's certainly not always at the front of my mind. I, there are other tools and other... Um, mechanisms I use to, to, to give more clear direction to subordinate direct reports. My, my other um, shared um, partners in the uh, group heads and service chiefs. So it is, it is an important tool, but it is not the only one. Focusing particularly though on that tool, the strategic accountabilities table, how would you assess the current transparency of performance reporting with respect to it in defence? Uh, it, it, is, it is a, uh, a component um, and it, it, it is evolving. Uh, like we have changes to the senior leadership structure that's being, like the, the accountabilities table is being adjusted to take into account the creation of a new deputy secretary uh, governance. Um, so it is, it, is, it is important, but one of several factors. Uh, now, Secretary, one of the issues that has been explored, particularly during this hearing block, is senior late leadership accountability for institutional failings. In particular, how you establish a culture of organisational learning so that where there are architectural failures within an organisation, senior leaderships analyse what went, went on, um, they consider organisational yeah. shortcomings and they really own the issue mm -hmm. and the need to bring about change. Now, to that end, the Commission heard evidence last week from members of the Afghanistan Inquiry Implementation Oversight Panel that was material to yep. that issue. No doubt you're aware of the panel and its members. I am, and I'm very grateful for their work. And you would accept that each of those panellists have deep experience in governance issues as well as organisational reform? Uh, I do, and very deep commitment to the issues. 
and you're aware, no doubt, that the task of that panel was to provide oversight and assurance of Defence's broader response to the Afghanistan inquiry, specifically relating to cultural organisation and leadership change? Uh, I am aware. Now, um, Secretary, I want to take you to some of the evidence the panel gave last week to give you an opportunity to respond. Um, can I ask if the operator can please display the transcript from day 94 um, and go to 94-9491, starting at line 35, and expand that to the end of the page, please. Uh, and just to give you some context, Secretary, this was part of an exchange with respect to the challenges of organisational change, specifically with respect to culture and the new ethics doctrine that was adopted by Defence as part of the outcomes of that inquiry. But um, I just want to take you to the particular observation by Professor Black. Recording in progress. Um, where he says that um, he expresses the view based on his experience that defence belongs to the same species of large bureaucratic and hierarchical organisation that exists in other spheres. You wouldn't cavil with that proposition, would you? Council, we have some characteristics in common with very large organisations in other sectors um, uh, and some, some aspects of the organisation that, that are unique to military uh, organisations. But, but yes, it is a large, complex organisation and then and the governance arrangements for any large, complex organisation are, are, in, are in some ways um, multi-layered but also matrixed. And you'd certainly then, I take it, defer to um, the expert view that's expressed by Professor Black in that passage? Uh, I, I, I have no, um, no issues with what uh, Professor Black has um, uh, said there. And so I take it from that that you would also accept that the barriers you find in other large organisations are of the same character as some of those barriers that you might find in defence? Uh, Councillor, I say many are. Now, um, I might just then take you um, across to the next uh, passage on 94-9422, um, at line 45, really through to the next page at line 10. Sorry, it's 9492. If you could turn, please, operator, to 94 9492. And if you could please expand from line 45 on that page through to line 10 on the next page.
question. Uh, you'll see there um, Professor Black expresses the view that um, the circumstances uncovered by the Afghanistan inquiry constituted a catastrophic organisational and governance failure by defence. You wouldn't cavil with that proposition? Um, Professor Black's worded it in his, in, in his own unique way, but it, it, it was a very fundamental uh, organisational and governance failure. And I suggest to you, Secretary, that this was really, as the Afghanistan inquiry um, report identifies, a blind spot for defence. Uh, I, th I, th I think they uh, weaknesses in defences, and particularly the ADF's uh, uh, governance arrangements on operations, and particularly over special forces command, were were well highlighted in both the Brereton report and and other pieces uh, of work. I think that. The department and, and the ADF, the commander of special operations uh, command, have very, uh, very deliberately tackled many of those failures, which I think is is work that's been picked up by the oversight panel. That, that's not my question, Secretary. Um, let me put it to you this way: um, accepting that there was a catastrophic organisational and governance failure by defence, either it was a blind spot or it did nothing to address it? Which is it? Well, Councillor, I, I, I would say that the ADF de Defence more generally has done an awful lot to address the failures of the experience in, in Japan. I accept that there were very significant failures that allowed uh, those activities or behaviour, alleged, in, in some cases alleged, but but let us accept that there were um, that there were uh, incidents which. Um Mr. Moriarty, forgive me, but um, the question was not have you done anything to address the failures, but how did the failures occur? Was it a blind spot, or that what was what was in place simply didn't meet the needs? We'll get through this a lot quicker if you focus on the actual question. Appreciate you trying to help. Thank well, you, I th I, um, Council. I think that there were probably. Um, shortcomings in terms of procedures and then shortcomings in terms of what 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 could have been done earlier or should have been done earlier to address a challenge. And the fact of those shortcomings was a blind spot for defence? Uh, in, in some ways, yes. And um, you had an exchange with Commissioner Brown earlier about a number of um, external inquiries and reports with respect to defence people. Um, the, uh, I think we spoke about the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, um, the broader inquiry into ADFA, Defence Abuse Response Task Force, to name a few. Um, can I suggest to you that each of those reports has shown um, shortcomings in defence's culture or how it deals with its people? You'd accept that proposition? I would accept that there, uh, there are a number of... All of those really important pieces of work have shown uh, areas where we have not met our own expectations or the expectations of government or the Australian people. I would also say that, that, that defence has made that's not my question. No, no, no. Yeah. I'm, I'm and, understanding and the qu the question is that that those reports indicate that there are shortcomings and failures. Yes. A and more than that, it, it took an external inquiry to shed light on defence and tell it that those cultural issues or issues with its people existed. Uh, Council, in some in some cases, reform has been generated from within defence. Those external reports and um, inquiries have also been very important in terms of mobilising and galvanising uh, effort towards reform. Can I suggest to you more than that, Secretary, it was those reports that shed a light and t told Defence there were issues when, as an organisation, it hadn't owned it? Uh, Council, I would say the work in relation to 
challenges in Afghanistan were driven within our organisation. It was people within our organisation that suggested that we had issues in Afghanistan in terms of the behaviours of our special forces operators and it was defence that set about the need for reform in relation to those issues. M my question was, was different yep. and, and I mentioned to you a series of report, um, the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, that, that was an independent inquiry yep. that showed shortcomings in how defence treats its people. You'd accept that? Yes, I would. Uh, the Broderick inquiry into ADVA, that was an external inquiry that showed shortcomings in defence culture. You would accept that? I would. A and my proposition to you is, historically at least, there is a trend by which there is a need for these external inquiries to force defence to own issues of people and culture. Would you accept that? I would, I would accept that uh, the... All of those have been vitally important uh, generators of further work and, and focus. Uh, I believe that there's also many organisations very usefully from time to time have external reviews and insights into them that, that draw attention and suggest ways to improve and reform. Defence has had some particular challenges. We are not alone. Can I take you then, please, Secretary, to the balance of the passage on that page? Could I ask the operator to please expand line 24 to the end of the page? I've read the passage. So focusing, I'm focusing particularly here on cultural issues. Um, Mr Cornell there observes that the usual reaction um, in response to an issue like the Afghanistan inquiry is for the highest level of the organisation to take responsibility for what occurred, whether they knew about it or not, and to take responsibility for doing what is required to put matters right. You see that view he's expressed? He goes on to observe that this did not happen in the context of the Afghanistan inquiry. Do you agree with that? I certainly accept that that's Mr Cornell's uh, view. That's not I my believe. question. My question yeah. is, do you agree with that view? Uh, I, I would accept that, that uh, the issue of command accountabilities has still not been appropriately dealt with. Uh, now, um, I might then just take, ask the operator to please go to the next page um, and ask um, the operator to please expand from the top of the page down to line 15. read the passage. So Mr Cornell there expresses the view <clears throat> that if you're looking organisationally and if you're looking at leadership and if you're looking at culture, you should look at it from the level at which the most senior people should take responsibility for it and at least analysing where there were any failures of leadership. Do you agree that's what should occur? I do agree. Uh, now, if I could then take you to... Um, the part of the passage, if I could ask the operator to please expand from about line 18 um, to 38.
I've read the passage. So you'll see there Mr Cornell quotes from the work of Professor Wetham that it is clear that a wider organisational accountability for creating a system that made those failures possible is also requ required. You'd agree that's what should be done? Uh, yes, I would. Uh, can I then take you, please, um, Secretary, if the operator could please turn to the next page of the document at 94-9495 um, and expand um, from the top of the page down to about line 31. And I particularly draw your attention, um, Secretary, to the passage that starts about line 20. No, sorry, I correct myself. Um, it's, it's the whole passage. And so you'll see Professor Black is there talking about the responsibilities of senior leaders with respect to the overall organisational architecture and culture of an organisation. And I want to finally take you to what um, he says about that on page 94-9499. And if you could please expand line six to line 23. Read the passage, Councillor. And so you'll see there, um, Professor Black is talking about um, ownership of different levels of responsibility, and particularly when it comes to an organisational failure in senior leadership. He, he says that um, it's incumbent on senior leadership where there is such a failure that the root causes are inquired into, they are understood, and that senior leadership is reflecting very deeply on them personally owning them and personally making the change, whether that is as an individual or a group. Do you agree that's what should occur? Uh, yes, I do, Council. Uh, and so then it would follow from those um, concessions, you would agree that um, it is incumbent on senior leadership to take responsibility for a significant adverse event in the Defence Force? Uh, Council, I do believe and, and I also believe that the 
that what the ADF has done in particular in relation to Special Operations Command following that really important work by Justice Brereton does indicate that there's a very an, un, an understanding of the need for very widespread reform across a whole range of Secre issues. Secretary, can I stop you then? Again, that, that's not my question and this will be a lot yep. smoother if yep. you answer my questions. Yep. Um, so, would you agree, um, as a general proposition, that it is incumbent on senior leadership to take responsibility for a significant adverse event in the Defence Force? That's what should happen. Yes, they do need to take responsibility and to fix and improve and rectify systems where those are shown to have been inadequate or to have failed. And, and I think consistent with the evidence you've just given, taking ownership of an issue requires senior leaders to analyse whether there were organisational failings that allowed those adverse events to occur. <coughs> You'd agree with that? Yes, there needs to be deep thought about the causes and what needs to be done to rectify them. And more than deep thought, you would accept that it requires senior leaders to personally own those issues and personally make the changes that are required, whether it's as an individual or a group? Yeah, certainly, yeah. The, the most senior officers in an organisation have to have a, a, a genuine sense of, of ownership and accountability for the performance of an organisation. And I think you would accept this, um, that the responsibility extends to the issue of culture that was the subject of the Afghanistan inquiry? That, that is correct. I believe that, that, that they taking appropriate steps to, to instil an, a, a, a healthy and constructive and positive culture in an organisation is a responsibility of leadership. Uh, but you would accept that extends beyond culture and that responsibility extends to senior leadership taking ownership of the issue and the prevalence of member and veteran suicidality? I, I believe that senior leaders need to uh, take ownership or to be accountable for the the well-being of their organisation. That includes mental health and well-being and includes the challenge of suicide and suicidality. But, uh, I mean, as the number of years of this Royal Commission has shown, I suggest, Secretary, and the number of reports that have come before it, which I've taken you today, show, the issue of member and veteran suicidality is a significant adverse event that I suggest defence has to own. You'd agree with that? I believe that it, it has to be one of the key uh, focuses of the organisation in terms of the mental health and wellbeing of the overall organisation. And you would agree that that requires the senior leadership to analyse whether or not there have been any organisational failures that have contributed to the prevalence of suicide and suicidality amongst members and veterans? It has, it, it, it has to be open to uh, where we have not met what we would regard as, uh, as, as uh, the right behaviours or standards and we have to be open to taking action to uh, address the issue and to put in place better arrangements to deal with the challenge. So it follows from that that it's incumbent on senior leaders to personally own those changes um, and ensure that they are implemented when needed? Yes, the senior leadership needs to own the issues that impact on our, on our organisation. And suicide and suicidality is a, a, a really important issue for the organisation. So yes, I've worded it differently, but I don't dispute your um, the way that you've, you've set out the, the proposition. Uh, now, Secretary, this touches on some of the evidence you gave at the outset when I asked you whether or not you consider there's need for a public service, the, the, the APS side of defence, to acknowledge whether or not there have been any organisational failings with respect to the issue of defence veteran and suicidality. Um, I want to ask you this question now from an enterprise level. 
have you and others within senior leadership of defence analysed if there have been failings of leadership that have contributed to the prevalence of defence member and veteran suicide? Uh, Council, I'm certainly aware um, that there, there has been thought around why is it that we uh, have these challenges? I, I think as, as well I've been particularly leaders and I've challenged my group heads to look at why do they have some areas in their in their work units where we have had high or unacceptably high levels of, of unacceptable behaviour, including bullying and harassments, all of these th factors that can be very significant contributors. And I think the organisational leadership is very focused on how can we put in place better um, frameworks, better support tools, how can we deal with issues as they come to light in a more effective, fast and uh, uh, an appropriate way. So I, I believe that, that the leadership is putting attention to these issues. Uh, Secretary, when, when you've just given the answer, you, you talk about the leadership um, sort of and tell me if this isn't a fair comment, as something separate from yourself. You were obviously one of the two most senior leaders yep, within that's defense. That's correct. My question is really about what, what you as the top of that diarchy together with other senior leaders have done to analyse if there were failings of leadership that have contributed to this issue. Could you answer the question in that vein? Uh, yes, so, so certainly in my in my responsibilities for the joint administration, I, I have thought what more should I have done and can I do to tackle this issue? Yeah. I'm very conscious that as the Secretary of the Department, I have responsibilities and accountabilities. The question is whether you've analysed the issue. Well, I've thought deeply about it. And, and I've, I've drawn on analysis from experts. I do not have Ex, you know, an expert opinion on these issues. I need to draw on expert views. I rely on Defence People Group, Joint Health Command to give me insights into what more can be done. And then I, I reflect deeply on what I, as Secretary, with the tools at my disposal, can do to get us into a better place. Now, Secretary, you've spoken there about deep thought and deep reflection, um, as well as drawing on expertise for other, from others. Can you tell the commissioners the specific steps you've taken to obtain that expertise as part of your deep thinking and deep reflection? Uh, yes, Council. So, I, I, in, in this, I rely very heavily on uh, the Deputy Secretary people and the, the experts who, who work for her in terms of organi you know, enterprise organisation and, and our policy settings, I rely on um, input from the Associate Secretary. Can I just stop you there? When you were talking about expertise, I, I presumed you were talking about expertise in the field of suicide and suicidality prevention. Have you drawn on expertise with respect to that, the subject matter with which this Royal Commission is concerned? I have been given material relating to those issues. I've also um, followed the development of this Royal Commission and been informed by the, both the, the testimony presented by uh, lived experience witnesses and other experts who've, who've appeared here. So, um, and I am updated three times a week on the work of the Royal Commission by the head of our our task force, I I would I would suggest that I have had uh, a, a, on a weekly basis opportunities to have material presented to me, which has triggered uh, thought about what we as an organisation can and need to do better. Okay, so have you received? any expert advice with respect to the issue of suicide and suicidality, or is that something you expect to come from the mental health and wellbeing branch? Uh, I'm, I'm, I am, I'm, I'm also conscious of work that has been done before, particularly when a lot of this um, responsibility is more 
uh, significantly rested in the in joint health command, but the expert material that I, I do hope to be provided by the mental health and, and wellbeing branch uh, will certainly uh, inform my approach to, to policy setting in this regard. So that's sort of prospectively. Can you give commissioners one example of expert advice you've received, received from Joint Health Command with respect to the issue of suicide and suicidality prevention? Yeah. Uh, one piece of advice which I've received some time ago is that we we need very consciously to work in families. That it's not it, it, it's not uh, just about the individuals. That the, the whole issue of s seeing it as a like a, an ecosystem and that families are vital to this, both in terms of uh, preventing suicide, but also can contribute in so many ways to to stresses that that might uh, contribute to suicidality. So that that is information that was given to me by experts in the department I was not aware of previously and it has led me to think in a different way about how we we might tackle some of these issues. Well, can I take then specifically the example of families? Having received that advice, have you taken any particular steps, for example, to increase the resources that are given to the defence family organisations? Uh, so, what, it, it, as a consequence of that, I've, I've definitely told Deputy Secretary people that th we need to make sure that the outreach and the, the engagement that we are going to have on this issue needs to be adequately resourced to engage with families. Okay, so again, you're talking about prospective steps. I had understood you said you received this advice some time ago. When, when in point of time, did you receive the advice about families? Oh, look, it, 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 was, it was some significant time ago. I can't offer a particular month. Or, but the, the, my uh, direction to Deputy Secretary people around we need to factor in families here, first of all, it, it, it wasn't news to Deputy Secretary people. They were already conscious of, of, of this. But I said, do, do you have the resources that you need to be able to appropriately engage with families as we move forward with this agenda and please tell me if I need to give you additional resources. Okay, I'm not asking you to tell me in terms of days but are we talking about these conversations occurring or this advice being given one, two years ago? Probably a couple of years ago. Okay, so are you saying that you had those specific conversations with the Deputy Secretary of Defence people a couple of years ago or are they discussions you're having now? They've been ongoing. Okay. Uh, Commissioners, I'm about to move to another topic. I wonder if it's a convenient opportunity to allow you to ask some questions. Certainly, thank you. Commissioner Brown. Can I just, um, Secretary, go back to that question of expertise? Um, Council was asking you about um, what expert advice you've had and you, you referred to received material, you've had information coming from this commission and then you spoke about expertise coming from Joint Health Command, Deputy People Group, etc., Mental Health and Wellbeing Branch. I guess it goes back to what I was trying to ask you earlier in terms of are you getting any external input? I appreciate there's expertise yep. within your branch but it's it's kind of like you you're getting advice from within your department, and it's a question of how do you actually seek to check that the advice you're getting is adequate, complete, you know, all that it should be. One way to to have try and have that balance or some sort of assurance is to get some external advice from time to time. Um, I appreciate you might say, well, this Royal Commission is helping you with that, but in terms of what your people are doing within your organisation now, um, do you get any expert advice to you? Not to them, to you. Uh, no, Commissioner, the, the, um, and I'm aware that um, our, our organisation also engages with the, the appropriate national experts on mental health and and, su and suicide, that there is a good constructive and positive relationship there. Um, That's to them, isn't it? To them, and then, and then they provide it to me. I, d I do not uh, have independent 
sources of expertise, either on, on these matters or, and, and as I said, I accept professional advice from the CDF and the other ADF leaders about the particular uh, issues relating to military service and what they should do in terms of training, doctrine, the development of work plans. But, but on a subject that has prompted a Royal Commission, it's prompted a Senate inquiry report, it's prompted a National Mental Health Commission report and it's on, on suicide specifically, uh, and that's all essentially in, and, and it, well, the Productivity Commission wasn't specifically on that, but it did actually speak yeah, to suicide. Right. Yeah. Is that not sufficient for you as the Secretary of the Department to say maybe I need some expert assurance to me, in addition to all of those other things? Uh, Commissioner, I've, I feel that I've, I've had a lot of information available to me. Um, I know some of it has been exceptionally quite high, qu high quality. I have not felt that there has been deficiencies in, the, in terms of the information that have been provided to me. I know I have access to other departments, the Department of Health, the Department of Veterans Affairs, um, and that there is a lot of work being done on, on those issues. So, no, I have not felt that I was inadequately served in terms of provision of advice to me, and I have certainly not felt the need or a requirement to commission independent work into this subject. Um, okay. Um, I might go to Commissioner Douglas just while I think about whether I want to ask the next question. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Douglas. Until the mental health section was set up, um, was there any working group within either Defence or ADF or both, to your knowledge, to provide analysis and advice to you? Uh, Commissioner, not to provide advice to me specifically, but the, the uh, Joint Health Command um, and the Joint Transition Authority were providing advice and reporting to the CDF and, and I was uh, made available, you know, that information was obviously uh, Was there a working available. group within that body which was the source of any advice? I'm just wondering whether there's yeah. been some continuity of analysing the problem rather than being reactive. Uh, I wouldn't, um, Commissioner, I wouldn't feel confident talking about the particular working groups or, or coordination mechanisms that existed down at that level. But I know that uh, Joint Health Command was drawing on uh, inputs from other expert expert bodies, but how often and at what level, I'm not, a, not aware. Do you know whether it was reactive or because there was a body specifically charged to deal with this problem? Uh, no, I do not, Commissioner, but I know that, that, that there was there was work being done on what, what policies and training and other support mechanisms defence needed to put in place and that there, was, there, were, there were discussions between experts that were part of that process of how defence should respond. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I'm not aware of the particular levels of engagement or what triggered the engagement, Commissioner. I suppose what I'm thinking of is that this is a serious issue. Um, some in defence may at the time have thought it's properly owned by DVA. We've heard evidence to that effect, but have since changed their minds. But as a whole of government issue, let's call it a serious issue. You'd think that in a whole of government organisation, there might just be a small group that has a continuing brief to look at this as a problem that needs solution. Uh, Commissioner, I, I, I'd assume that that is certainly the case. At, at, as the Secretary of the Department in terms of the information that comes to me about what, 
what, what is the agenda that we are pursuing in terms of putting in place a defence cultural blueprint or workplace health and safety frameworks, the resourcing that goes to those issues, they are the ones that are particular to my responsibilities and I, I, it, it is and I am accountable to make sure that those frameworks are, are in place. I, just, I do not see it as necessary or appropriate for me as the Secretary of the Department to deep dive into how Joint Health Command may be doing its work and the extent to which it, it is focused on this issue. I know from the Chief of Personnel and DEPSEC people that it is, but I do not feel the need to independently verify that that's the case. I have responsible officers with accountabilities in those areas that tell us that work is being done and there are ways of, of, of establishing is that work being done because we will hear from the service chiefs if they are not happy with the support that is being provided to ADF members. So there are feedback loops that allow us to come to a judgement about whether the work is being done. Commissioner Graham, would you have any more questions? Uh, I, have a, I have a couple. Um, can I just go back to that answer you've just given in terms of you, um, you relying on the feedback loops that are there? Could I just put to you, if we, if we were, you know, and we are in operations in different parts of the world, are you, uh, in terms of assuring yourself as Secretary of the Department in a diarchy with CDF, that, there, that the alleged issues in Afghanistan were not reoccurring, would you just be relying on the feedback loops or would you be taking some extra measures? Uh, Commissioner, well, in, in, in particular in relation to the... Uh, Afghanistan work, I was very uh, confident that those issues were being pursued through the program office, the, the follow-up to the Afghanistan inquiry, that very significant body of work that was... I, I appreciate there's work happening now, yeah. but my question is in the hypothetical, well, par partly hypothetical, I'm sure we are in other operations, yeah, but we are. Yeah. slightly different nature. Would you be making extra effort to assure yourself as Secretary of the Department and in the diarchy with CDF that similar things were not happening elsewhere? Uh, I, would, I would be curious as to how we were conducting operations. The CDF would be vitally interested in how the conduct of operations was being uh, pursued and whether his lawful orders his command of the ADF, whether the elements under his command were performing in accordance with the rules of, of engagement and in accordance with the laws of armed conflict. So the CDF would be the lead on that through Joint Operations Command. He would... I appreciate that. My question is, what would you be doing? I would be uh, assuring myself that the CDF and other relevant officers were focused on this and if it came to my attention that there were deficiencies or worries or anxieties about that, I would speak to the CDF and say, are there additional issues here, CDF, that we need to put more oversight into this or do we need to have a health check about what's going on in this particular area of, of operations? But the... The, the conduct of military operations is very clearly in the accountabilities of the Chief of the Defence Force through his command of the Defence Force. I have a responsibility as part of the diarchy to make sure that the organisation uh, is governed well and complies with the law and so there, therefore, yes, I do uh, have an interest in those issues and it would be... I think... But you would rely on CDF and, and, and 
someone to Chief say to you. Chief of Joint Operations, it uh, primarily, and, but, but I would be closely involved and receive briefing on how those operations were proceeding. And if I had concerns, I would bring them, I would raise them with the CDF. Can I ask a different question? Um, we, Council was asking really um, about the issue of whether defence has owned the issue of suicide and suicidality. Um, one of the things that has come up, again, repeatedly, both in some of the private sessions that we've heard in submissions and also uh, in uh, evidence before uh, us at these hearings, is essentially examples of um, defence defending defence. Um, we've heard uh, Mr Armfield, um, Miss Nikki Coleman, um, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Paul Morgan, all described experiences, adverse experiences, uh, where their endeavours were met with what they described as essentially a closing of the ranks um, and the use of kind of rank and power to either intimidate or, um, you know, deny or to shut things down, which is the absolute antithesis of owning an issue. Um, and it's, it's, it's pretty hard to, to, to say anything other than that is not owning an issue. And some of those examples are very recent. Um, so I guess my question fundamentally is, is defence changing sufficiently to start to own issues or is it likely yeah. that we're going to see defence continuing to defend defence as it's historically done very, very well? Yeah. Um, well Commissioner, I thought, so I'd, I'd, I'd say the defence leadership, and I mean the service chiefs, very committed, the vice chief, CDF, my, you know, myself and the group heads, we are very committed to performing better in relation to this. Like, we have let some of our people down in the past it's with, with appalling and tragic consequences. The, we, we need to get a better um, a culture of, of res respect, concern, uh, throughout the organisation and it needs to be driven down. So often I think we've, we've had good policy initiatives at the highest level but I've, I've often been disappointed when I hear that particular work units, uh, there's still unacceptable behaviour, there's a bad workplace culture at that, at the, that lower level and I, I, I reflect a lot, what can we, the senior leadership, do to drive that, what I think is a really important cultural agenda, how can you drive that down to the, the smallest workplace, either in the field, at, at a squadron, on a ship? How can, we, how can we get that cultural change all the way down? So it, it has to be owned by leaders at all levels. It's, it's not just the senior officer accountability, but like the... Def pathway to change, it made some important uh, progress, not enough. The defence cultural blueprint, again, I, I'm, I am more optimistic about that. I think that there'll be a bit more rigour that goes in that. But if we cannot drive that ch cultural change down to the levels that are impacting on people who are really struggling, then we won't achieve the results that we want. And, and I, do, I, do, I do worry about this and I'm, I'm, I, I'm not happy that the cultural change work and the workplace health and safety policy initiatives, then you still have people being tra treated badly at a training establishment. Or, I mean, again, there's, there, there are junior leaders throughout our organisation who are very conscious of this, but, we, but still not uniformly. And there is still enormous work that needs to be done to get this cultural agenda accepted and lived at the local workplace. 
Thank you for that, Secretary. I would agree, but I would also just note that um, I think what we heard in Mr Morgan's case was that it was actually not at the necessarily the middle management or the mm. um, lower levels. It was actually at structural yeah. senior levels. Um, so I think the message has to be very clearly senior, middle, way. junior. Thank you. Um, I just have one issue, um, and then we'll move on, I think. Um, I think you were asked a bit earlier, Secretary, in particular in relation to families, and you said that um, if you've definitely told Deputy Secretary people that we need to make sure that the outreach and the engagement that we're going to have on this issue needs to be adequately resourced to engage with families. I just sort of went back to the other uh, quote. It's at 10, uh, 14.55. Dot three one. If anyone needs to look it up, um, I, I think that's great. Um, are you aware of any significant budget cuts to Defence Families Australia or DMFS or in that area to do with families? Uh, uh, Commissioner, no, I'm, I'm not aware of any particular cuts. I know that you know all of the all parts of the organisation. Um, you know, there's there's financial pressures, but these these are priority areas for I, I'm sure and that's why I asked I mean you, as, as the top no, of no, 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 you're not aware no, of that no particular no. concerns have been brought to my attention Commissioner okay thank you can I ask you to take that on notice please if somebody can just check whether there have been cuts in that space if there were cuts in that space at a time when the Royal Commission is sitting would you see that I mean you're a very experienced senior yeah. public servant you're aware of optics and the necessity to make sure that things are done uh, that do not embarrass anyone. How would you view it if there were cuts while the Royal Commission is sitting and you were not aware? Well, I, Commissioner, I can assure you that, the, that I would want to know what the rationale was and then I would be very inclined to reverse them. Thank you. I'll look forward to hearing back from you and I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Ms Longbottom. Thank you, Commissioner Caldas. Um, Secretary, in answer to some of the questions you have been asked by the commissioners, you spoke about the reliance you place on your senior responsible officers um, in respect to the issues, the subject of this Royal Commission. Um, and you've spoken about wanting to know that the work those senior responsible officers are doing. Uh, I want to shift focus particularly to the effectiveness of that work and focus particularly on the formal accountabilities of your senior responsible officers. Um, now, as I understood you've said, um, look, the strategic accountabilities table is the principal document by which their formal accountabilities are set out. Is that right? Uh, it, it is the most important formal document, but I don't rely on it overly. But my question is really about those formal embedded structures. You'd agree that that particular document is at a high level? A very high level. And you would agree that it doesn't include any metrics to assess the effectiveness of the work that's been done by your senior leaders? Uh, yes, Council, and my experience in, in a number of government departments has been at that level, these, these accountabilities are very very general and rarely have these very strong metrics or KPIs that feed into them. I've been a Deputy Secretary in Foreign Affairs and Prime Minister in Cabinet and now Secretary in the Department of Defence and it's been a very similar approach across all those departments. Uh, and is there a particular reason why there can't be those effectiveness metrics of a senior officer's performance? Uh, in some cases, it is it it's it's not it's not possible. There might in in some uh, service delivery organisations where you might have a metric were client inquiries responded to within a certain time, but then were they responded to satisfactorily within that time? Again, I'd say is an additional complication. Where in in non service delivery areas, I, th I think the issue of metrics is a challenge. It, it, to the extent that you can get useful metrics, that should be an input, but it is a much broader and mul more multifaceted challenge. 
But, but it would not be impossible, would it, Secretary? Could I just give you a particular example, say, with respect to um, the cultural initiatives that are under the yeah. um, carriage of the Deputy Secretary for Defence People? Um, you, you would accept that there would be metrics by which the success or effectiveness of those initiatives could be measured? I would like to think so, I, and but I don't. I don't want to go for uh, metrics that are new, numeric but don't go to quality. It, so it's a balancing exercise, yeah. but it's not impossible. It, no, and I think we need to try best endeavours to see where we can take that. But I would prefer, like when. Some people say, oh, I provided 10 pieces of advice to the minister last month and I would like to say, yes, but how many of them did the minister find useful? And, and that's precisely the point we're driving yeah. at. It can't just be about activity. It's yeah. got to be about impact. Yeah. Impact and quality. Um, uh, similarly, in terms of your own performance, I think included in the um, tender bundle is your um, performance agreement. Um, would it be fair to say that the metrics of your performance are particularly about activities rather than outcomes? Uh, and I think my performance agreement with the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, he would also, in, in, in coming to a view about my performance, he would seek input from my minister on, on did the Secretary provide you with quality advice? Were you well supported in your international engagements in cabinet, so on and so forth. He would also seek adv advice from my peers across the, the, the other government agencies. Was defence a constructive collegiate so, contributor? So he wouldn't say, did defence on less than five, more than five, more than 15 occasions provide quality advice into your cabinet process? No, but um, so you're talking there about how sort of 360 degree reporting informs yeah. your performance as yeah. secretary. Um, but in terms of your senior leadership role and your responsibility for those under your, I'm going to say command, but you know what I mean, yeah. um, it is, can I suggest it wouldn't be impossible to have. Um, outcome-based measures yeah. for the success of particular policies and initiatives of which you have oversight? Uh, yeah, and certainly my minister would have a view about the quality of the work that I had presented to him, both to inform his own decision-making but also for him to take to government in terms of through the the, the National Security Committee of Cabinet or, or more broadly. And there would be other ministers who would also have a view about the quality of that work. But for you, for example, so, so I think we've spoken about sort of some of your um, accountabilities sit in the sphere of reform and policy. Yeah. So let's take, for example, the Defence Cultural Blueprint as an initiative, which one of your senior responsible officers have to drive cultural reform. Yeah. Would, would you accept that that would be a space in which there could be performance-based measures to see if you're not just taking action but that action is being effective? Uh, I think we could certainly... I mean, I will be able to measure whether the action plans are developed and put in place. And then I will be able to measure whether, based on perhaps input from mental health and wellbeing branch, I'll, I'll be able to say, do those action plans appropriately deal with the su issues of suicide and suicidality and uh, do do these action plans um, appropriately reflect our current thinking about wellness and whole of, whole of life um, support? So I can come to views about those issues and to a certain extent you can measure them. You can say, were they produced on time? Do other relevant experts think that they are quality? And then are they being reported on? So that some of those metrics we can capture. In terms of if I give a, um, a, an action plan for our capability acquisition and sustainment group that 
that talks about measures that need to be actively taken to reduce workplace uh, harassment and instances of bullying, the fact that the plan was put in place and it was a good quality plan, if there are still instances, I don't, I don't know that I can draw a link between that, that management initiative and say it wasn't any good because we still have uh, these unacceptably high levels of, of, of complaint or challenge, I have to sort of say we need to dive into that work area. We need to understand what is happening in that work area rather than say the plan wasn't any good. But you would accept, would you not, Secretary, that activity is not enough to measure um, the effectiveness of your senior a leader's absolutely performance? Absolutely right, uh, And you would accept, at least insofar as it concerns the strategic accountability table, at present senior leaders don't have any outcome-based measures by which their performance is assessed? I would agree, and I also have a view about their performance which I derive from a range of inputs. But can I suggest to you, um, uh, Secretary, uh, without any documented outcome-based measures for senior responsible officers, there really is no meaningful accountability for I them? I disagree fundamentally, uh, Council. I, I, I use data uh, as an input Sometimes it triggers uh, curiosity on my part and I, I have a discussion with them. I would talk to subordinates. I would ask areas that are either supporting that work unit or supported by it. And then I will, over time and after a lot of conversations, come to a view about either what additional support needs to be done or what, what higher standards an officer needs to be held to but I, I, I really don't, I, I want more and better data, but I do not feel that uh, I am unable to come to a well-informed view about the performance of my direct reports because of a lack of m those type of metrics. And in terms of that data that you have at the moment, is that data in the sphere of 360 degree reporting? But, but also, I mentioned uh, before, um, the various surveys, both our internal defence surveys, the public service um, surveys, the workplace health and safety uh, dashboard, I really rely on those, but just as the trigger. Um, now, I, I want to shift to your oversight role with respect to policy driving cultural reform within defence. We've spoken about this in a, in a bit of detail already, but specifically your support for the work of the Deputy Secretary of Defence people in developing and resourcing <coughs> the next cultural reform strategy. Yes. Um, can I ask, in terms of that work, have you given the Deputy Secretary of Defence people any directions as to the priority areas for that reform? Uh, I've spoken to the Deputy Secretary on a number of occasions uh, about the, the defence culture a blueprint and I was very pleased to get that work final, finalised and the CDF and I uh, signed it late last year. So I did uh, tell her that I, I thought as the follow on to Pathways to Change and given some of the, what we knew were some of the limitations of, of some of the measurements around Pathways to Change, I said I'd like this framework to have a stronger evidence base to start with and then we want some clearer accountabilities. I want work plans from each group and service uh, to be developed under the Defence Culture Blueprint. There has to be training material or educate communications material provided because I think that was one of the things that I picked up through a number of conversations was that people felt that they they had heard of culture pathway to change, but hadn't been clear about what was what was being required or uh, uh, required of them. Um, she told me about the the her 
focus on making sure that there was a culture hub as part of this arrangement which would provide that resource and provide, do some of the measurement work and provide the communi communications. So it has to be resourced to do the communicating. And, and can I just unpack yep. that with you a little bit? In terms of that cultural reform piece, um, you would accept that it's incumbent on you as the yep. most senior um, yep. public servant within defence to um, clearly set your expectations about that aspect of cultural reform? Yeah, that's, that's right. And that's why I, I'm very... I'm very pleased with the defence culture blueprint and the way that it deals with those issues. And, and, and I think you mentioned earlier or alluded to some of the critiques of the pathway to change that emerged out of the NAUS review. Um, so you'd be aware specifically that it identified that um, pathway to change had aspirational statements rather than clear objectives. You're familiar with that criticism? I am, I'm aware of that criticism. And, and I think it is largely fair. And so, can you get well? Can yeah, you give yeah. commissioners then your insights into into what you have told the deputy secretary of defence? People need to be the clear objectives in the defence cultural blueprint. Yeah, and 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 I, I I I mentioned to Miss Greg when the work was being developed that we wanted stronger accountabilities, and so that each the leadership at the different levels understood what what they were expected to progress as a result of these. I think having the, um, the service and group uh, work plans will, will set those out and they are being developed uh, as we speak. I've also made sure and, I'm, and it is in the um, culture blueprint that there will be annual assessments and I think that that was uh, one of the deficiencies. Well, yes, and it comes back to this issue about activities rather yep. than effectiveness yep. and in terms of those assessments um, what directions have you given to the deputy secretary of defense people about effectiveness metrics rather than just activity metrics yeah so I'm I am I am I've been reassured by the deputy secretary people that the culture hub that will largely lead on these, uh, measurements and um, and surveys will have enough expertise to be able to do it at, at, a, at a at a high quality and I will continue I mean these the reports on these are going to come to myself and the CDF at least twice yearly through the enterprise business committee I can assure commissioners I'm going to pay a bit more attention to it than twice yearly because it is so important to us and I will need to be confident that the culture hub does is adequately resourced and has the expertise to both set the benchmarks and then measure against them. Uh, and uh, just, I just, I'll come back to the culture hub in a moment. But, but just in terms of, uh, can we wait, Ms. Longbottom? Of course. The, the two hours has just come up. Uh, I see. I apologise. Thank you, Commissioner. We just, uh, Secretary, we, our transcribing people have to have a break every two hours and we, we try and accommodate that. I'm very grateful that there are such a requirement, Commissioner. Okay. Uh, we'll just adjourn for 15 minutes. Thank you. All rise. The Royal Commission will now adjourn for 15 minutes.
The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Yes, Ms Longbottom. Thank you, Commissioner Caldas. Um, Secretary, before the adjournment, we were talking about the Defence Cultural Blueprint. Um, and as I understood it, the effect of your evidence was there is the blueprint, but then there will be separate action plans to give it effect. Correct, That's correct. correct. That's right. And am I right to understand those action plans are service specific ac action plans? Uh, each group and service will have its own action plan. Uh, and my question is what oversight do you have um, or your Deputy Secretary of Defence people to ensure that those action plans properly execute your vision for cultural reform? So the action plans will need to be um, dis discussed and, and sort of, I think, quality controlled by Defence People Group, in particular the Culture Hub that is being established to really drive the defence cultural bl blueprint. I, it is my intention to make sure that that culture hub has enough heft and resources so that it can provide quality input to the groups and services as they develop those action plans and then it'll have enough capacity to be able to evaluate and in terms of the form those action plans take, do you and or Deputy Secretary Greg have hard power to ensure the action plans properly reflect the intent of the cultural blueprint? Um, I think there's no doubt in my mind that if I took a view, particularly if the CDF and I took a view that one of the action plans did not ad adequately address our issues and concerns, that would be dealt with quickly. So that's a yes? That is a yes. Now, um, one of the um, matters that emerged from the NAUST review with respect to Pathway to Change was that the devolved implementation model relied in part on discretionary effort, which meant that it was not possible to determine the full resourcing and funding allocated to implementation of that earlier policy. You're aware of that criticism? I am aware of that criticism and I think it's uh, as well, yeah, each of the groups and services were, re were resourcing it and pursuing the agenda, but some more comprehensively, some took a particular um, group or service-centric approach to it. So I, I couldn't be assured that there was a uniform approach. And particularly then with that question of resourcing and moving forward with the next cultural blueprint, have you engaged with Deputy Secretary Greg about whether or not there are sufficient resources in place to support that focused effort that's needed? Uh, yes, uh, but more particularly the CDF and I have made, made it very clear across the organisation that this is a high priority and that all groups and services are expected to resource the, the work that they do to implement the, um, the cultural blueprint. And would it be right to say then, um, having regard to your sort of singular um, levers with respect to budget and resourcing, to the extent to which that's required, you will allocate the resources to do that? Well, I will, but I'll, I, I would also rigorous, like if, for example, if my Deputy Secretary Capability and Acquisition and Sustainment Group says, well, Secretary, I really don't have uh, many resources to do this cultural blueprint. I would say, you have a several billion dollar budget. Let us sit down together and go line by line and you can tell me why you can't find the millions rather than the billions that we will need to resource this initiative. Keeping then on that topic of resourcing, but in the particular context of the mental health and wellbeing branch, um, that branch was stood up by Joint Direction 15 of 2023, that's correct? That's correct. Uh, and I think you've spoken about the um, resourcing for that branch. Can you give commissioners an overview of the steps that were necessary to ensure um, the resourcing and financial budgets were provided to initiate that branch? Yeah. Uh, well, certainly, the, the, the standing up of the branch council, there was 
some transfer of, of functions and personnel from joint, uh, uh, joint health command. But in addition, we recognised, and Ms Gregg made it clear to me that we were building something that had a much broader remit, that it was looking uh, genuinely at that uh, a well-being framework that factors through career, but also that broader wraparound, in including uh, family. So it would need additional resources to that that had just focused more narrowly on the, the health and, and illness uh, aspects of, of this challenge in Joint Health Command. I allocated an additional 170 positions to Defence People Group, including to do work in uh, mental health and wellbeing branch. And I've said to uh, Ms Gregg, once it's fully staffed and underway, I need uh, feedback and at least probably in six months' time, but we'll do a more comprehensive review in a year, does it have the resources it needs to achieve what we hoped it would do? Um, so I would expect through the Defence People Committee, through to the um, uh, Enterprise Business Committee to be given a report on that, but I will also be separately, and, and I'm sure uh, I'll be doing this with a very strong and work support of and partnership with the CDF. We will be more frequently talking about what it is that mental health and wellbeing branch need to be able to achieve its mission. Does it have the resources to provide the expert input to all of the groups and, and services? And in terms of that concept of mission, um, we spoke earlier today about the evidence given by the Afghanistan um, implementation panel about organisational architecture and the need to look and analyse past failings and address those. Um, what steps have you taken to ensure that the organisational architecture of this branch will make it fit for purpose to make a real difference with respect to suicide and suicidality amongst members and veterans? Yeah. Well, the, I, I think um, the very strong commitment from myself and the CDF is, is evident in the joint directive. It's also evident in the resourcing that has been made available so, so far. Uh, it, is, it is clear in terms of what, what we have said that we want the mental health and wellbeing branch to do in terms of informing the work, uh, the action plans on the defence culture blueprint. Um, and I, I, I suppose we have, we have high expectations of it and there's a lot, a lot that is going to be asked of it. I've also made very clear to Deputy Secretary People that it's, while I want the branch to be stood up and fully operational as quickly as possible. I also want the right people in that branch. I want expertise and I want, I want people who can speak with authority throughout our organisation about what needs to be done to tackle the challenge of suicide and suicidality. Uh, and in terms of that um, organisational architecture, uh, am I right to understand your expectations and those of the CDF are um, documented first of all in Joint Direction 15 of 2023? That's correct. And then additional conversations we've had with Deputy Secretary people. Uh, are there any other documents that set out your expectations with respect to the architecture and deliverables from that mental health and wellbeing branch? Uh, off the top of my head, Council, I can't recall any additional written instructions, but certainly um, I've, I've spoken to the Deputy Secretary people on a number of occasions about my expectations for the branch, and but also to make very clear to the Deputy Secretary people that I, am, I, I and the CDF expect to be informed if there's any resistance to really input from mental health and wellbeing branch across our organisation. Could I ask you then just to take on notice the issue about whether or not there are any additional documents that set that out and if so, um, have those provided to the Commission? Um, 
I'll do so. Yes. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, I, I want to move topics now to um, privacy and the challenges of the Privacy Act. Yep. Um, that has been a theme of evidence, particularly during this hearing block. Uh, and based on the evidence the Commission has heard, there are a couple of aspects to it. Um, the first is medical incompetence and Privacy yep. Act issues preventing command and families engaging with respect to the provision of mental health and wellbeing supports when they're needed. You're cognizant of that issue? I am. Uh, the second aspect of it is data not being able to be shared effectively between key bodies responsible for the health and wellbeing of mm. members and veterans, <coughs> most particularly DVA and Defence. Uh, now, Secretary, that's a matter that you touch upon in your statement in, in the particular context of the Defence DVA data sharing and analytics solution. Do you recall that aspect of your evidence? I do, Council. Um, this is an also an issue that has been engaged in by the Defence People Committee as far back as I think it's 20 October 2022. I just want to take you to a minute from... Um, that particular committee. Operator, could you please display def.1233.0002.0972 and if you could turn to the next page and expand paragraph 16. Uh, so the first proposition there is that privacy and content, consent continues to be a key challenge. Secretary, would it be fair to say that proposition is as true in 2024 as it was in 2022? I believe, it, Council, it remains a, re a real challenge. Now, the other, um, and another part of that paragraph refers to an iterative concurrent approach uh, being followed to ensure that all possibilities are being considered, including potential legislative <coughs> change. Do you have any insights you can give the commissioners about those concurrent approaches? Uh, Council, I am uh, aware that the we, we want to approach this in, in terms of what are there, are there ways of interpreting the law that allow us to to be more forward leaning than there are. Sometimes it is uh, a reluctance or a misinterpretation of, of how the law should that should be applied that that is uh, imposes a hesitancy on people to. Uh, and I, I will come to okay, that specifically yeah. that in a minute. Um, and then but I, I, it might be helpful if if in this context I ask the operator to expand paragraph eighteen. Uh, which looks at a couple of options that were being considered by the committee. And across to the next page as well, please. Thank you, operator. Uh, now, it's not lost on the Commission that there are complexities in this space and in particular balancing um, the privacy of individuals with um, the importance of being able to deliver effective care. Can I ask you, from your perspective as Secretary of the Department of Defence, what do you see as the way forward and are there specific actions you would commend to this Commission to consider? 
I, I, I'm very attracted to the um, us doing whatever we can to make it a, a broader uh, availability of data and 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 more and wider permissions. So if that if that does require an opt out rather than or or if that would be helped by a, an opt out act of clause rather than an opt in, I'd, I'd, I would be supportive of that. We we are looking at reforms to the Defence Act, and 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 um, while that work is yet to go, uh, you know, before government for consideration, but certainly looking at what what, what we might do there is is within the department being being uh, thought about. I'm also conscious that in addition to the law and the willingness of our people to, I don't, um, uh, but to explore the full extent to which the law allows them to act in a way that they might, might initially be hesitant to do. And I've, my own experience here, I've been drawn on in this re regard when I was looking at well, I had responsibilities for consular and crisis management. We had very strict guidance about what you could provide a next of kin and then what you couldn't provide other, other than designated next of kins. But if, if, the, if it either it wasn't clear or, or if there were people who clearly had a connection to an individual who had a reasonable expectation, when, when, you were, when you were breaching the Privacy Act by providing information or is there other information that you can provide that wasn't the fulsome account you may be able to give a next of kin but was still helpful to that person but didn't lead to a, a breach of the law? Uh and I will, I will come back yeah. to those questions of interpretation. Yeah. I'm really focused for the moment on those hard legal barriers yeah. that exist at the moment. Um, you'll see in this paper um, one of the options that is spoken about is the consent opt-out approach. And I think that's one of the things that you were talking about as being a possible option. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, what's said here is that um, the view is expressed there that there are reputational risks associated with an opt-out option. Um, do you have any insights as to what those reputational risks might be or do you not agree with that? Uh, no, no I, 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 am, I, I think that there might be uh, people who felt that if that they hadn't very consciously thought about, thought through the full implications. So, like, op where they may have taken an action which resulted in them opting out, but then in the event of, of, a, of a particular incident or something where information was shared, where they may not be very happy with the actions taken by the department or one of its elements where data or information was shared where they had they had not been of the view that that would be done. So, so you're talking there, for example, particularly an individual's medical incompetence would be one example of that. So, something like, uh, or, or uh, yeah, but that would be one example. Uh, can, can we carve that sort of individual instance out? Do you see there being any reputational risks in using aggregated data of members to understand, for example, relevant trends associated with mental health and wellbeing? I do not see okay. that it should be a problem. Okay. Um, now, um, in this, as we understand it, subsequently the Enterprise Business Committee has adopted an opt-in approach to address the need for legislative change, particularly with the um, DSAS, the Data Sharing and Analytics Solution. Can you give commissioners an overview of that change and where it's at? Uh, uh, sorry, Councillor, I can't give a, a, de a detailed uh, explanation. I'm a, I am aware that that 
work is is in train, but I do not know the exact point at, that that they are that they are at in terms of where where that work has progressed to. And I think you've mentioned just in terms of Privacy Act issues as a whole, there being contemplated specific legislative change. That that is that is an, a, an issue that reform of the Defence Act is an issue that is the government has uh, indicated it will consider. It is, but it it isn't being sort of scheduled, and we are we are doing work within the department around that, but I wouldn't wish to presume how the government may wish to move forward. And, and accepting that to be the case, are there particular recommendations that have been made to the government about what those amendments might be to achieve the objectives you want it to? Um, Council, the, I, I, I need to be careful about this. Of course. But, but the, 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 I, I'm very comfortable to say the department is, is doing work and, and a number of options will be put to government. Um, then coming back to the issue of interpretation of the constraints of Privacy yep. Act, um, of, of things like the Privacy Act, you've obviously spoken about it in the context of your consular experience. Um, we've certainly heard evidence, um, particularly in the context of um, notifying complain complainants of the outcome of an unacceptable behaviour complaint, that there are yep. lacks of clarity in terms of interpretation that have led to um, uh, yeah. outcomes that should not have occurred. Um, do you have any insights into the work that's been done by defence in this space really to ensure that there are clear understandings of the hard constraints of the Privacy Act? The, the, uh, this is a really important point is there are, the Act does have some hard constraints and we, we must respect those. The, I think the Privacy Act is, is important for all, all Australians but, but there, are, uh, there are some understandable frustrations when somebody is told that they can't be given a sense of how a, a complaint may have been addressed or resolved because of the Privacy Act and, and what the general direction and the associate secretary has been doing uh, some work uh, in this regard is giving uh, the people, our decision makers and the people who then communicate, giving them a better sense of what is the, what is the, the, the proper uh, and hard um, limits of the law and where they might be able to um, with, without any breach of the law, be more um, uh, generous in, in terms of the provision of some information. Uh, now, Secretary, um, that issue of data sharing, particularly mm. at a um, government department level, yeah. um, touches on a broader issue with which this Royal Commission is concerned, and that is really the need for a whole of government approach to the issue of suicide and suicidality. Yes. Um, and no doubt it's axiomatic to say that that issue is not one that's confined to members and veterans, but it affects all Australians in all walks of life. Do you accept that? I do. Uh, and you <coughs> accept in turn that there are many different parts of government who have a role to play in both addressing the factors um, that lead to suicide and suicidality on the one part. You'd agree with that? I would. Um, and equally, there are a whole um, number of departments and government organisations that, through good actions and bad, can contribute to adverse impacts on people's lifetime wellbeing. You'd agree with that? Uh, and broader civil society organisations, as, as well as government departments. Uh, I particularly want to focus on government departments for the moment. Um, do you have any views you can share with commissioners about what other government departments might do to assist defence in its efforts to reduce suicide and suicidality? Yeah. I'm, I'm certainly very keen to draw on the expertise of the Department of Health and the various in, um, bodies within that broader health portfolio. I think that in, in the past we, we haven't necessarily engaged uh, as broadly as we could have. I think that some of that is is being 
uh, addressed. I'm Can I just stop you there? I'm really focused on current or past steps that have been yeah. taken in that space. Uh, are you currently having discussions with the Department of Health or are you aware of those discussions? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that there are engagements with um, uh, institutions out in, in the health portfolio with, with uh, elements of my, my department. Also, of course, the relationship with DVA is, is long standing, but it is a, a deeper, I, I think, a more fruitful partnership now than it has ever been before. And I've been talking with Secretary Frame about how we might take forward the work of this Royal Commission, including um, through our program management offices, where we might have people on each other's management boards, but also integrated staff in each other's program management offices. And so, um, obviously, you've spoken about your discussions with Secretary um, Frame. Am I right that there is what's called the Australian Public Service Secretaries Board? That's correct. It's chaired by uh, uh, Professor Glyn Davis, the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Now, just putting to one side the work you're undertaking with Secretary Frame, um, have you more broadly briefed that board regarding this Royal Commission and the learnings that have come out of it? Um, I have not briefed them, but I, I know that the, the, the board is conscious of the work of the Royal Commission. Now, um, you're familiar, no doubt, Secretary, with the FODE review into the Australian Public Service? I am. Um, and you're aware, no doubt, then, that that review found that deep cultural change was needed within the public service in order for it to become a high-performing institution? I'm aware of that observation or judgment that was made by the, the review team. And my question is really this, um, and I can take you to some of the particular recommendations, but it sounds as though you're well versed in them. Uh, do you consider that the key learnings from that review might assist defence in the transformation that's needed to address defence and veteran suicide? Uh, I, th I think that we we should certainly look at the reform, the broader reforms to the the public sector that the that the Thody review pointed to, and some of that has been picked up in the government's public sector reform agenda, which has been led by Minister Katie Gallagher, the Minister for the Public Service, very strongly supported by the Public Service Commissioner. And so there, there is work that has been done at that level which should flow across all departments and agencies. Can you give commissioners some example of some specific facets emerging from that review that you consider are relevant to assisting defence to address Member and member and ex-member suicide and suicidality. Well, I, th I think there's a there is a very strong focus on uh, citizen-centric service delivery that I think is very useful to defence as as well as the uh, the broader public service. I think a rebuilding of expertise within the public sector, which the the review talked about, how um, genuine genuine expertise in some areas had fallen below what it regarded as appropriate levels. And we have certainly looked to try and grow our own internal expertise in relation to some of these uh, really important matters. And then the need for proper cross-government um, information sharing, consultation and coordination, which was a big theme of, of Bodhi, the need for joined up government. Defence is very... Uh, open and enthusiastic about drawing on expertise wherever it sits in the public sector now. So it was a very, it was a big and important body of work and we are looking at the, the reform agenda that is taken forward by the government and where it specifically relates to us. It relates in a, in a number of ways, um, mental health and wellbeing the, the well-being of our workforce, producing a healthy and motivated workforce, is a is, is how how to how to go about that is a challenge that the entire public sector faces, not just defence. Can, can I shift topics then, Secretary, um, to the IGADF? Um, that is a matter about which 
this Royal Commission heard evidence in a previous hearing yeah. block. Am I right, Secretary, that at least at present, funding for the IGADF is administered by you as Secretary of the Department? Well, it, it, uh, yes, in a, general, in a general sense that the IGADF, you know, puts forward a, a, a budget request and, you know, that is considered in the context of the Department's budget, which I sign off on. Do you then have any accountability to assess the performance of the IGADF with respect to its functions? Uh, no, I do not. Why not in terms of that issue you've spoken about, efficient and effective funding? Why not with the IGADF? Uh, because the, the IGADF is um, it's an Inspector General function for the, the ADF and uh, it's... It is, it is set up to serve the ADF and um, to, to provide that independent oversight and, and to look into issues that are raised by members. I do discuss with the CDF um, what the IGADF needs, but I do not come to an independent view about whether it's adequately resourced or or, or not adequately resourced, uh, but I would respond to a request from the CDF. We may be at cross purposes. My, my yeah. question is not so much about adequate resourcing, but whether or not it is it is effectively discharging its responsibilities. Um, so I think, as you've just pointed out, it is independent necessarily so of ADF. So my question is, is do you as secretary have any role in assessing the effectiveness of its performance? Yeah. Uh, council, the, the, there is a very significant review being undertaken into the IG. I'm aware of that. And I, w I will be very closely interested in what its findings and, and outcomes are in terms of, you know, the future direction for that organisation. So is that a yes or a no? Uh, I'm, I will be involved in... Having in having a view and inputting and discussing with the CDF the future direction and authorities of the IGADF. But but you would e accept the importance, would you not, of the CDF being at least to a degree kept independent from that um, discussion because the very purpose of the IGADF is to provide independent oversight of the ADF. I I I, I absolutely agree. He should be separate to it in terms of the work. The work it does and and the judgments it it comes to but i think the cdf appropriately would want to ensure that the igadf was able to effectively go about the work that the igadf was set up to do and if that needs to be further enhanced including its further independence um, i i think that we would be very open to uh, understanding the issues and the arguments in relation to that. Uh, now, Secretary, I, I want to shift topics to the final report that will come out of this Royal Commission. Mm -hmm. Now, um, given that it's anticipated that there will be a new Chief of Defence Force later this year, sort of after July of this year, I understand mm -hmm. it. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, Council. Given that, you will be the remaining enduring senior leader within the defence diarchy. Do you agree with that? Uh, at the government's pleasure, Council. Uh, do you feel the weight of responsibility of ensuring that defence addresses the cultural, leadership, governance and accountability issues that have been the focus of this Royal Commission? Council, I feel that responsibility whether the CDF was changing out or not. Okay. Well... In terms of that, Secretary, can I take you to the governance structure for the implementation of the final recommendations, um, or the proposed governance structure, rather? Can the operator please display um, def.1397.0001.0001? Now, you're familiar with that document, are you, Associate Secretary? Could we just expand it a little? Actually, Secretary. Oh, 
sorry, Secretary, please forgive me. It's a paper that was presented to the Defence Committee earlier this month with respect to the recommended governance structure for the implementation of the agreed recommendations from um, the final report of this Royal Commission. Uh, Council, I am familiar with the document. It was the document that was brought to the Defence Committee. The Defence Committee considered it and uh, made some uh, adjustments. I, I will come to that, but I just want to go through the document first, Certainly. if I could, please, Secretary. Um, so if I could ask the operator to please turn to the next page um, and expand <coughs> paragraphs 8 to 10. read the page, Council. Uh, so, Secretary, as is identified at paragraph 8, um, it indicates that there was previous advice to the EBC that the Associate Secretary would be the senior responsible officer for implementation. You see that? Yes. I and am I right to understand that the Associate Secretary was, in point of fact, senior responsible officer or is senior responsible officer for the implementation of the recommendations arising from this Royal Commission's interim report? Uh, that was that was the case, Council. Um, but there is then reference in that paragraph to discussions between you and the CDF uh, that led to a decision that the governance structure should be elevated. You see that there? That is correct. And then at paragraph 9, there's reference made to the proposed governance model and, correct me if you disagree with my interpretation of this, that the governance model that is proposed is directed to strengthening the commitment to both the government and the community in addressing the significant reforms expected to arise from this Royal Commission? That's a correct interpretation. So that was the intent of why the governance structure was to be elevated, that's correct? That is correct. Now, um, at paragraph 10, there are the relevant elements of the proposed model. First of all, the Defence Committee is to be the final internal authority, that's right? That is correct. Um, the function of that Defence Committee is to oversee the program and assure government that the final report recommendations are being addressed? Uh, it, it, will, it will certainly deal with that. It, it'll do with, that, with other matters relating to recommendations, but it'll certainly do that function. Because there is that level of external oversight, obviously, from government in terms of the work that's been done within Defence. You would agree with that? I would. Uh, now, um, under this proposal, you and the Chief of the Defence Force were to be the senior responsible officers? Uh, that, that, is, that is what the paper proposed. And um, as senior responsible officers, you were to have responsibility for the overall delivery of the program and ensuring its objectives are met and the benefits are realised. That's right. That's what the paper proposed. And the proposal was also that um, you and or the CDF were to be the chair of the program board that will be responsible for driving the program in its delivery of outcomes and benefits. That's correct? That is what the paper proposed. Yeah. Now, firstly, in terms of the proposal that you and the Chief of Defence be co-chair of the program board, did you agree with that proposal? Uh, no. Why not? <clears throat> because I, we felt that 
uh, it was important that the program board be, to a certain extent, held accountable to somebody who was not on a on a day to day basis involved in the work of the program board. So, the senior responsible officer and the um, the CDF will take more of a working to deliver the overall the program and they they will bring that to me and I will as chair of the defense committee I believe it gives me a more uh, independent or a, a, a an opportunity to to analyze or to look at the work that the program management uh, organization or the program board has done without having a vested interest because I've been involved in the work program. Just playing that out, at least in terms of the intersection between the program board and the senior responsible officer, accepting that the CDF is the chair of both the program board and the senior responsible officer, how does that independence exist? Oh, well, the program board, we, we will have another officer that 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 looks after that in 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 a di on a day to day basis, but, and I think. But but in terms of this concept of you're talking about the need of independence and accountability, um, any independence between a program board that is chaired by the CDF and a CDF who is a senior responsible officer is really illusory, isn't it? Uh, well, there will be like, like what what I, if I could, counsel. So I've been very taken by the Afghanistan task force and the program management office that we've set up there and again where the CDF has um, a little bit of distance and, and the senior responsible officer but then it it does come to the defence committee. Similarly here we will be appointing uh, a senior officer to sort of run the program board on a day-to-day -day basis uh, but the, CD, the CDF won't be able to then, at each of the three levels, sign off on his own homework. So I, that, that's why I think that it's, it's, it is important that I, as chair of the Defence Committee, do have that capacity to, to independently evaluate what we are or the work that is coming forward to me there. Forgive me if I'm misunderstanding something, Secretary, but, but that doesn't quite make sense to me in terms of the elements of this governance structure. So the senior responsible officer sits entirely aside from the intersection between the program board and the defence committee. Why is that a barrier to you being a senior responsible officer? Uh, because I, I, don't, I don't want to work, I don't want to come to a view with the CDF about the adequacy or the inadequacy of the work of the program board. I want, I think it's very useful for us to have that gap in responsibilities there where he will drive the work and, and oversee the program board. The program board will, will have, you know, standing members, in, invited members. But I, I do think that it is useful for me to be able to assure my minister that, that I had an independent look at the work that was brought to the Defence Committee by the PMO uh, and I am assured that it is meeting the government's intent in terms of implementing the, the recommendations that the government uh, agrees to. So I think... I, I don't I don't accept the characterization that it's that it that it's only just a, a pretend separation. I, I do genuinely think that I can receive that work and take a fresh look at it. But secretary, I mean you spoke earlier, you, you see the weight of responsibility of this work, uh, at least in a moral sense. Yep. Don't you also need to step up and be accountable? for that responsibility by signing off and being the senior responsible officer? 
well, the Defence Committee will sign off on the work that goes to government. So I, as the chair of the Defence Committee, I will own that because the Defence Committee will be the body that takes forward the work to government. But can, can I suggest to you, Secretary, that's really a different thing. You're talking there about checking the CDF's homework. Uh, I'm suggesting to you that if that weight of responsibility for implementation of the recommendations yeah. arising out of this Royal Commission sits with you, then you need to own that by being the senior responsible officer for its work. Uh, I would suggest, Council, that as chair of the Defence Committee and the Defence Committee being the only Tier 1 committee in the organisation, I own it. Uh, and in terms of that notion of independence between you and the CDF, really, I mean, we've heard you speak a number of times today about how you and the CDF speak every day, about the interdependencies between your relationships that independence between you in terms of this work is really illusory, isn't it? You have to be in it together. Well, to a, to a certain extent, um, Council, but I, I, I take my own accountabilities to deliver to the government the work that is directed as a consequence of this Royal Commission and if the CDF and I can't resolve a difference then I, as the chair of the Defence Committee, will be taking forward to the government advice that suggests that the program board or the senior responsible officer, in this case the CDF, has, has, has either not um, followed the direction or is you know, on time or, 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 or slipping. I, I feel no... Um, I don't believe that me taking an independent view there would uh, damage my relationship with the CDF or our, or our ability to jointly lead the defence organisation. Uh, can I ask you this, Secretary, given that the Chief of Defence Force is to leave his role, well, it's anticipated in a couple of months, yep. um, in terms of the delivery of this work, Ought it be flipped because you are the person who has got the enduring institutional knowledge and the CDF's position is to be filled by someone as yet unknown? Isn't it a better model for you to be senior responsible officer and to have another me mechanism by which the effectiveness of implementation is checked? Uh, I don't believe so. I think my, the, the, my responsibilities as, as chair of the Defence Committee are very... Are, are very important to me, and I, d I do take them uh, very seriously. I, I'm very, uh, I think, I'm very keen to crack on with the work. Um, I will be asking that program management office to provide regular updates to my own ministers, and I'm sure.
something that there there doesn't appear to be a clear um, um, model that allows for the you know the value for money I guess you know the effectiveness of that uh, of the IGADF of the dollars spent um, is is that is does that actually speak to the need that perhaps the model is not right? If you've got dollars being spent on an agency and no one's really got the role to assess whether it's achieving what the dollars are intended to achieve. Uh, certainly, Commissioner, I think the 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 ADF would have a view about whether it meets the the it meets the objectives that it was stood up for. My I am I am aware that sometimes there are complaints made about the way in which the IGADF conducts its business. Sometimes that there are people who are unhappy with how a particular investigation was pursued or unhappy with an outcome. Um, but I'm it's it's never been brought to my attention that there it isn't seen as an efficient and effective organisation or that it is particularly under-resourced or overly generously resourced. But, but how would you actually know? Because, I mean, the the CDF meets with the IGADF, but is actually the IGADF is to be independent of CDF. So it's not really easy for the CDF to be no, making those assessments I, either. I think, Commissioner, in that regard, the... the the, the IG would be very fiercely protective about, in this case, his prerogatives to be independent, but if he felt that the organisation was not providing him with the resources necessary for... I, I wouldn't see... But that's a separate issue, isn't it? It's, a it is, it is, it's separate the to the side. independence. But, but I... And, and the IG would, I believe, feel very free to come to me separately and independently and say, Secretary, I'm being starved here. But and, the, but and, that's, and again, I think the, the IG issue. would be hot out of the blocks it's if, if there was a resourcing challenge. Secretary, can I put to you, though, that that's a separate issue to someone saying we're spending X amount yeah. of dollars um, and the performance is not up to scratch? Uh, and currently the mm. model we have doesn't appear to have anybody making that assessment. Making that assessment. Um, I'll move on. Yeah. Just my last question. You candidly told us about where you started out when you came into the role as secretary in terms of appreciating the issue of suicide and suicide prevention uh, in defence and veterans. Um, you acknowledged that your view has changed as if you learnt more about the, the issue and the complexity. In your view, was suicide prevention given sufficient priority in the in defence? Uh, Commissioner, no. And um, I've, as I've learnt more about this and reflected on it as well, I think that we we could have done more and should have done more to deal with the issue of stigma. Um, that leaders at all levels should have been very conscious of, of the reality of, of stigma, why our members didn't want to come forward or, or present as needing help and, and how some of our staff, and it's not just junior staff, I agree with you completely, Commissioner, some of our staff have not been as open to the to the, the this set of, of really challenging circumstances and how it dif differs individually. And there has been, I think, uh, some real challenges for us in terms of dealing with stigma and making it really acceptable and, in fact, welcome for people to, to sort of say, I've got an issue here, and for our people to be able to better identify when somebody is, is struggling or has challenges. And I think that that's something that we could have been looking at earlier. I believe talking to people I visited at bases and on units, 
it is now a, 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 a more common part of the conversation, but, but the stigma of suicidality and, 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 um, and suicide, mental health more generally, is still, is still a societal issue and we see it in our organisation. Can I take it from your um, early response that in terms of suicide prevention was not really a high priority for the department? Um, this Royal Commission's obviously elevated it, um, but it's. Uh, can I put to you that it's not immediately apparent if you go in and look at any of the documents, even the portfolio budget statement, the corporate plan, that suicide prevention is as important as nuclear submarines to the Department of Defence? Yeah. Certainly, Commissioner, we have... Where we... I think that we've, we do need to call it out more particularly rather, because I am pleased that over many years we've thought about wellness, you know, whole of career, whole of life wellness in a, in a different, I think, a more sophisticated way than, than purely a, a health I issue, injury way. So I think that's an improvement. I have seen the issue of suicide and suicidality as a, a really fundamental part of that, but often captured in that wellness phrase. I think it needs to be called out very specifically by name. Uh, so when we have a, a wellness strategy, it must, like, we should more often talk about and how to avoid suicide and how to deal with suicidality, more specifically, more explicitly. Can I put to you, though, that perhaps in the enterprise priority statement, suicide prevention should feature? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Douglas. Uh, can I just clarify a couple of things about the Inspector General's um, office, if you like? Um, its budget is set within the Defence Department? That's correct, Commissioner. Yes. But not via the CDF, via essentially you at the top? Well, the, you know, the, it, is, it is one of the functional areas of the department that I ultimately am responsible for, mm. for, for funding. It, it, it makes budget bill, bids through its own its own processes and, right. and I, I sign off on the draft portfolio budget statement. And talking of, um, in effect, assessing its performance, it would be subject to the Auditor General's potential review, wouldn't it? And, and our own Defence Audit and Risk uh, Committee, which is entitled to look at any element within the organisation. Thank you. And that would be able to assess in effect, performance compared to rewards. Yeah, that there'd be either, either a financial audit or a performance audit, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. I just have one issue. Um, I just want to go back to the discussion you had with Council Assisting about metrics. Yep. And you felt that they're a little bit of a challenge and obviously in some areas it's very difficult to measure and so on. But uh, you, you uh, tell me if you're aware um, of the charter letters that the Chiefs have each of the th three service chiefs, at least, um, have. You familiar with those? It's I'm, aware that, that I'm the, aware that the CDF issues letters to his service chiefs. Okay, we could, we could find them and pull them up, but if you'd accept from me that there are no metrics in them, they're not mentioned. Yeah. I'm happy to pull it up if required, but there, there aren't any there. Um, it just seems to me in 2024 that the ADF and perhaps the military world generally is behind the non-military world in terms of having measurable metrics on a whole bunch of issues. And with the focus on the issues that this commission is looking at, things like um, the rate of sick leave, uh, the, record, the, the, the rate of recorded injuries, physical or otherwise, uh, the retention rate, the number of uh, complaints involving unacceptable behaviour, number of sustained complaints, all of those things would tell you how a particular command or unit is, is travelling. But that doesn't seem to exist either for the senior ranks or for lower ranks. It just seems to me that 
unless people's performance is measured in some reportable way uh, and compared and then analysed over the months or years to see whether things are going up or going down, um, you're, ne you're probably not going to get there. And I can assure you in the non-military world and certainly in the emergency services and a lot of state and government mm. uh, departments, that has been going on for quite some time. I just wondered whether you had a view about that's something that the ADF and Defence may move towards. Measurable, reportable KPIs. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner, certainly I think that the, to the extent that we can, measurable, reportable KPIs are important. It has been my experience in three Commonwealth departments at this level that performance agreements are often done in that general sense rather than the, you know, you must produce this many... I'm generalising, but I would... I, would, I think we should seek better and richer data and metrics to hold people to account. But I think at this, at this level in our defence organisation and in the Commonwealth Public Service, the, the accountabilities are, gen, are more at that strategic uh, level. I, I, and you did mention earlier that a similar approach is, exists across other uh, departments. Frankly, it's a little bit like we've always done it this way. Yep. Um, uh, and it is, I have to say, a, a Canberra thing. I'm not sure that uh, I can think of anywhere else in, in the states or territories where that level of granularity doesn't exist. But just one final point, and I'm sorry if I'm labouring the point, but it is important. Would you not agree that at the Chiefs of Services level and then on the way down, that those figures can be added up to say Navy is doing well uh, on the number of unacceptable behaviour complaints, uh, the number of sustained cases, the retention rate, the recorded injuries, physical and all of that sort of thing. And then it cascades down to a unit level where the unit understands how they're travelling. That's not happening at the moment. Um, and that's where it ought to begin. Do you, would you agree? Commissioner, I, I would and, and, and the data, the improvement in our reporting of complaints the incident reporting that will come together with the case system and the the uh, the ERP will put us in a much better place. Some of the co um, the data collection and and merging has been handrolic. We, we need to get into the 21st century in terms of um, interrogatable data that all levels of command have have access to, say, for example, within Navy, is it on a particular base, is it on a particular ship? And then what are the interventions that the Chief of Navy does to address that challenge? I, I, I think the quality of his intervention is, is what we really need to go after rather than the, the base. Well, can I just put it a different way, uh, forgive me, rather than the quality of an intervention, unless personal accountability yep. is attributed to an individual, probably things are not going to improve. Unless a commander has to supply these figures, has to be examined on these figures, I don't think much will... Anyway, I'm, I'm flogging yeah, it, no. of course, but I'll leave it at that. No, I, and, and Commissioner, I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr Fordham, did you have any questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms Longbottom, any matters? Nothing further. May the secretary be excused from his summons to appear. Before Thank you. Uh, sorry, did you want to say something? I do, I, I do if I yep, can. Yeah, please go uh, ahead. Mr Caldas, look, I, I, I just want to, first of all, just thank this Royal Commission for the vitally important work that you are doing. I really want to thank all the lived experience witnesses and the other expert witnesses who've come here. Um, sometimes it's been very hard, very hard for them to do that. But it is appreciated. Um, I just, I just want to assure you of my commitment to pursue this work and to make us a better organisation, to look after our people uh, better. And this, I, you know, this, the work that this royal commission has done has made an incredible contribution already to the work that we are doing to tackle this really, um, really uh, terrible. Uh, way in which our people have, have, have suffered and also 
many of their their families and extended networks and there's there's there is a lot of determination in the in the defense department to get on and and to be a better organization in tackling these challenges so thank you for the uh, opportunity to appear and thank you for the work that you've done Thank you. Thank you for your evidence today. And I know there's a significant amount of preparation had to go into what you said today, so that's much appreciated. Um, the witness is to be excused from his summons, I understand, to appear? Yes, please, Commissioner. Okay, so thank you and you're excused from his summons to appear today. Um, are there any other matters from anybody else? No, thank you, Commissioner. I understand we're adjourning until 9am on Thursday? That's correct, Commissioner. Okay, thank you then. We'll adjourn. All rise. The Royal Commission will now adjourn to Thursday at 9am.